You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English, and they've given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159, by Rudolf Steiner, 15 lectures entitled The Mystery of Death, translated by Simon Blacksland de Lange. This is Lecture 8, given in Vienna on the 9th of May, 1915, entitled The War, A Pathological Process, Central Europe and the Slavic East, The Dead as the Helpers of Human Progress. Our spiritual scientific world conception should not only be focusing its attention upon the development and ascendancy of individual souls, but it must also, above all else, really help us to gain further insights into our outlook upon life. In our time, it should be of particular concern to us to acquire such further insights for our evaluation of life. To be sure, It is a great and also meaningful task for the individual human being to further his own development through what he can gain as the fruit of spiritual scientific self-education. And it is only because human individuals progress in their development that they are able to contribute to the development of mankind as a whole. But our attention should not be directed to this alone. We should, as people who identify with the anthroposophical world conception, also be able to be aware of the great events of our time from a high perspective, from a truly spiritual perspective. We should indeed be able to shift our minds to a higher standpoint in judging what is going on. Some perspectives with regard to the great events of our time will be shared today, because our present meeting has been convened at this fateful time. Let us begin with something that can deeply affect us as human beings. At certain times people fall ill. Illnesses are usually regarded as something harmful to our organism, as something that invades it as a hostile force. However, such a commonly held viewpoint is by no means always justified. To be sure, there are certain illnesses which must be judged from this standpoint, where the illness invades our organism, in a sense, as an enemy. But this is not always so. It is not even so in the majority of cases. For illness is by and large something altogether different. In most cases, illness is not the enemy, but actually the friend of the organism. The actual enemy of the organism precedes the illness, in the majority of cases. It develops within a person before the outbreak of the outwardly visible illness. There are opposing forces in the organism, and the illness that erupts at a particular point is the organism's attempt to defend itself against these opposing forces, which had not previously been noticed. The illness is often the beginning of the organism's work to bring about healing. It is what the organism undertakes to battle against the hostile influences that precede the illness. It is the last form of the process, but it signifies the struggle of the good bodily fluids against what is lurking below. Its function is to drive this out from the organism. Only if we look upon the greatest majority of illnesses in this way do we arrive at a true conception of the process of illness. The illness is, therefore, an indication that something preceded its outbreak, which is being expelled from the organism by the illness. If many of life's phenomena are seen in the right light, one arrives very easily at what has just been said. The causes may lie in the greatest variety of areas. The essential point is, however, that, as has been indicated, we should view illnesses as the organism's defense against things that must be expelled from it. Now, I do not think that there is a comparison that is so appropriate than the comparison of such a quantity of significant, deeply incisive events as we have now been experiencing over a large part of the earth 
since the beginning of August 1914, with a pathological process affecting human development. We cannot help thinking that these events associated with the war are indeed a pathological process. But it would be wrong to think that it is good enough if we were simply to conceive of this pathological process in the false sense that many illnesses are conceived, as if it were the enemy of the organism. The underlying cause precedes the manifestation of the illness. It is especially striking in our time how little people are inclined in our time to take such truths into account which anyone who embraces the world conception of spiritual science not merely with his intellect but also with his feelings must immediately find perfectly plausible. In the course of the last, say, nine months, we have had to undergo an infinite amount of painful experiences, experiences that have had to do with people's faculty of judgment. Is it not indeed the case that if one reads what is conclusively disseminated through the literature that is read by most people and emanating from many different countries of the earth, it would appear that those who pass judgments about present events would presume that everything began in July 1914. This has been the most distressing experience that we have had to undergo in addition to all the other pain, that it has become apparent that particularly the people whose views tend to prevail, especially those who write newspaper articles, and determine the official opinion, actually know nothing of how events came about, and only look at their most immediate context. Hence there have been endless discussions which have been completely beside the point. Where lies the cause of the present military conflicts? Again and again people ask, is this or that party responsible? In virtually every case they do not go further back than to July or possibly June 1914. I mention this because it really is so characteristic of our materialistic age. People generally think that materialism only brings a materialistic way of thinking, a materialistic conception of the world. This is not so. Materialism does not only bring this about, but it also brings short-sightedness. Materialism brings laziness of thinking and lack of insight. A materialistic way of thinking leads to the idea that one can prove and believe anything. And it is part of that inner education that a right understanding of anthroposophy must give us that enables us to see that if one does not venture beyond the realm of materialism, it is possible to prove and believe anything. Let us take a simple example. When in recent years one has presented the anthroposophical view of the world and someone or other felt obliged to assert his own views in opposition to it, one could often hear it said, yes, Kant has, through his philosophy, proved that man has limits to his knowledge, and that the knowledge that the spiritual scientific world conception seeks to attain cannot be reached. They then cite some very interesting things purporting to show that Kant has proved that one cannot penetrate into the spiritual world with human faculties of knowledge. If one nevertheless upholds spiritual science, these people come and assert that one is rejecting everything that Kant has proved. And, of course, the assertion that is thereby implied is that one must be a particularly foolish person to reject what has been so strictly proved. This is not so. The spiritual scientist does not deny that what Kant has proved is absolutely correct, and it is clear that this has been well demonstrated. But suppose that at the time when the microscope had not been invented, someone had come up with a firm idea that there are minute cells in the plant which no one could find because human eyes are not adapted for this. This argument would have to be firmly accepted, and this would be absolutely correct. For the human eye, EYE, as it is constituted, can never penetrate into the plant's organism to the extent of seeing these tiniest cells an absolutely correct conclusion that can never be overturned. 
Yet life evolved in such a way that the microscope was invented as an aid to the human eye, and that despite the above conclusion, human beings have arrived at a knowledge of the most minute cells. Only when it is seen that conclusive proofs are completely useless for reaching a knowledge of the truth, that arguments can be correct but actually do not have any particular significance for the knowledge of truth, only then will one be standing upon the right foundation. One will then know that arguments and proofs may be all very well, but their task is not that of leading to the truth. If you just think of the comparison that I have given, you will see that Kant's assertion that human knowledge cannot extend to the supersensible worlds is just as valid as the argument that the human power of vision cannot reach to the cell. The proofs and arguments were absolutely correct, but life goes beyond such means of verification. This too is something that one discovers on the path of spiritual research, that one broadens one's horizon by appealing to something other than the human intellect and its proofs. Anyone who limits himself to materialistic ideas is indeed led to a boundless belief in proofs. If he has a proof in his pocket, he is wholly convinced of the truth. Spiritual science will show us that one can indeed perfectly well furnish proofs of one thing or another, but that intellectual proofs have no significance for arriving at real truth. It is therefore a symptom of our materialistic age that people become short-sighted in their intellectual views. If, moreover, this intellectual short-sightedness is also imbued with passions, something comes about which we do not only see in the war that European peoples are waging with weapons, but in their hostile attitude to one another, where one country accuses the others of all manner of things without any prospect that one might ever, not only during the war, be able to convince the others. Moreover, anyone who thinks that a neutral state might ever be able to choose between the assertions of two hostile states is simply being naive. Of course, what is advanced from the one side is equally well represented and furnished with all sorts of proofs by what is said from the other side. One acquires real insight only if one enters into the deeper foundations of the whole of human evolution. A few years before the outbreak of this war, I tried through the cycle about individual folk souls and their influence upon human individuals in the various European territories to cast a little light upon how the different nations relate to one another, while indicating that different forces rule over the various peoples. Today we shall supplement what was said in these lectures with some further perspectives. Our materialistic age thinks in too abstract a way. Above all, no account is taken in our materialistic age of something such as the real development that takes place in life that a person needs to bring to maturity what is within him in order that it may gradually ripen into a real judgment. As we know from what is fully described entitled The Education of the Child from the standpoint of spiritual science, a human being undergoes a development such that in the first seven years his physical body, from the seventh until his fourteenth year his etheric body and so on, are especially developed. Just as there is little awareness of this progressive development of the human individual, there is even less awareness of the parallel phenomenon, a phenomenon that is of equivalent significance the processes that are enacted within and among the various peoples are, as we all know from spiritual science, guided and directed by beings of the higher hierarchies. We speak in the true sense of the word of folk souls, of folk spirits. We know, for example, that the folk spirit of the Italian people inspires what we call the sentient soul that the French folk spirit inspires what we call the intellectual or mind-soul, that the inhabitants of the British Isles are inspired by the consciousness-soul, 
while in Central Europe it is what we call the human ego that is inspired. However, this does not imply any value judgment about the various nations. It is simply a statement that this is so. It is, for example, stated that a fundamental inspiration of the people inhabiting the British Isles is that as a nation it brings into the world everything that is brought about through the folk spirit by means of the inspiration of the consciousness soul. It is remarkable how nervous people become in relation to this theme. When, during the events of the war, I have again mentioned things that I already spoke about in the cycle referred to, there have been people who almost regarded it as a kind of insult to the British people when I said that they had the task of inspiring the consciousness soul, whereas the German folk soul has to inspire the human ego. It was as though one were to take it as an insult if one were to say that salt is white and paprika is red. It is a simple characterization, the expression of an existing truth, and it has to be accepted as such. One will be able to deal much better with the prevailing issues between the various groups comprising members of humanity as a whole if one considers the qualities possessed by the various peoples, in contrast to mixing everything up, as the modern materialistic conception tends to do. Of course, the individual human being rises above what he receives through his folk soul, and it is the task of our anthroposophical society to raise the human individual out of the group soul nature, so that he is elevated to the life of humanity as a whole. But the fact nevertheless remains that insofar as he belongs to a particular nation, a human individual is inspired in a certain direction by these qualities of this nation. That, for example, the Italian folk spirit speaks to the sentient soul, the French folk spirit to the intellectual or mind soul, and the British folk spirit to the consciousness soul. We therefore have to imagine that the folk soul is, as it were, hovering over what human individuals initiate within the various nations. But just as in the case of an individual human being there is a development such that one can say the ego reaches a certain stage of development at a particular time of life, so can one also speak with respect to the folk soul of a development in relation to its people of a real development. However, this development is somewhat different from that of the individual human being. Let us take the Italian people as an example. Thus we have this particular nation and then the folk soul that belongs to it. The folk soul is a being from the supersensible world and belongs to the world of the higher hierarchies. It inspires the sentient soul. And this continues to happen for as long as the Italian people since we are speaking of this people, exists. But it inspires the sentient soul in the most various ways at different times. There are times when the folk souls inspire those belonging to particular nations in such a way that this inspiration occurs, as it were, on a soul level. The folk soul then hovers in higher regions of the spirit and its inspiration is exerted only upon soul qualities. Then there are times when folk souls reach down further and engage more strongly with the individual members of the nation, inspiring them so forcefully that not only does a person receive them into his soul qualities, but the influence is so strong that his bodily qualities are also dependent on the folk soul. As long as a people is influenced by the folk soul, in such a way that the folk soul only inspires soul spiritual qualities, the national type is not so pronounced. In such a case, the forces of the folk soul do not penetrate into the blood of individual human beings. Then comes a time when even from the way that a person looks out of his eyes and from his facial features, it is possible to discern the influence of the folk spirit. What manifests itself is that the folk soul has descended more deeply. It strongly and intensively takes hold of the whole human being. 
In the case of the Italian people, the time of which I have spoken when the folk spirit descends deeply, when its influence can be discerned through the impression that it makes on human individuals, was roughly in the middle of the 16th century, around 1550. Then the folk soul, as it were, retraced its influence, and from this time onward it is transmitted through heredity to the descendants. The most intensive union of the Italian people with its folk soul was around 1550. It is then that the Italian folk soul descends most deeply. It is then that this people, inhabiting the Italian peninsula, acquires its distinctive character. If we go back to the time before 1550, we see that the characteristic features are not so pronounced. Only then does what is characteristic of the Italian character really have its beginning. It was then that what we may think of as the real marriage between the Italian folk soul and the sentient soul of the human beings belonging to the Italian people took place. For the French people, I am therefore not speaking of the individual human being who can rise above the national character. The similar moment when the folk spirit therefore descended most deeply and fully penetrated the whole nation occurred in approximately 1600, at the beginning of the 17th century. It was then that the folk soul completely took hold of the intellectual or mind soul. For the British people, the comparable time was in the middle of the 17th century, around 1650. It was then that the British nation first acquired its characteristically British expression. If you know such things, much will begin to be understandable to you. For you can, for example, raise a question such as this in a completely different way. How is Shakespeare's connection with England to be understood? Shakespeare was active in England before the folk spirit exerted its influence most intensively upon the English people. This is why he was not properly understood in England. There are known to be editions of his plays where everything not to the taste of governesses is edited out. Shakespeare is all too often reduced to the most superficial moralizing and we are well aware that Shakespeare was most deeply understood not in England, but in the cultural development of Central Europe. You will now be asking when the folk spirit came in contact with those belonging to the Central European people. The situation is as follows. Through the fact that in Central Europe the ego is the most important element and that a kind of descent of the folk spirit takes place and then a withdrawal then a further descent and a further withdrawal, there are repetitions of this cycle. Thus approximately in the time when the wonderful legends of Parsifal and the Grail arose, we have such a descent of the folk spirit, its union with individual souls, and a withdrawal. And a next descent roughly between the years 1750 and 1830, it was then that what lives in Central Europe was fully embraced by the folk spirit of Central Europe. Since then, there has again been a withdrawal of the folk spirit. So you see that it is perfectly understandable that, say, Jakob Burma lived at a time when he could receive little from the German folk spirit. This was not the time when the folk spirit united itself with the individual souls of the people. Thus, although he is referred to as the Teutonic philosopher, Jakob Burma is a person who, as regards the time when he lived, is independent of his folk spirit, a kind of uprooted phenomenon, a breath of eternity in his time. If we take Lessing, Schiller, and Goethe, they are additionally German philosophers who are rooted in the German folk spirit. It is wholly characteristic that these philosophers living in the time between 1750 and 1830, are deeply rooted in their folk soul. So you see that it is not merely a question of knowing that in the Italian nation the folk spirits work through the sentient soul, 
that in the French nation the folk spirit works through the intellectual soul, that in the British nation the folk spirit works through the consciousness soul, and that in the case of the Central European people the folk spirit works through the ego. But that one must also know that this happens at particular times. Moreover, the events that take place can only be explained historically if one really knows such things. The nonsense pursued in the form of science where one bases everything on documents and lists the events in sequence and says that one must lead to the next, this nonsense leads the historical researcher not to a real history, to an understanding of human evolution, but to a falsification of what works and weaves in human history. And if one now sees how the forces which drive these national entities, and of course other such entities could also be characterized, work in a totally different way on the various nations, one sees the contrasting elements that are present. One sees that what happens today has not only been happening in the last two years, but has been prepared over centuries. Let us look toward the East, toward the region that bears Russian culture. The whole distinctive quality of Russian culture is that it can only really develop when the Russian folk soul unites with the spirit self. This has already been spoken of in the cycle referred to. This means that a future time must come when the characteristic features of the European East will, for the first time, acquire a definite form. And this will be completely different from what takes place in Western or Central Europe. For the time being, however, it is understandable that what is assigned to Russian culture does not yet exist, but that Russian culture and also the individual human being relates to the spirit self by always looking up to it. Individual Russians and even deep-thinking Russian philosophers do not express the loftiest thoughts as is done in Central Europe, but in a completely different way. Here we find something highly characteristic. For what is a distinctive quality of Central European life? You all know that there was a time of the great mystics when Meister Eckhart, Johannes Tauler, and others were all active. They all sought the divine essence that is contained in the human soul. They endeavored to find the God within them, quote, the little spark within the heart, close quote, as Eckhart expressed it. Within the soul, they said, there must be something where the Godhead is directly present. And so there arose that aspiration where the ego sought to unite itself with the Godhead within. This divine essence, the Godhead, was to be striven for. It called for an active process of development. This is a characteristic feature of the whole of Central European cultural life. Just think of the infinite depth of feeling expressed by someone who, I might say, is internationally recognized as being representative of Central European culture and spiritual life, Angelus Silesius. When he says in one of the beautiful verses contained in his Cherubinischer Wandersmann, When I die, it is not I who dies, but God dies in me. Consider how infinitely profound this is. For someone who says this has livingly grasped the idea of immortality and that he has felt when a human individual dies, this means that the person concerned is imbued with the Godhead. This phenomenon of death is one that has to do not with man, but with God. And since God cannot die, death must only be an illusion. Death can therefore not be a destruction of life. Someone who says, quote, When I die, it is not I who dies, but God dies in me, close quote, knows of the existence of the immortal soul. It is a feeling of infinite depth that lives in Angela Silesius. This is a consequence of the fact that the inspiration here occurs in the ego. When the inspiration occurs in the sentient soul, something can happen, as it did, for example, in the case of Giordano Bruno. This friar felt passionately engaged with the discoveries of Copernicus. He felt that the whole world was enlivened. If you read anything that Giordano Bruno has written, you'll find it confirmed 
that inasmuch as he derived from an Italian background, he furnishes the proof that the folk soul is here inspiring the sentient soul. Cartesius, or Descartes, was born at the time of French development that has been characterized, when the French folk spirit fully united itself with the French people. If you read a page of Descartes, the French philosopher, you will find that on every page he confirms what spiritual science finds, that the inspiration of the folk spirit is influencing the intellectual soul. If you read Locke or Hume or another English philosopher, up to and including Mill and Spencer, you find throughout the inspiration of the consciousness soul. If you read Fichte, as he struggles within the ego itself, you have the inspiration of the ego through the folk soul. This is characteristic of the fact that this central European folk soul is experienced within the ego, and that therefore the ego is the truly aspirational quality with, I may say, all its strength and errors, its mistakes and its conquests. If someone from Central Europe is to find the path to Christ, he needs to give birth to him within his own soul. Try to find in the cultural life of Russia, if it has not been outwardly overwhelmed by Western culture, this idea of experiencing Christ or God in one's inner being. You will not be able to find it. The expectation is always that what enters into history manifests itself, as Soloviev says, as a miracle. Russian cultural life is very inclined to look for the resurrection of Christ in the supersensible world. But this is as though man were down below and the source of inspiration were moving about above mankind like a cloud and not as though it was penetrating into the human ego. This intimate fellowship of the ego with its God, or also, if it has to do with Christ, with Christ, this desire for Christ to be born within one's own soul can only be found in Central Europe. And when East European culture arrives at the stage of development that is appropriate for it, this will become apparent through the founding of a culture that, as it were, hovers above man, that represents a kind of group soul quality, although at a higher level than the old group souls. At present we must find it perfectly natural that in the way that even Russian philosophers speak, there is always a sense of something that as though hovers above the human world, which one can never approach as intimately as someone from Central Europe wishes with his ego to approach the divine essence that works and weaves through the world. And when I have myself often spoken of the Godhead that weaves and surges through the world, this emanates from the feeling world of a Central European and would not be understood by any other European nation in the same way that it can be received by the feeling life of Central Europe. This is the characteristic quality of the people of Central Europe. These are the forces that live in the different peoples and that confront one another and which therefore again and again have to engage in conflicts involving powerful discharges and explosions, just as clouds release their burden of rain and cause lightning and storms. But do we not see, one might now say, that words have resounded in the East as a kind of rallying cry, with the intention that the culture of Eastern Europe should begin now, that it should extend over the unworthy West of Europe and overwhelm it? Do we not see that the Slavophiles, the Pan-Slavists and Pan-Slavism, have appeared exemplified especially in figures such as Dostoevsky and others, that in his program Dostoevsky put forward particular points where he says, All you Western Europeans, you have a degenerate culture that must be replaced by Eastern Europe. A whole theory was then established, a theory which culminated essentially by saying, in the West everything has become decadent and it must be replaced by the fresh forces of the East. We have the good orthodox religion, which we do not oppose. We have accepted it as the cloud of the folk spirit hovering over people and so forth. And then some brilliant theories were built up as to what might be the principles and intentions of the ancient Slavic world, 
and how from the East truth should now extend its sway over Central and Western Europe. I said that the individual can rise above his national identity. In a certain sphere, the great Russian philosopher Soloviev was such an individual. Although one can discern in every line that he writes as a Russian, he stands above his national character. In the first period of his life, Soloviev was a pan-Slavist. But he then penetrated more deeply into what the pan-Slavists and Slavophiles presented as a kind of philosophy or world conception of nations. And what did Soloviev as a Russian find? He asked himself, does that which constitutes the Russian nature exist in the present time? Is this perhaps already contained in what is advocated by those who represent pan-Slavism and the Slavophiles? He did not rest until he discovered the truth. And what did he find? He investigated the assertions of the Slavophiles to whom he had previously belonged in a very thorough way, and he found that a large part of the thought forms, assertions, and intentions were taken from the French philosopher de Maistre, who sympathized with the Jesuits, that he was the great teacher of the Slavophiles as regards their world conception. Soloviev himself demonstrated that Slavophilism did not grow out of Russian soil, but was derived from de Maistre. And he also discovered something else. He unearthed a long-forgotten German book from the 19th century, which no one in Germany knows about. The Slavophiles extracted whole portions from it in their literature. What is the strange phenomenon that confronts us here? People believe that something that is supposedly derived from the East comes from there, and it is a Western import. It came from the West and is being sent back again to people in the West. People in the West are made acquainted with their own thought forms, because the thought forms peculiar to the East do not yet exist. When things are clearly investigated, there is always confirmation of what spiritual science has to say. Thus, in what seeks to roll in from the East, we are dealing with something that is still elemental, with something that will only be developed if it receives what has developed in Central Europe as lovingly as Central Europe lovingly received Greek and Latin culture from the South. For the course of human development is such that the later absorbs what came before. And the Faust mentality that I was able to characterize in yesterday's public lecture when I spoke of the year 1770 was experienced by Goethe as a Faustian aspiration when he said, quote, Philosophy have I digested, the whole of law and medicine. From each its secrets I have wrested, theology, alas, thrown in. Poor fool, with all this sweated lore, I stand no wiser than before. Close quote. Translated by Philip Wayne, end of footnote. There then arose a rich German cultural life, an immensely rich, intense striving in German culture. But if Goethe had written his Faust forty years later, he would certainly not have begun with, quote, Habe nun ach Philosophie, uh, English philosophy have I digested, and so forth, close quote, and have become the wise man of all ages. But he would, nevertheless, have written his Faust, as he did in 1770. This living aspiration enters the ego from the inspiration of the folk soul, from that intimate connection of the ego with the folk spirit. This is a fundamental quality of the spiritual culture of Central Europe, and East European culture must lovingly unite itself with it. It must accept it. That which had to flow to Central Europe was in former times absorbed from cultures of the South, when this elemental wave of development comes rolling in from the East, it is as if the pupil is angry with his teacher because he ought to be learning something from him and therefore wants to give him a good hiding. It is a somewhat trivial comparison, but it is nevertheless a comparison that presents the actual state of affairs. Large numbers of people live together in Europe with completely different developmental forces, these different developmental forces must actively compete with one another, 
they must assert themselves in a variety of ways. The opposing forces that undoubtedly exist, forces that come in conflict with one another, have long been developing, and it is when one attends to the finer details that one finds everywhere the things that spiritual science has to say. It is a wonderful thing that the wave of European development should concentrate itself in such a way as to present before the whole of mankind a symbolic picture of how in Central Europe the intimate connection of the ego with the spiritual world is experienced, how God may be experienced in, quote, the little spark within the heart, close quote, how Christ may be experienced in the little spark within the heart. Christ himself must become a living presence within the human ego. Hence, as in no other European language, the whole development in Central Europe tends gradually toward what is called the ego, or I, Ich. And the German word Ich is I-C-H, Ich, which is equivalent to I-C-H, or Jesus Christ, as in Central Europe, like a mighty symbol reflecting the intimate interplay of what can be the soul's holiest possession with the soul itself. Jesus Christ and the human ego at one and the same time. Thus does the folk spirit work inspiring the people in order to express in characteristic words what the underlying facts are. I well know that people laugh when something of this kind is said, when it is said that the folk spirit worked for centuries in order that the word ich, which is of such symbolic significance, came about. But let people laugh. After no more than a few centuries, they will no longer laugh. They will regard this as having far more significance than what are referred to today as laws of nature. The influence of this wave of development has been highly characteristic only a very small part of the truth comes to conscious expression. But what works in the unconscious depths is expressive of a far greater degree of truth. We speak, for example, of Germanic peoples. Words are formed by the active genius of language. One part of the inhabitants of Central Europe calls itself German, but when one speaks of Germanic peoples, this includes Germany, Austria, Holland, the Scandinavian nations, and also those living in the British Isles. The word Germanic extends over a wide area. Someone living in the British Isles, however, rejects it. When he uses the word German, he just means those living in Germany. He does not have an equivalent for the German word Germain, except in the historical sense of ancient German or Teuton. The German language encompasses a far wider meaning with the word. It tends, as such, toward putting the word at the service of selflessness. The German does not only refer to himself when he uses the word germane, but includes all the others as well. The Briton rejects this. If you explore the wonders of the creative genius of language, you will see that there really is something wonderful there. With regard to what people have in their consciousness, there arises Maya, the great illusion. What works in unconscious depths is far more true in its influence. Here something immensely significant and profound comes to expression. Readers aside, there is a word here, G-E-R-M-A-N-E, which we would pronounce Germane, but I think Steiner means something else by that, but I don't know what it is. End of readers aside. Now compare with the way that one must sensitively set to work in order to understand the play of forces at work in Europe, the utter coarseness of the way that the relationships between the European nations are viewed today. And you will be able to see the extent of the devastation that the age of materialism has wrought in the human power of judgment. The worst thing is not that people have begun to think that matter bears and supports everything, but that they have become short-sighted that they are unable to see what is fundamental and do not even take a step behind the veil that is woven over truth as maya. Materialism has well prepared what it sought to achieve. Here, too, a genial spirit has been active, although it is the genius 
who is the leading driver of materialism, Ahriman, he has had an immense influence in recent centuries, a very considerable influence. I would like briefly to refer to a chapter which people may perhaps prefer to ignore today, and if their attention is drawn to it, they look upon this as a particular form of insanity. You see, the easiest way to influence people is to drip-feed their souls and imaginations when they are still young with what will develop within them later. In later life, very few people can really be taught anything. Araman would never have better prospects of preparing souls in a genuinely materialistic way than if he drip-feeds the souls of young people and children with what continues to work on in the unconscious. If materialistic thought forms are absorbed in the period when people do not yet think intellectually, they will learn to think in a thoroughly materialistic way through the materialism that has been implanted in children's souls. Araman achieved this by inspiring a writer of the materialistic age with the idea of title Robinson Crusoe. Anyone who attentively reads Robinson Crusoe will see the extent of the influence of materialistic ideas in it. This may not be obvious at first, but the entire book, how it is constructed, how in this life of adventure he is led to everything through outward experience until finally even religion grows out of the soil like cabbages, well, prepares the child's soul for materialistic thinking. And when one considers that over a certain period, the 17th and 18th centuries, there were Bohemian, Portuguese, Hungarian, and other Robinson Crusoes as imitations of the original, it becomes clear that the task was thoroughly achieved, and that the contribution that the reading of Robinson Crusoe has made to the development of materialism is very considerable. In contrast to such phenomena, it should be indicated that there is something else that children should be given as nourishment for their understanding until late in life. These are the fairy tales that live in Central Europe, and especially the fairy tales collected by the brothers Grimm. This is much better literature for children than Robinson Crusoe. And if in our time what is happening is so terrible, fateful away between the European nations is understood as an incitement to look more closely at the way that what now manifests itself in the present has been developing beneath the surface of events, one will readily come to see that it is not ultimately a question of whether a few scholars send their titles and diplomas back to England. If the incitement afforded by this time proves to be so strong that one recognizes the materialistically inspired consciousness soul of the British people in its full significance, one will also perceive the significance of letting children read Robinson Crusoe and prevent this happening. If one comes to be able to take account of the warnings of our present time, one will have to set to work in a much more thorough and more radical way. It is now 35 years since I began to interpret Goethe's spiritual scientific task. I tried to show that in Goethe's theory of evolution, something of great spiritual magnitude was presented. The time must come when this is perceived more widely, for Goethe has given a great powerful theory of evolution, which has spiritual stature. People found this difficult to understand. Darwin, who gave, in a coarser, materialistic way, what Goethe had presented in a more refined spiritual form in his theory of evolution, was able to have greater influence in the age of materialism. Central Europe was thoroughly taken over by England. Think of the tragedy of this situation, that the most English scientist in Germany, Ernst Haeckel, who swore by Darwin, should have felt such a furious hatred for everything English. And when the war broke out, he was one of the first to return to England the awards and diplomas that he had received. He was probably already too old to send back the so characteristically English theories of Darwin, but that would have been more to the point and far more important. What is involved here is something so infinitely profound and meaningful, and it is connected with the spiritual deepening of our time that needs to happen. If one comes to see that Goethe's theory of color 
has far greater depth than that of Newton, that Goethe's theory of evolution is much more profound than that of Darwin. One will be aware of what lies concealed in Central Europe also in relation to such important fields of research. I want in this way to give you a feeling of the sense of urgency that the present difficult and destiny-laden events need to arouse within us, an exhortation to work which should lead us to reflect upon what lies hidden in the cultural life of Central Europe and which is, in a certain sense, our responsibility to draw forth. This is also what I meant when I said yesterday in the public lecture that this cultural, spiritual life of Central Europe contains seeds that must bring forth blossoms and fruit. If we acknowledge again and again that the conscious life of the soul carries on at the surface, while beneath it lies all that has been spoken of during these days, we may also reflect upon the fact that in the impulses of many people in the present, something is living which is quite different from that of which they are conscious. Do not think that those people in the West and the East, whose task it is to defend the great fortress of Central Europe, are fighting only for what they are aware of at the surface of consciousness. We should, above all, be looking at the impulses of which many of those who are dying on the battlefields are unconscious. But these impulses are there. They exist. And we should, from spiritual science, be able, as we look toward both East and West, to evoke the feeling that in the impulses of those who make these sacrifices something lives that will become outwardly manifest only in the future, even though those engaged in fighting have hardly any conscious idea of this. Only if we consider what is happening at present in this light will we be filled with feelings that are right and appropriate. But just think how many souls involved in these events with which nothing in the conscious history of mankind can be compared as regards their military scale, are suffering violent deaths and that these souls will look down upon the death that has been thrust upon them by the great events of this time. Recall what I said the day before yesterday about the youthful etheric bodies filling the spiritual atmosphere. Consider that not only will their souls, their individualities be in the spiritual world, but that impulses from these youthful etheric bodies that can be used will pervade the spiritual atmosphere. Let us try, out of this situation, to perceive the awakening calls which those who remain here on the earth must be hearing. For, indeed, the human individual who has passed through the gate of death calls attention to the great tasks that are to be accomplished in European culture. And people must, out of the depths of spiritual life, sense this urgency to engender feelings born out of knowledge with respect to the true nature of the world in which we live. If one comes to feel in this sense that each person who falls on the battlefield in the flower of his youth is the bearer of an exhortation, a call for the spiritualization of humanity in the context of European culture, one will have understood this rightly. It is not enough that an abstract knowledge goes out from centers such as the one where we are gathered, that man consists of a physical body, etheric body, astral body, and an ego, and that he passes through many incarnations and has a karma and so forth. One would wish that the souls who participate in our spiritual scientific life will be stirred in their innermost depths to that feeling life of which I have spoken, to sharing in the immediate future in the experience of the awakening calls of those who have died prematurely. The most wonderful experience that we can have as people committed to spiritual science is of the living life that should pass like a breath through the ranks of those who belong to our movement. Not knowledge alone, not mere understanding, but this life, making this life a true reality. In ancient times a number of members have left the physical plane. Among them was a young fellow member, our dear Fritz Mitcher. Karma brought it about that I had the task to speak at the cremation in Basel. 
I had to address certain words to the departing soul. Among many other things that I said to the soul was that we know that he will continue to work with us also after he has passed through the gate of death. I had to say this out of the awareness that what inspires and animates us all is no mere theory, but that what we express in the form of theoretical thoughts must fill our whole soul with life. But then we must relate to those who have passed through the gate of death as to those who still live here on earth. Indeed, we should not hesitate to say to ourselves, those who live in a physical body are prevented through the most manifold circumstances from fully living a spiritual life. What a lot of impediments we can discern in this physical earthly life where it is a question of recognizing the really great tasks of evolution, and even more so when it is a case of fulfilling them. But the dead are far more reliable. This sense that the dead are among us, that a special mission has been entrusted to them, guided me when I spoke the words of commemoration for our friend Fritz Mitcher, who passed prematurely through the gate of death. And what was said for him relates to many others who have crossed this threshold. We see in them our most important collaborators, and it will not be misunderstood when I say that in our spiritual work we can rely far more on the dead than on the living. But in order to be able to say this, we must be livingly engaged in what our spiritual movement can give us. My basic premise is that also, in an outward sense, those who have crossed the threshold of death in our destiny-laden time are our most important collaborators in the spiritualizing of the human culture of the future. For the death to which those who have passed through this portal look back becomes a great teacher. And many people today need stronger teachers than life can give. One can see this through numerous examples. I should like to give an example out of many others that could be given. A sensational article opposing the spiritual science which I advocate appeared several years ago in a journal called Hochland that is published in South Germany. This article created a great stir. Many people were convinced by it because it was written by a famous professor of philosophy. The editor of that journal, Hochland, Highland, accepted this article. He has thereby propagated, as he thinks, a view of this confounded spiritual science that is worthy of consideration. You see, it is really not a question of defending oneself against such things with outward means. It is absolutely understandable that all clever, modern people find spiritual science to be utter folly. But after the outbreak of the war, something else occurred. The editor of the journal in question is a good German, a man with good German feelings. The author whose article he had published now wrote letters to that editor, who in, shall we say, his blessed innocence, printed them in the Süddeutsche Monat Hefte. If you try to read them, you will see what that same philosopher writes to the editor of Hochland is full of venomous hatred of the spiritual culture of Central Europe, so that the editor feels obliged to say, anyone who thinks like this can in Central Europe only be found in madhouses. Just think how immensely significant this criticism is. There is an editor of a South German journal. This editor accepts an article which he considers to be an authoritative means of destroying spiritual science and of which he says this is a good article about spiritual science by a famous philosopher. After some time the editor receives things written by the same man which he then refers to as coming from someone who belongs to the madhouse. But should one not, in accordance with living logic, Continue by saying that if this man is now a fool, was he not also a fool before? And that the good editor did not realize at the time that in the case of the critical article about spiritual science, he was dealing with a fool? This is living logic. One can sometimes not wait until such living logic takes effect. Nevertheless, it is an active force in our life and one can therefore sometimes experience something further after such a reception. 
The article appeared at the time as a criticism of my spiritual science. People read it and said, Yes, this is written by a famous philosopher and Platonist. He must be really clever. The editor said, If someone who is so clever writes about spiritual science, this must be a good article. Some time passes, and the same editor says, The man is a fool. But the editor first needed proofs of this, as has been described. Yes, this can be a common experience. Such people who have as little ground under their feet as that editor of the South German Journal need to be taught their lessons by events, which have, through what we have been experiencing recently, been given by the spiritual world in a far deeper sense than one would have wished. You will therefore understand if I return to what I said earlier. Our time has been the scene of many opposing forces, and if we call the war a disease, which we can do, it is a disease which was brought about by something that took place long ago, and it is a healing force, which is a means of eradicating much that had gradually to lead to the damaging of the whole of cultural life. If we think of it as a disease, and if we view the disease as a means of self-defense, we will also understand this war and the destiny-laden events of the present. We will also understand the hints and exhortations that it is giving us. We will then experience it with all the inner forces of our soul, so that we can be really attentive to those who have passed through the gate of death and look toward the near future and will have learned what they are able to inspire within the souls that wish to hear them, that a spiritual deepening that is necessary for the healing and advancement of humanity must enter into them. If your souls are able rightly to receive what I would wish to say with these words, if you are able to make the resolve to become souls of such a kind, who direct their attention to what is being whispered from above by those who have passed through the portal of death, as a result of the present fateful events, you will in a very real sense be adherents and upholders of our spiritual scientific outlook on the world. A bridge needs to be built in the near future through spiritual science between the living and the dead, a line of communication through which the inspiring elemental forces of those who have in the present time made great sacrifices can find the path across. For this reason I wanted to speak to you, to awaken certain feelings within you. May these feelings be expectant feelings of what is being addressed to souls by the effects of our destiny-laden time. In this sense I shall again conclude with the words that I spoke the day before yesterday. They are intended to work in our souls as a mantra, so that our souls become expectant, expectant of the inspiration that will come from the dead who are, however, quite especially alive in the spirit. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. The end of Lecture 8 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death. Fifteen Lectures, translated by Simon Blacksland de Lange. This is Lecture 9, given in Prague on the 13th of May, 1915, entitled Man's Relationship to the Kingdoms of Nature and to the Hierarchies, Time Spirits and Folk Spirits, The Urging Voices of the Dead. It is a difficult time in which we are living, a time of truly courageous deeds and high sacrifices on the one hand, a time of hard and difficult trials for human souls on the other. At the end of our considerations today, it will therefore be my task to arouse some feelings evoked by our destiny-laden time, 
for since we are able to be together at such a time, it is our wish to conclude by allowing the feelings engendered at such a time to find full expression. But we should like to begin with something that can shed light upon much that must speak in a meaningful way to our souls in our time. Since we have begun to study the world in a spiritual scientific way, We have called the four members of our human nature the physical body, the etheric body, the astral body, and the ego. And we know that the ego, or rather that aspect of human nature that we call I, capital, through which we give expression to the ego, is the youngest but also for us the most significant member of the human organism. For if, through the succession of Saturn, Sun, and Moon time, man were to consist only of a physical body, etheric body, and astral body, he would not be man. Man is the being he is through the fact that during the earthly age he has received his ego through the spirits of the higher hierarchies, and that during the earthly age he now further develops this ego in the course of successive incarnations through various human communities, through various peoples and periods of time until the earth has reached the aim of its evolution, and until, by having fully developed his ego, man has also achieved his earthly purpose. But we also know that there are higher spiritual beings. We use the word higher to refer to them. Who, as it were, stand above man? We speak of the hierarchy of the angels, angeloi, of the hierarchy of the archangels, Archangeloi, of the Archai, or time spirits, and so on, in an upward ascent. We refer to them by means of these names, and we could equally well use other names, but the names are as introduced in the West. We wish now to call to mind how we may conceive of these spiritual beings of the higher hierarchies in relation to man and his place here on the earth. We shall begin from what man has around him here on earth. We know that this is the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the animal kingdom. And from everything that he can observe of his situation, man must come to regard the human kingdom itself as the highest of these kingdoms. Above these kingdoms, as it were, as a continuation upward, appear the realm of the Angeloi, the Arch Angeloi, the Archai, and so forth. We may simply visualize that these realms are not concluded with that of the human kingdom, but also extend further upward, only that the higher realms cannot be seen with the outward senses. It might in itself appear obvious that when we ascend from the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms to the human kingdom, invisibility begins directly as we go above the human kingdom. But it will be obvious only for as long as one does not consider that animals, as is quite clear to someone who is able to put himself wholly into the way that animals perceive the world, do not see human beings as one human being sees other human beings. If animals could speak, they would only speak of mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms as being visible. They would regard themselves as the highest visible realm. That animals see human beings as one human being sees another is merely a prejudice. For animals, we human beings are actually of a supersensible, ghostly existence. And if animals only had such perceptions as we have, they would not see human beings, but human beings would be as invisible to them as the realm of the angels is to us. Only because they have a certain dreamlike clairvoyance do animals see man as a specter, as a supersensible being. We cannot as such have any direct conception of the image that an animal forms of a human being. On the other hand, animals also see something in a downward perspective, or, to be more precise, perceive something in a downward direction which man no longer perceives in this sense. That is to say, animals do not merely perceive the mineral world in the way that human beings do, but they, and especially the lower animals, perceive something altogether different. When an animal, such as a snail, crawls over the ground, 
It perceives the whole distinctive quality of the soil. It would constantly disturb a person if, as he walks over the floor of the earth, he were to perceive it as does a snail or a tortoise. With the higher animals that have warm blood, it is somewhat different, but especially the lower animals really do perceive the whole distinctive quality of the ground on which they are crawling. They perceive the special character of the air. They perceive everything that is around them totally differently from a human being. The animal knows whether the ground over which it is moving is peaty or sandy soil, for it inwardly perceives its essential quality. Indeed, it is rather as though we were hearing the things around us. The whole of the mineral world is pervaded by a delicate quivering of forces that a human being does not perceive. The animal perceives this delicate quivering in such a way that it experiences the one as congenial and the other not. When, for example, an animal moves from one kind of soil to another, it is not that the animal sees it as does a human being, but it does so because something is painful to it, because the delicate movements reverberate within it, because it feels a kind of affinity there. This is a kind of instinctive hearing, like a hearing of what is going on in the soil. Or it is like a process of smelling. So that we can say, the animal perceives an elemental realm and from man onward acknowledges a higher hierarchy. We are therefore placed amidst a world that we know as the outer world of the senses, with its outwardly perceived realms or kingdoms, and the world of the higher hierarchies. Now we also know that a being of the higher hierarchies, for example an angel, has passed through a human stage. This was while the earth was passing through the period of old moon. At this time man was not yet man, for he had no ego. He was only at the preparatory stage of humanity and had the astral body as the highest member of his being. The beings who belonged to the hierarchy of the Angeloi had passed through their human stage during the time of old moon. And the spirits to whom we turn as the guardian spirits of individual human beings are these beings from the hierarchy of the Angeloi, to each of whom a human being is assigned. The, quote, spirits of your souls, close quote, are those who are in the hierarchy directly above man, whose wings, to put it in symbolic terms, work protectively over human beings and over the single human individual. Then we come to the hierarchy of the Archangeloi. They were also once human beings. During the period of Old Sun, the beings whom we today call Archangeloi were at the human stage. They did not, of course, take the shape that human beings have now. They were formed completely differently. But they were at that time at their human stage. We should not imagine that during the time of Old Sun, the Archangeloi looked like modern human beings. But as regards their development, they were at their human stage. Similarly, the spirits of personality or time spirits were at their human stage during the period of old Saturn. Now let us single out these spirits to whom we refer as the Archangeloi. Thus we have these spirits who passed through their human stage during the period of old sun and rose to the stage of angels during the time of old moon and have in our time ascended to the stage of Archangeloi. We first want to place before our souls these spiritual beings who stand two stages higher than us. We shall return to them later. Then we have the spiritual beings who were human beings during the period of old Saturn and are today spirits of time, who stand three stages above us. Again, we want to visualize them. And now we shall consider our relationship specifically to these two kinds of spirits. When we as human beings pass through an incarnation, we may therefore acknowledge that in our earthly bodies today we are living in an incarnation, there stand above us spirits whom we regard as belonging to the hierarchy of the angels, then spirits belonging to the hierarchy of the archangeloi, and those belonging to the hierarchy of the archai, the time spirits or spirits of personality. They too are undergoing a development of their own. Let us consider specifically the Archai, 
the spirits of personality or time spirits. Thus we pass through our incarnation, we then go through the gate of death, enter after death into a spiritual world, undergo a purely spiritual development between death and a new birth, and then return to an earthly existence through a new birth. Now we may ask, on what does it depend whether after a certain number of years we again come down to the earth? This question has often been raised in public lectures. An answer can be given from a certain point of view, but in the intimate context of our branches we can give an answer that points more to the reality of the situation. While we are living here in the physical body, the time spirit has a quite particular level of development. It does something that is connected with the development of human beings on earth, and it undergoes a development of its own. When this time spirit has in the course of its evolution arrived at the point where we have all let what it is undergoing and has undergone flow into us, we are, as it were, ready to come down to an earthly incarnation. And when for its part it has proceeded a stage further, and we have in the course of our journey through the spiritual worlds developed to a certain stage, we can again enter into an earthly phase of development. We look first from the standpoint of our own evolution. We then look at how, in a very long period of time, the time spirit undergoes its development. If on this basis we view the evolution of earthly humanity by going back to the founding of ancient Rome, 800 years before the mystery of Golgotha, thus to the time when Rome was founded, we find that a certain time spirit began its development. Previously, another time spirit had been guiding and directing the destiny of the earth. And this time spirit, who had, at that time, taken over the guidance of the earth, in its spiritual evolution, was active right until the 16th century. Since that time, thus since the 16th century, there has been another time spirit. We are therefore concerned with two time spirits. A human individual who was, for example, incarnated in the 3rd century before the mystery of Golgotha, underwent what this time spirit was bringing about for the earth. If this person died in the 3rd century, or even in the 2nd century, the time spirit cannot, initially, give him anything for the time after his death. What it has been able to give him, it has already given him. The time spirit must now, for its part, pass through a number of years before it is able to give the person something new. Then this human individual who has been in a spiritual world between death and a new birth, again comes down to the earth when the time spirit can give him something new. Now things are so arranged that the individual human being actually, on average, comes several times, for the time spirit is not in a position always to give everything that he could give because of the imperfection of human beings. This means that a human individual comes several times in the period in which a time spirit is undergoing development. But the whole process depends on the fact that the time spirits rule over the successive incarnations of human beings. For their part, however, the time spirits rule over this whole course of human destiny by virtue of their having subordinates, and these are the archangels. Such archangels in their subordinate positions have much shorter periods of rulership than the time spirits. Whereas the time spirits hold sway for as long as I have previously indicated, so that we can assume the sovereignty of one time spirit from the founding of Rome until the 16th century, the spirits whom we regard as the hierarchy of the archangels have a period of rulership lasting approximately only between three and four centuries. They therefore alternate in such a way that six or seven come one after the other during the sovereignty of one time spirit, so that around the time when the mystery of Golgotha takes place, we have first the rulership over spiritual evolution of that archangel, whom we associate with the name of Ariphiel, 
Then comes the rulership of Anael. Then the rulership of Zechariah, Raphael, Samael, Gabriel, and now, since the year 1879, we have the sovereignty of that archangel whom we call Micaiah. Thus, when we contemplate the spiritual worlds, we have, as it were, the higher succession of the rulerships of archangels. Because man is unable to receive everything that the time spirit would give him, he does not take it directly from the hand of the time spirit, but from the hand of the archangel, of the less high power. We may therefore state, our immediate personal guardians belong to the hierarchy of the Angeloi. Above them stand those who govern human beings more in connection with other human beings, and above them stand the archai, or spirits of personality, or time spirits. When I speak in this way, I am referring to those beings who have pursued their development in a proper way, but not all spirits follow a rightful course of development. There are spiritual beings who were already archai during old Saturn, but who remain behind at the archai stage, thus at the stage where they were at that time. Thus now, during the earth evolution, they have not emerged from their Saturn stage. They have not risen to the stage of rightful development. They have retained their human character. They are on the one hand supersensible Saturn beings, but are at the human stage. Similarly, there are beings from the hierarchy of the Ark Angeloi who remained at the human stage on the sun and now exist in the supersensible world as human beings. We refer to these beings collectively as Luciferic beings, who are therefore retarded, or as Aramonic beings. We cannot enter today into the difference between Luciferic and Aramonic beings. They are all retarded spirits. Now we must answer the question, how does a human being, now in earthly incarnation, receive the influence of the spirits who have rightfully advanced in their development, the time spirits, or archai, and the archangeloi, who are their servants? These beings are of a supersensible nature. A person cannot relate to them as to the sense-perceptible world. He therefore does not, as a rule, know, if he relies wholly upon the world of the senses, that he is engaged in a development guided from above by the archai and the archangeloi. He is unaware of this. But these supersensible beings are involved with everything that pertains to his being. Now, those spiritual beings whom we call folk spirits, who therefore guide whole peoples or nations, also belong to the rank of the archangeloi, the archangels. And insofar as we owe what we are to the people to which we belong, we must regard what the national character endows us with as a gift of the respective being from the hierarchy of the archangeloi. It is the inspiration of the archangeloi that we receive through being placed in a particular people. Now we need only to consider what it means for a human individual that he belongs to a particular people. With nationality, there come spiritual qualities and also customs. A quite particular configuration of nature flows into a human individual. One can barely conceive of the difference it has made to the way one is constituted in an incarnation through the gift of the folk spirit, thus through the gift of an archangelic being. Except that we have our place within a national entity, and therefore through the inspiration of an archangelic being, receive certain configurations of our whole existence. We stand within the evolution of the whole of humanity, and there we are beholden to the intuitions to which the time spirit from the hierarchy of the archai leads us. You must also bear in mind that in our present spiritual and intellectual culture we receive something that goes beyond all national differences. This is something that we have through the fact that we are living in the period straddling the 19th and 20th centuries and would not have had if we had been living during the age of ancient Rome or Greece. We owe this to the time spirit. 
Moreover, one can make a clear distinction between a gift of the time spirit and a gift of the folk spirit. But if it were only a matter of a regular development of man, a regular development of the angelos, the archangelos, and the time spirit, we would, in every individual case, always receive the gift from our time spirit and from our respective folk spirit and would develop by receiving this gift. Human beings on the earth would develop alongside one another. All those belonging to the various peoples over the earth would receive the gift of the folk spirits on the earth, rather as if five pictures wholly distinct from one another were hanging in a room, but the one picture would not have the slightest effect on the others. Individual human beings would in this way receive the gift of their folk spirits alongside one another on the earth. They would not disturb one another if all evolution were to have proceeded as it should. But here, retarded spirits play their part. Among the archangeloi beings who guide human affairs are those who rightly began their evolution on the sun and have become rightly evolved archangeloi right up to the earth period. But there are also those who have remained at the sun stage and are essentially only at the level of human beings. These beings are therefore at the same stage as the folk spirits and yet have remained behind them. They only have the qualities of invisible, supersensible human beings, not of archangeloi. These beings are retarded in their nature. In a certain sense they make the same claims on the world as the archangeloi, but they have not reached the stage of the archangeloi on the earth. Hence, in a certain way, they have to work with the same forces as on the sun. The consequence of this is that the way they take hold of human beings is not as archangeloi, but as human beings, as invisible human beings who enter directly into human nature, who do not guide human beings from above, but invade human nature. And the impulse emanating from these spirits who therefore act in competition with the folk spirits offering real guidance, is that peoples feud with one another as opposed to living together peacefully on the earth. A human individual would not endeavor to identify his personality, his essential humanity, with his folk, but would regard this folk element as something that nourishes him spiritually. Moreover, he would not contentiously stand up for his national character and identify himself personally with it. He would not say, I am this or that nationality, but rather, nationality is a reality. And because I have been born into it, I must derive my spiritual nourishment via this nationality. But while the archangel spurs him to think in this way, the other being intervenes, who is actually on the level of humanity, is essentially a luciferic spirit and leads him into nationalism. The consequence of this is that the gift that comes down to the person concerned is not one that is archangelic in nature, but that he identifies with the national character as with something of a wholly personal nature, thus leading to this conflict of nationalities on the earth. We must be very clear about what is involved here because we have placed ourselves under the influence not only of the guiding archangel but also under that of the archangel who has come to a standstill and has remained behind. We identify with nationality in the way that we do on earth. The way that we feel about these matters from a spiritual scientific point of view is that we understand ourselves as human beings to be raised above the merely national in order to find access to the universally human. We can then be national in the most eminent sense. Just as one human individual can pursue one form of art and another person something different, and the one can practice his art without needing to be the opponent of the other, there would be no need for the one nationality to be the opponent of the other if there were no archangelic beings retarded in their evolution who caused the personal identification referred to earlier. 
One must keep this firmly in mind if one wants to speak of what lies at the foundation of human evolution with respect to nationality or other kinds of differentiation. With regard to the time spirit, you will see even more precisely how the Luciferic element exerts its influence upon the rightly evolved element if you consider the following. A time spirit exerts an influence through a certain period. Since the 16th century, there has been a new time spirit. This time spirit has its quite particular task. It has the task of adding the whole materialistic capacity and understanding of the world to previous evolutionary impulses. This is why the materialistic conception has made such great advances since the 16th century. We, therefore, do not need to regard materialistic understanding as something of less value than the former kind of understanding, provided that we do not identify with it one-sidedly. What will someone who looks at the matter in this way say about the rulership of the various time spirits? He will say, Now we are governed by a certain time spirit. Formerly, we were governed by a different time spirit. Human beings had different conceptions, different impulses. And if he were only to be influenced by rightly evolved time spirits, he would say, We must now adapt to this time spirit in that we immerse ourselves more in the laws of the world's evolution of materialistic thinking. Then after a while a different time spirit will come who will bring a different quality to human thinking. I have often emphasized that as practitioners of spiritual science we must say, today we promulgate spiritual science with quite particular words and ideas and concepts, but it is not the case that we believe that what we say today applies to the whole future of the earth, but it will change. When two thousand years will have passed, that which we call spiritual science today will be imparted with different words just as we speak differently than in the age of Greece. Nothing will remain of the manner of our words. We build not upon the foundation of something outwardly permanent, but we know that one time spirit takes over from the other and that all stand together on equal terms. But someone who is influenced by retarded time spirits from Saturn working within him and who identifies with their influence, may say, Those people at that time were all stupid. This was the kindergarten of humanity. We have today gone far beyond this. We have now discovered truths that apply conclusively to the whole of the future. One becomes more modest and humble in the realm of spiritual science. Anyone who identifies with the time spirit will say, Copernicus has now finally discovered the truth. Formerly something different was believed. People will henceforth forever say that the earth and the planets move in an ellipse around the sun. The sun stands in the middle. Spiritual science today knows that this is a one-sided teaching. It is a very good way for a materialistic age to envisage the world, but in absolute terms it is wrong. It is not true that the sun is at the focal point of an ellipse and that the earth moves around it. In truth, this is all a materialistically calculated, illusory movement. The truth is that the sun is itself moving and the earth and the other planets follow it in a screw-like movement. And through the rising of certain positions in this screw-like movement, the earth comes to be here or there at any one time. Through this arises the illusion of an ellipse. The line is actually a different one. A time will come when scientists will recognize this. One becomes more modest when one knows the truths expressed in a particular form are valid only for certain times. And as true practitioners of spiritual science, we will never assert that from now on all people in all future times will say, Man consists of a physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego. For the future, we'll have a very different way of expressing it. The point is that everything is in a process of development. 
that the ideas of yesterday are as justified as the ideas of today, that we do not only let ourselves be governed by a time spirit that leads us to believe that everything in former times was vain illusion and deception, and that we have progressed so wonderfully beyond it. With respect to the time spirit, you see that people are possessed by a luciferic spirit when they say, How wonderful our progress has been since then. How imperfect everything was that people used to think and say about the world. Whereas, what we have now discovered will last forever. What has been discovered since the 16th century will continue to exist as eternal truths. Thus, what one discerns in any particular folk spirit is actually a complicated being. It is the rightly evolved folk spirit who hovers over us, and whom we, if we followed it alone, would follow in such a way that we accept its gifts, because we have been placed in its sphere. But it is constantly hampered in its activity by its luciferic companion who enters into us, causing us to identify as an individual human being with the customs and traditions of our nationality. However, individual human beings accomplish this in a variety of ways, and it is of immense importance that it is seen that in the middle of Europe a national character must develop that stands differently in relation to the being of its folk spirit than that which lies at the periphery of Europe. This insight is one that we must learn to acquire. It is to the highest degree significant what goes on beneath the surface of human consciousness, and which is actually dependent upon the spiritual beings of the higher hierarchies. Someone who thinks in a materialistic way will interpret it as sheer fantasy when one says that from spiritual beings there emanate such impulses that I have just specified, one of which is that in Central Europe, without people being aware of it, popular consciousness has been thrust toward such a way of experiencing the divinity, or because Christ is an active presence in Central Europe, the Christ being, that a person from Central Europe learns to experience Christ in such a way that he speaks to the innermost depths of the soul. This has not been the case in any territory as it has in Central Europe. For example, in the Roman period of the Christian era, the Christ was indeed understood as a being who has come to the earth, who has been working on behalf of human beings. To be sure, those who were more advanced in their ideas, and to some extent those who had already been thinking as those of us who know of spiritual science think today, had a sense of the way that Paul was thinking when he wrote, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote. But there is still a difference between this and an experience such as we find in Meister Eckhart, in Thaler, in Angelus Silesius and other similar minds. How did they relate to the mystery of Golgotha? We need only to ask Angelus Silesius, and he will answer with the beautiful lines, quote, If Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem is born, and not in you, you will yet be eternally forlorn. Close quote. It is a matter of experiencing the mystery of Golgotha within one's own soul. These individuals from Central Europe sought inwardly to experience something that is an inner picture, an inner expression of the mystery of Golgotha. It is therefore so wonderful when Angelus Silesius speaks about death and says, Everything that fundamentally happens to me happens because God is in me and accomplishes things within me. And when I die, it is not I who dies, but God actually dies in me. Think what a wonderfully intimate idea of immortality lies within the words, God dies in me. For God is, of course, immortal. If God dies in me, death is only apparent. Then one feels how Angelus Silesius has this feeling that God only apparently dies within one, for God cannot die. Thus dying is not what it outwardly appears to be. It is only a fact of the living. And because God cannot die, but nevertheless dies within one, one has a sense of the idea of immortality. 
This inner and highly intimate affinity with God, whether one experiences God as a divinity or in a Christian form, is what has long been prepared in the course of Central European evolution. And the Central European folk spirits have brought it about that this has found an outward symbolic expression, a real symbolic expression. Nowhere other than in Central Europe is, in quotes, ich, I in English, said, when one is referring to one's own ego, one's own being. Through the folk spirit, manifesting itself as the spirit of language, the whole of evolution has been so guided that it has gradually come to give expression to one's own being by means of the word ich. But ich, quote I-ch, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lies within this word. Through the fact that in the word ich, Jesus Christ comes to expression in his initial letters, there is a symbolic expression of what lies in the spiritual nature of Central Europe, of how it is intimately connected with the most inward experience. Every time that one speaks the word Ich, one is giving expression to the initial letters of Jesus Christ. If one would but cast one's spiritual eye, E-Y-E, on such things, which are indeed seen today as purely fanciful, one would have a sense of how unconsciously the spirits of the higher hierarchies are forever working into human evolution and then find something significant in the things that one really takes for granted today. I should like to mention one really significant fact. There is a certain group of European people who are referred to as Germanic peoples. But when in Central Europe one speaks of Germans, one means England, Holland, Norway, Sweden, and also others. One extends the concept of Germanness more broadly. I am not seeking to provoke, but simply wish to point out what is given in the language. When English people speak, they do not call themselves Germans. They only call the Germans die Deutschen, Germans. The German der Deutsche calls himself a German, ein Deutscher. And when he speaks of Germans, Germanen, he is embracing a larger group of people. The Englishman applies the name Germans purely to the Germans, die Deutschen, to those who are not the same as he is. This is a hugely significant fact. It is something that is in the deepest sense significant with respect to the way that the folk spirit works on the one side or the other, to how in Central Europe it endeavors to encompass something wider, and the folk spirit of the English people endeavors to extract itself from what encompasses a wider dimension and apply it only to others. Generally speaking, what language teaches us as the outcome of an active popular culture, will gradually come to manifest itself in a wonderful way for people. When one speaks in this way about the various European peoples, there is at present little understanding of how I sought to do so several years before this war, and by no means prompted by it, in the cycle title, The Mission of the Individual Folk Souls in Connection with Teutonic Mythology. People interpret it as though I was wanting to express value judgments of some kind, but the intention was not to express value judgments, but simply to give a characterization. And we can now characterize especially the West European peoples by bringing precisely and concisely to expression what I indicated in this lecture cycle. We know that the human soul consists of sentient soul, intellectual or mind soul, and consciousness soul, and that the ego works within these three nuances of soul. If we now consider the Italian people together with its folk soul, we find the distinctive quality that the folk soul sends its inspiration into the sentient soul. This is the characteristic element of the Italian national character, that the folk soul works inspirationally into the sentient soul. If something is possessed by the Luciferic folk spirit, this is also true of the folk soul. And now consider that on the one hand the greatness of the Italian people consists in the fact that the sentient soul is inspired. Think of Dante, 
of all the great Italian artists, but also again the matter of personal identification, as it were the superhuman aspect which is luciferically retarded in all the passionate developmental impulses that appear within the Italian people. This is not to imply a value judgment, but simply to characterize what is present. With the French people we can see everywhere how the intellectual soul or mind soul is inspired by the folk soul, indeed the intellectual or mind soul. With the British people it is the consciousness soul. Now, for the present cycle of humanity, the consciousness soul is that which most brings man into connection with the outer physical world. Hence that national entity which is inspired by the consciousness soul is above all entrusted with the mission of furthering and promoting materialistic culture. It is therefore again not a question of expressing a value judgment, but of simply characterizing the fact that the British nation is called upon to inspire the consciousness soul. In so far as the individual belongs to his people, thus in so far as he is inspired by the Luciferic folk spirit, he identifies with the purely materialistic culture of the present. We indeed find this in British culture. To the extent that the individual belongs to the British nation, the materialistic spirit of the British nation becomes apparent. This distinctive spirit that between the years of 1856 and 1900 has conducted 34 wars of conquest and has made 57 millions of earthly human beings new British subjects, and which in our time pretends to represent the freedom of individual human groups. When we are considering a time such as ours, we must be absolutely clear that it is one that will teach people to feel what one now represents as the conflict between the various national groups of Europe or of a large part of the earth as an awakening call. Those belonging to 34 nationalities are involved together in a war, wholly irrespective of minor racial differences. One should see this as an awakening call that has very little to do with what people have hitherto called history. This latter way of looking at things is especially, in our time, being taken to nonsensical levels. It really is so absurd what the various European nations are putting forward today, that people weigh up the various outward facts in order to discover the causes of this terrible war. But precisely this war will teach people that one will find nothing in its outward causes other than, at best, external symptoms of what lies deeply and inwardly hidden in groups of people as a result of the guidance of advanced and retarded spiritual beings. And in a certain sense what our present time manifests by way of trials will compel people to extend their scrutiny to the spiritual depths where lie the causes of what is outwardly happening in the world. One can show in all sorts of ways how that which manifests itself outwardly is working in the deep foundations of consciousness. Although most of our friends are already familiar with this example, I should like again to indicate how the whole map of Europe at the end of the Middle Ages was determined by the intervention of the Maid of Orleans in the war between England and France. Anyone who views our outward history with understanding has to acknowledge that the map of Europe would have had a very different form if, as a result of the intervention of the Maid of Orleans in the war, England had not been defeated by France at that time. But the Maid of Orleans was no highly skilled strategist. She was not someone who was at the pinnacle of current training and development. She was a simple human child, a country girl. But through her, spirits of the higher hierarchies were working in the way they had to work at this time. And it has been thoroughly necessary that these spirits have been working in subconscious regions right up to our time, because people have not as yet been able to understand what must now be understood through spiritual science. We have often found it beautifully expressed in legends 
how higher spiritual beings intervene in the realm of the subconscious. And it is with justice and not a matter of superstition because it corresponds to the actual facts that the time from Christmas until 6 January when, for the outer world, the year is most withdrawn was regarded with particular significance. If one seeks spiritual knowledge, not in the way that we seek it today on the path described entitled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? But it wishes to reach it in a more elemental way. One could be inspired in these thirteen nights. This is, for example, very beautifully expressed in the Norwegian legend of Olaf Astason. In this legend we are shown how Olaf Astason goes to church before the beginning of the Christmas festival, how, before the church, he enters into a state of sleep and is asleep throughout the thirteen nights, how he wakes up on three kings' day and is able to relate what he has experienced, and what he then pictorially relates in a visionary but primitive way corresponds to what we call the passage through the soul world and the passage through the spirit land. All this Olaf Astason has experienced in the time within which the Christmas festival is rightly placed. This should indicate to us that the clairvoyance of a child of nature could be developed in these thirteen nights between Christmas and the festival of the three kings. Since the maid of Orleans was such a child of nature, one might presuppose that in these thirteen nights she had experienced the world through a kind of dream condition, of which she said, when she led the French army against the English, that she had been inspired in these thirteen nights. Moreover, this happened in a quite distinctive way. Every human individual passes through a state of sleep, a condition where the senses do not yet speak. This is in the mother's body before he perceives the physical light of the earth. This is indeed a kind of sleeping state, and the maturest part of this state is, of course, in the last thirteen days before birth. What is so extraordinary, and what fills our soul with astonishment, is that the maid of Orleans was born on 6 January. She therefore underwent an inspirational journey during the thirteen nights before her eyes had opened to the earthly light. That 6 January is the birthday of the maid of Orleans is therefore also intentionally specified in our calendar. This is something that we need to understand in its world historical context. For it can tell us how mysterious the connections in the world are and how mysterious powers are working in the world. Thus mysterious powers were at work then, on 6 January, when the people in the little village where the Maid of Orleans was born came flocking together in the morning when the animals behaved in so wonderful a way. On this 6th of January, an inspiration could be concluded. During the thirteen nights, a being could be inspired who was karmically predisposed for this. Of course, not everyone who was born on 6th January has such a predisposition, but karma must harmonize with the other circumstances. I wanted to mention this example of the Maid of Orleans, as one that well shows us how subconscious powers contribute to historical development and evolution. To be sure, there then came the materialistic developments of the ensuing centuries. They inevitably understood such a reference to the deep foundations of history as sheer lunacy. This doesn't matter just as it matters not at all if people outside the movement still regard this spiritual science as a lot of nonsense. Spiritual science will find its way through this. But such significant events as those within which people are living at present and into which they have been incarnated in order to participate in them in one or another form do not always have the same significance in historical evolution. Today these destiny-laden events signify an awakening call to human beings. Already such a wealth of literature has been written about this war, but in everything that has appeared in books, brochures, and so on, we do not find what people presume will be found, and which must gradually be found. One often hears, It is not 
really possible to speak of the causes. Perhaps after the war. Perhaps only after several decades will people discover from documents the true causes of the war and know who was really to blame. You can read this on every other page of the newspapers. But this is not the point. What matters is that because of this time in which we are living, the real causes are not to be seen in these outward reasons, but that one finds the cause in the spiritual world. One will find that this war has been instituted as the particular karma of materialism, which must be undergone in order that people assemble sufficient convictions to reach across from materialism to spiritualism. This is the trial that humanity has to undergo. What then is actually happening around us today in so shocking a way? We know that when someone passes through the gate of death, he first leaves his physical body behind in the physical world. He initially enters the spiritual world with his etheric body, astral body, and ego. He soon casts off the etheric body, and this is incorporated in the rest of the world. He then passes on through the soul land and through the spirit land. But now consider that today a large number of people are passing through the gate of death in a relatively short period that they cast off an etheric body that would normally have been able to support a human life for several decades. When someone between the ages of 20 and 30 dies, he casts off his etheric body, which has the capacity to sustain his physical body for 60 or 70 years. The forces reside in the etheric body, for in the spiritual world nothing is lost. All those who are passing through the portal of death in the flower of their youth today, surrender to the world an etheric body that would have been able to sustain this life for a long time to come. These forces are now in the spiritual world. What are these forces? I should like, by means of a striking example derived from our own circle, to demonstrate to you the significance of such a phenomenon. It was last autumn when a family belonging to our anthroposophical circle lost their seven-year-old son, who was a very likable boy. The outer circumstances were indeed of the most tragic nature. As a German citizen, the father had had to enlist in the war. He had just been taken ill and was in a military hospital. One evening, when there had been a lecture in Dornach, where our building is being erected, it was pointed out to us that the little seven-year-old boy was missing. He had not returned home in the evening. I should not forget to mention that the family had settled in Dornach as a gardener's family. I had myself shortly beforehand traveled to Switzerland from Germany. The boy had come to meet me in front of the building and held out his hand to me, a sunny and very likable child. So that evening we received the news that the boy was missing. The only possible thought was that a furniture van that had brought some furniture for members had overturned in the vicinity of the building and had fallen on the child. Now, you must bear in mind that for as many years as one can remember, no furniture van had come that way and since then also not. You must, moreover, consider that the boy lived with his mother who cared for the gardens. He was such a good boy that when his father had to go away, he said to his mother that he would be really diligent in his help because his father was no longer there. He had, that evening, been sent to the so-called canteen to fetch something for his mother. It was not far, only a short distance lies between the canteen and his mother's house. There is a fork in the track on this short stretch, so that the furniture van had to negotiate a bend. The boy had actually wanted to leave ten minutes earlier, but had been detained by someone who wanted to talk with him. Had he left earlier and by a door other than the one he left by, he would have passed the van sooner and on the left side, whereas he was now walking on the right. Because he left later by a different door and was on the right of the furniture van, when the van overturned it fell on the boy. People saw the mishap, only those who were with the horses, but no one suspected that the boy was trapped beneath the van. They then said, The van is too heavy for us to lift this evening. We'll do it in the morning. All this happened between five and six o'clock. 
and now we were in the position of having to get the van upright at a quarter past ten. By midnight this was done, and we lifted out the dead boy. Now the first thing I should like to say is this, that such an example well illustrates how people think erroneously also about life. I should additionally like to cite another frequently used comparison for this erroneous thinking. Suppose that you see in the distance someone walking beside a river. You suddenly see that he has fallen into the river. You run to have a look. You find that there is a stone where he fell. You then, of course, say that he stumbled over the stone, fell into the water, and thereby met his death. A quite different and indeed opposite explanation is also possible. The person may have had a heart attack. He fell into the water because he was already dead. He did not meet his death by falling into the water. This mistake is made constantly, especially in natural science. One does, of course, not notice it when it is so subtly concealed. It was a similar situation with this boy. The child's karma had run its course. The spiritual beings ruling over this mystery had arranged everything so that the child could meet his death. The boy was seven years old. A really youthful, etheric body that would have been able to sustain life for many decades, the forces were available. Now I shall always acknowledge what it means that for some time our Dornach building has been embedded within the enlarged etheric body of the little boy Theodor Weiss. The etheric body is indeed enlarged. It becomes bigger after death. And the etheric body of this little seven-year-old Theo has ever since formed a kind of aura for the building. And if one has anything to do with the building, if one has the need to find the ideas for the building that incorporate it rightly in the spiritual world, Since the death of this boy, one knows that one is inspired by the etheric body that forms, together with the aura of the building, the etheric body of little Theo Weiss. No longing that I might have to appear original would lead me to deny that many of the contributions for the building have arisen and have been inspired by the circumstance that the aura of this etheric body is around the building, and that one has with regard to the building this help that this unspent etheric body is working in favor of the building. Think what significant inner facts stand behind the outer facts. A family moves its dwelling place to the vicinity of the building. A boy is especially predisposed through his soul being. He sacrifices his etheric body in order that the building is enshrouded in the power of this etheric body. Here we have an example through which we can see how unspent etheric bodies that have been sacrificed have their task in the world. Only then does that which should flow by way of feeling content from our spiritual science really have its beginning. That one knows that man consists of a physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego, and that he passes through various earthly lives is really not what it's all about. What matters is that something becomes part of our actual experience through these views. We also endeavor thereby to bring life into our movement, so that not only theoretically, through teaching, but through life itself we try to overcome the difference between the living and the dead. When a very dear colleague of ours, Fritz Mitcher, was recently taken away from us in his thirtieth year, and I had to give the address at the cremation in Basel, There were some important words that I addressed to this soul with the object of requesting that it might continue working further among us also after death. For we not only need the so-called living, but we need the collaboration of those who have passed through the portal of death, and they will collaborate with us in a twofold way. On the one hand, a large number of etheric bodies, that those who have crossed the threshold of death in grave experiences of destiny have cast off, will serve as collaborators in the near future. Youthful, unspent, etheric bodies are now like a great mighty aura in which we are now living. And then, on the other hand, there are the individualities themselves who are working further from out of their etheric bodies. We can look upon these unspent etheric bodies in, for example, the case of little Theo Feiss, where his etheric body becomes an inspiration 
for much that is achieved through the building. I wish to focus on the individuality in my address to Fritz Mitcher. It is an essential part of our spiritual science in this way wholly to sense and feel how the gulf separating life and death is bridged. For it must become the conscious preoccupation of our earthly lives, not only theoretically to know, but wholly livingly to embrace the awareness that the dead are for us as living beings, that the dead give something in the form of youthful, unspent etheric bodies. And in these etheric bodies that belonged to people who have now found death through the great destiny-laden events, there live the echoes of all that is experienced, where the imminent prospect of death is, more or less consciously, seen as a sacrifice for the events demanded by the time. This enters into these etheric bodies. To seek death, or to be more precise, to foresee death, and nevertheless know that this death has a significance, will be the case with numerous people who are passing through the gate of death in the present time. One can be a materialist. If one lives one's life in such a way, one may say, folk souls and folk spirits are merely names for something that abstractly links a group of human beings together with the same language and the same distinctive qualities. To speak of folk spirits as real beings is sheer craziness. Many of those now passing through the portal of death may themselves echo these words, but by passing in this way through death, they unconsciously give their assent to what spiritual science must say, namely, that a folk spirit or folk soul is a real being. For what would it mean if folk spirits and folk souls were not real beings, and yet from all sides human beings are engaged in a bloody war? On the basis of a materialistic world structure, this would be inconceivable. But if the individual sacrifices himself for the folk spirit, if to him the folk spirit is a real being, it is profoundly meaningful that such events befall human beings. Thus we shall come to be aware of a time when many, many unspent etheric bodies are hovering in the spiritual atmosphere, all urging that there is a spiritual world. These etheric bodies will in future be good helpers for the spiritual deepening of people's conception of the world. Human beings will simply have to experience in their souls how the dead call. When peace again comes to reign over the fields, over which terrible events are now being enacted, those who will then be living will be able to live to better effect when they hear the voice of the dead. But this is not meant merely symbolically. The unspent etheric bodies will be there and ring out their call. The world will not be able to exist in future unless people sense and feel their connection with the spiritual world. And the humanity of the future would therefore prove to be dull and impassive if they were to be unable to hear the urging of the dead. In physics, everyone accepts that no force is lost, one speaks of the transformation of forces. It is similar in the spiritual realm. The forces that the unspent etheric body carries through the gate of death do not disappear. They will continue to be there. And they can be received into the souls of the future. These souls can, through this connection with the soul residues that are left behind from unspent etheric bodies, receive strength and confidence for spiritual work. In addition to much that this war can say to us, something that is of particular importance to us as advocates of spiritual science is that we, as it were, look up into the atmosphere which will come to be an atmosphere of unspent etheric bodies. While here on the earth there must be souls who have a feeling for the fact that these are the awakening calls of the dead, it is our task as proper advocates of spiritual science to bring this about. We must be able to find a point of view that accords with the Spirit also as regards these events of our time, not the point of view that abstract thinking asserts. But we must envisage the future population of the earth in such a way that down below there are souls who are in the physical body, 
while from above the unspent forces of etheric bodies send down their influences, and that these souls down below are able to say, We do not doubt that better times for spiritual awareness will come, for unspent etheric bodies are helping us with their forces. If we see this in a real way and not abstractly, we will have understood something of the exhortations that this destiny-laden time can give us, especially as people who identify themselves with spiritual science. It is of such importance that this happens, for there is a need for real influences flowing into human evolution. We would have to continue working for a long time if we had to call forth through intellectual convictions what the spiritual world conception wants to impart. In the case of the Maid of Orleans, an unconscious initiation took place. In future, the spiritual world will engage with human evolution in a different way. It will be the unspent etheric bodies that will be at our side, helping us. And also those who, as individualities, want to bring their influences to bear upon the physical plane. With regard to what people are able to understand, some very strange things sometimes happen also today. You will already agree that at the time of the Maid of Orleans, the strategists, the army commanders, did not bring about what actually happened. There is another example that I have often cited. When, in the decisive moment, Constantine's army was marching toward Rome, it was also not the army commanders who brought about the victory and overcame Maxentius's army, which was five times bigger, as he led it before the gates of Rome to meet Constantine. Constantine did not follow the advice of his commanders, but a dream that told him to let Christ's monogram go before his army. Dreams and Sibylline oracles had led the armies together then at a certain point and decided everything. However, because Constantine was victorious, the map of Europe again acquired the appearance that reflected this. Who was it who was guiding events beneath the threshold of consciousness? It was the Christ impulse. But the impulse of Christ as he really was, and not as people understood him to be. We do not come to know the Christ impulse when we listen to the disputes of the theologians. The Christ impulse has been working not in what people have consciously formulated, in what people have understood, but he was working in linking together the events involving Constantine and Maxentius and later again with the Maid of Orleans. Likewise, in our modern age, there is much to be experienced, albeit sometimes in matters of minor concern. But sometimes small things can be compared with greater ones. Thus, a few years ago, a famous philosopher wrote a lengthy article about the worldview of the spiritual science with which I have been associated in a South German monthly journal. This article had quite an influence. It was written in a very adversarial way, while containing a largely favorable judgment about theosophy in general, and also much that one could appreciate. I was, for example, given the advice that instead of focusing on such things, I should rather use my gifts in order conclusively to make it known whether Mikowitz was the reincarnation of the Maid of Orleans and so on. But overall the article was very good at presenting what our spiritual scientific world conception is considered to be in such a way as to evoke an uneven impression. The philosopher who had written the article was regarded as a great Platonist, a great logician. He himself has said that the only task to which he dedicates himself is the proclamation of truth so he should know the truth. The editor of the journal seemed very satisfied to be able to publish such a long authoritative article about this spiritual science. That was several years ago. Then came the war. The person concerned is not of a mind to sympathize with Central Europe, but he sympathizes very strongly with England and France. Now what happens? He writes a number of letters to the same man, the editor of the journal. The editor of the journal publishes these letters as well, but because they are too characteristic, in a different journal, the Süddeutsche Monatsch Heft. He even points out that he is the same man, Karl Muth, who edits the journal Hochland, 
and who printed the article about what he refers to as quote, Steinerite theosophy, close quote. As for the letters, what one can say about them is that all the venom that can be expressed about Central Europeans by someone with West European sympathies can be found there. Among other things, this man explains that in comparison to these people who are all incapable of knowing what they are fighting for, black people are free members of the nobility. In comparison to Central Europe, one merely needs to consider the English world empire, which, like the Catholic Church, has been instituted by God and has never done anything other than what lies in the divine ordering of the world. Printing such a letter is something that speaks for itself. The editor in question writes of this. In the whole of Central Europe, the only place where someone could be found who could write such things is a madhouse. Thus, now, the good Hermut admits that the man whom he chose to let loose on our spiritual scientific world conception belongs in a madhouse. Yes, this is how it stands with what had been adduced about our spiritual scientific world conception. Now, Hermut should have known at the time that the man was fit for the madhouse, but he first needed the awakening call of the war. His insight had first to be stirred by what he could now easily see. There are many who wander about criticizing the world conception that we represent who should be in the madhouse, but this does not become apparent in so grotesque a way as in the instance referred to. I was saying that this example shows that the intellect that people have today would still have a long way to go when it comes to the world conception of spiritual science and that it has to be said, not only the living are necessary in order that quantum spirituality, which must come into the world, may appear, but also the dead. And those who are the best source of help are those who with heart and soul had put themselves behind the course of the fateful and destiny-laden events that we are experiencing in the present. And so one would wish today that such considerations do not remain within souls as something purely theoretical, but become a deeply honest feeling, the feeling that we may develop our belief in and commitment to spiritual science, in such a way that our souls develop and foster the attentive awareness that there will be urging voices in the spiritual world saying to us, let those of us who have died be a sign that a spiritual deepening must come to human beings, for we passed through this death with consciousness, not for our own souls, but for what is independent of us, so that we have thereby sealed the belief in something that reaches beyond the individual material human life. If among those who feel a commitment to spiritual science there will be those who sense, feel, and know the grave whispering of those who have thus crossed the threshold of death, something will indeed be achieved of what needs to be accomplished through spiritual science within the sensibilities of human souls. In other words, if through spiritual science there will be souls who know how to guide their conscious minds into the spirit realm, It will be possible for much to be said to human individuals from the realm of spirit in the times to come. This is what I wanted to indicate to you, for you to ponder upon, since the arrangements are such that during this time we shall also be able to gather in a branch meeting. One would wish that at such gatherings knowledge will not merely be grasped in a seed-like form, but that what is said during such gatherings may work as a living seed that is immersed in the ground of the feeling soul. The main thing will be what you will carry forward with you in your feelings as the result of such studies. We shall therefore conclude these studies by calling to mind what is to emerge for us from the destiny-laden events of the time, quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. The end of Lecture 9.
You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death, 15 Lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is Lecture 10, given in Prague on the 15th of May, 1915, entitled The Significance of the Position of Central Europe Between East and West, Aramonic Inspiration and Spiritual Impulses, the Symbol of the Rose Cross. When we are gathered at such an opportunity through which a designated space is devoted to our endeavors, to which we can give a spiritual stamp that accords with our spiritual scientific feeling and sensibilities, it is good if we call to mind the wider perspective that as adherents of spiritual science we intend to adopt toward the world and its phenomena, its tasks, its great riddles. And how should our time, which is so beset with trials and tribulations, not also awaken within our souls a sense of urgency to arrive at a viewpoint that speaks to the future? There must especially in our time be the longing for a point of view that goes further than what can be discerned through outer life and outer human striving. Thus at an important place in our new building in Dorna, we shall erect a sculptural group that directly derives from the tasks and aspirations of our spiritual scientific world outlook. This sculptural group is to portray what our souls should feel in the deepest sense as deriving from our movement. This group will include a central figure. One can designate this central figure as the Christ. One can also see it as that which, in man, endeavors to incorporate the divinity residing within human nature rightly in the world. One can regard this central human figure as, in quotes, man, the cosmic human being, expressed in an earthly personality, as Christ was expressed in temporal, historical life through Jesus of Nazareth. But there will be two other figures beside this central figure, one of which is as though up on a rock. It has wings, but is falling down from the rock. And through the distinctive gesture of the central figure, imbued as it is not with strength, but with an inner firmness, a power is engendered whereby the figure up on the rock, the winged figure, breaks its wings and plunges into the depths. This breaking of the wings, this must be well expressed in a sculptural form, is brought about not because the human being who stands in the middle, the Christ man, breaks the wings, but because he extends his hand in his spirituality. The other, the winged being, cannot bear this. And as a result of what is going on within him, and because he finds what lives below him unendurable, breaks his wings himself and plunges down. It therefore needs to be firmly stated that this being is falling of itself, that it is not being made to do so through some adversarial force. And down below, in the rock, we see another figure lying bound in chains. This one has the aim of stirring up the earthly realm from below. But in this endeavor, it does not prevail against what streams forth from the downward extended hand of the central figure. It is made to coil and become bent by being repulsed and thrown back likewise in its own being through the power of the central figure. You may have a sense that in this group there comes to expression what we call the Christ principle of our cosmos in the central figure, the Luciferic principle in the angel plunging down from the rock, and the Aramonic principle in the figure that aspires upward from down in the cave. 
I have tried to form these three figures, we may speak in this way, in so intimate a circle as this, as far as possible as one would a portrait, so that one will really have an impression of the form adopted by Araman when he appears in such a relationship to the human being, and also of the physiognomy of Lucifer that he adopts when he appears in relation to man. What the Western religious world conception lacks even in our time, and what can be conveyed to it only through our spiritual scientific world conception, is the knowledge that Araman and Lucifer are involved in all that happens in the world. One can openly only hint at such things, because today people still recoil from a specific way of expressing matters of this kind. But let us recall that even in yesterday's public lecture it was said that through meditation a person is, on the one hand, led into a region where he feels himself to be solitary and powerless in his innermost being, and on the other hand, into a region where he feels himself to be inwardly seized by fear and impotence. What threatens us when we strive one-sidedly only for freedom from material constraints What threatens us when we aspire abstractly for the spirit is being engulfed by the Luciferic principle. What threatens us when we gravitate solely toward material things, when our lives are a constant hunger for them, and we become as though hardened, parenthesis, as I explained yesterday in the public lecture, close parenthesis, this is the Aramonic principle and man stands between the Luciferic and the Aramonic principle. This must be recognized. But it must also be recognized in the right way, that it is not good enough if we simply say we must wipe away from us everything to do with Lucifer and Araman. All feelings of hatred or fear that we may have about Luciferic and Aramonic influences are actually not beneficial to our human nature we must recognize that Araman and Lucifer have their rightful place in the whole cosmos. Thus, in the form of the sculpture, it is indicated that Christ does not want to overcome Lucifer and Araman through an inner hatred or from an urge emanating from himself, but that Lucifer and Araman overcome themselves. It is quite wrong if we develop feelings within us to the effect that Araman and Lucifer must be repelled by us, that we must combat them directly. The Godhead that normally prevails in the world has in its wisdom not ordered things so that the Aramonic principles do not have their place in the world order. They have their part to play. If we ask ourselves where the Luciferic principle is today in human evolution, we must look toward the East. In the East, in Asia, and in European Russia, Lucifer holds sway in cultural terms. And although, as I have explained in the cycle about the mission of folk souls, the Russian element has the task of developing the spirit self, there is in Russian culture the danger of being entangled by Lucifer. It is on its way toward this. The Luciferic principle consists in that good spirits remain behind. Until the 6th and 7th centuries, there was a good spirit in the Greek Orthodox Church. But what was at one time a good spirit changes into a Luciferic spirit if it continues on beyond this time. Being firmly bound to the orthodox religion is a state of, quote, being in the claws of Lucifer, close quote. And this is still more intensely the case with the spiritual forms that develop in the Orient, which had their justification with respect to ancient times. By perpetuating themselves, they develop in a Luciferic direction. Throughout the East we find with very many people who are incarnated there, that they have something to work through in the Luciferic realm. And in the West, in accordance with the wise ordering of the world, we find souls who are immersed in the Aramonic element.
We find this most strongly in America. In America, there exists the tendency to develop a culture that is wholly immersed in materialism, in the aramonic element, that even where there is an aspiration toward spiritualism is wholly pervaded by a purely material outlook. Even where people strive toward the spirit, there is a wish tangibly to conjure up spirits in a spiritistic way. This will become ever stronger, and the longing to make everything matter of fact will become ever greater. It will also gradually take hold of the west of Europe. Then will the mission of bringing the aramonic element into culture be fulfilled. This is what I mean by the wider perspective, that we see how in Central Europe we are wedged between the Luciferic principle of the East and the aramonic principle of the West, but how we are called upon to soar up to the forces that are represented by the Christ principle, which on the one hand causes Lucifer to break his wings through the overcoming of the feeling of powerlessness, and on the other hand develops the radiating forces against Araman which repel all fear that stands before any knowledge of the spiritual world. For the aramonic element that pulsates through the world cannot in truth be held back. It is a reality. The culture of Central Europe is also gripped by this aramonic element. But one needs to know how one should oppose it, for the course of the aramonic element is the passage through materialism and this passage through materialism must be undertaken. The reason for this has a deep, wisdom-filled connection. Just think what a one-sided religious movement, and I am referring to this one-sided quality, is also currently manifested in Christianity, most strongly apparent in the element of Jesuitism. Consider that it always opposes any real scientific progress, Only in the 19th century did the Catholic Church officially recognize the Copernican world conception. Conventional science will naturally be opposed by a one-sided religion. This cannot be otherwise. Two impulses reside in this opposition on the part of religion to ordinary science. One of these is that the one-sided religion feels that in a science that focuses solely upon the outer world, Araman makes himself manifest. This is the justified aspect of the Church's battle. Araman's hold over ordinary science so that it does not extend to a spiritual worldview is a justified area of attention. On the other hand, there is an unjustified impulse in a one-sided religion's opposition to science. This one-sided religious world outlook is itself ensouled one might say wholly pervaded, especially by a luciferic element. For to strive for a deepening of religious life and to hate the diffusion of scientific influence into spiritual worlds is what Lucifer wants of man. Lucifer could not better achieve his aim than if all people were religious. This religiosity has an immensely strong egotistic impulse. Just think how people who do not strive for spiritual knowledge conceive of their religion. It is out of egotism that they want to develop a blissful state, to lead a life that, as they picture it, culminates in death. It is out of egotism that they want to be incarnated only once in the world. In a one-sided religion, egotism is taken to the highest level, an egotism of the soul, not only of the body. The best religious aspirations that surround us are firmly rooted in egotism. And indeed, the most pious people who move us through their piety are ruled in their religious feelings by Lucifer. It is greatly preferable to Lucifer when he acquires pious souls who have a sense for the spiritual, the good to which they aspire out of egotism. He does not want merely criminal souls. He wants to lead pious souls into his domain. Thus on the one side stands the rightful scientific element that would, on the threshold, tend toward the aramonic aspect if it does not look up to the spiritual world, and on the other side the luciferic element 
which would also in Central Europe fall prey to egotistical religiosity if the spiritual outlook on the world were not to lead to a spiritual knowledge. This will represent a step forward in Christianity. Thus it becomes an infinitely precious feeling if we imbue ourselves with the knowledge that we knowingly stand between what must be the Luciferic and Aramonic element, which one cannot avoid, but which loses its power when one recognizes it. This is the distinctive quality of the spiritual world. When one recognizes this element, it loses the power through which it is able to possess human beings. Lucifer and Araman are invisible. If we acquire a conception of them in space and time, they lose their power over us. You should not believe that when an evil spirit is intuited by someone through clairvoyant power, but is not beheld, the person concerned does something bad if this spirit is pictorially portrayed or represented sculpturally. This is right. Through becoming visible to the senses, the spirit thereby loses its power. People will no longer become nervous through the spiritual representing of a figure, but the spirit thereby loses its significance as an invisible power and we place ourselves consciously into it. Just as the Godhead itself needed Lucifer and Araman to bring the world into the right alignment from east and west in order that the world does not undergo an irregular development, but advances as though in a pendulum-like movement, the world rulership lets the Luciferic work from the east and the Aramanic from the west. But it presents us in Central Europe with the difficult and considerable task of contemplating this pendulum movement in the right way. This pendulum is actually a boat, as if a boat were hung on a pendulum clock. And in this boat sit the souls who are striving with the right impulses in Central Europe. These souls must really dive down and must know that they must seize the right point of balance. They must recognize what lies behind the threshold. They must take it into their consciousness. And these days that are now so difficult are, above all else, an awakening call to those who already have a sense of what is in store for the world in future. It does not only matter that in the course of the war one or the other side will win an outward victory, but how life will continue after the victory. If it were to happen that the Central European peoples were victorious, consider that together with this victory the purely materialistic, aramonic worldview would predominate and would fix this further through the Luciferic element and hence on the one hand the East and on the other hand also the West would infiltrate into Central European spirituality. An outward victory would not bring healing or salvation to Central Europe. And without people being aware of it, the Aramanic and Luciferic element has, for centuries, been making very powerful interventions. Just think how necessary it was to reject the Oriental Luciferic element in our Central European Theosophical movement, for that which we received as Theosophy from the East was pervaded by Lucifer and led in its extreme form to the recognition of an outward human idol, a physically reincarnated Christ. This was the battle that we had to wage against the unjustified interpretation of the theosophical world conception. But we must be clear about the need for us in Central Europe to recognize in the right way how we must involve ourselves in what is in store for humanity in the future. Through what spiritual science can be for us, we will learn to see that materialism, the materialistic world conception should not extend over the realm that is prepared for Central Europe. Those who have an intimation that a spiritual world conception streaming over Central Europe and from there radiating out over the entire earth is being prepared will have to do their best to prevent this. And it would be conceivable, outwardly conceivable as a hypothesis, that after a victory this Central Europe would serve a materialistic culture. Then Araman would rake in the fruits of this victory 
and this must be prevented. Just think of a tragic figure such as Ernst Haeckel. Goethe has written a theory of evolution. Since 1884, I have been laboring to make it understandable to people that it is a theory of evolution that is thoroughly worthy of attention, but they cannot understand the profound manner in which Goethe has expressed it. When it is brought in a trivial way by Darwin, people understand it. The teachings have then been able to flow into their hearts and souls. Thus the teaching had acquired a materialistic hue. And then take such a tragic figure as Ernst Haeckel. Every thought, every fiber of his scientific life he has brought over from England. Huxley, Locke and Darwin have been his teachers. And today Ernst Haeckel is one of those who have most turned against England. He is one of the most angry combatants. In so far as he can be so as an old man, he has stood in the forefront of those who are sending back all orders, diplomas and decorations to England, although the distinctively English import of Darwinism is not being returned. Much else can also be said. Souls are most receptive to materialism if, as regards their outer lives, they are, I would say, half asleep, if their souls are of a childlike quality. It passes by unnoticed that ideas are introduced to souls that prepare them later to accept materialistic interpretations as a matter of course. Araman has achieved this by causing a very influential figure to arise among the British people through whom the urge toward materialism is imperceptibly inculcated in the souls of children without this being suspected by anyone. This is the brilliant author of Robinson Crusoe. If one impresses the ideas with which Robinson Crusoe is filled upon the souls of children, they acquire the inclination for materialism. In the book, religion arises out of itself in the way that cabbages grow. Nothing is there which reflects something that should flow from the spiritual world. And just see how Robinson Crusoe spreads through the world. There was a time in the literary development of Central Europe when there were imitations of Robinson Crusoe in all languages, and there were many translations of the book itself. It is barely possible to count the number of Robinson Crusoes appearing in every nation. It lies at so deep a level. But the spiritual path must again be indicated by the greatness and meaningfulness of Central European culture, which truly has a spiritual orientation. The brothers Grimm were indeed under higher guidance and collected the German fairy tales. And if we bring the German fairy tales to our young people, instead of the Aramonic Robinson Crusoe, we shall be bringing them the inclination toward spiritualism. It gives one a deeply melancholic feeling when one, and this is related as a symptom, experiences the following. A very notable Austrian philosopher, Professor Dr. Ernst Mach, has written a book which was very far-reaching for many who wish to think philosophically. Analyse der Empfindungen, Analysis of Feelings. On the third page we find the following. He is speaking of self-knowledge. We know that self-knowledge is so extraordinarily important. I have often explained this. Ernst Mach now gives a proof for why self-knowledge is highly problematical even for the outer world. He relates the following experience. I was passing by a shop window when I saw my own image, my own form coming toward me. I thought, what an unpleasant, repugnant person is approaching me. It was I myself. This is how he spoke. This was also someone whom he had known so little that he said to his reflection, What an unpleasant, repugnant person this is. And in order to make this thoroughly clear, he adds that when he was already a professor, he was returning at night from a journey and was boarding an omnibus. As he boarded it, he saw in the mirror a man also getting on board, and he again said to himself, What is this down-at-heel schoolmaster doing here? And he adds, Thus my class demeanor was more familiar to me than my own particular appearance and bearing. 
Now, if it is so difficult for someone who does not often look in the mirror, it says something for Ernst Mach that this happened to him, to recognize his outer form, one will get some idea of how difficult it is to acquire self-knowledge in one's soul. And I have to say that I find it almost tragic when I read later on in the same book what Ernst Mach says about the education of his son and remarks with utter seriousness, Praise God, he doesn't say this but something like it, that my children never read any fairy tales. They have therefore not been led through having fantastical ideas into a spiritual world by reading fairy tales. We see from this how what seeks to lead Central European culture to Araman is implanted in souls of the present. And so one must say that what matters is not to win a victory, but that on the foundation of the victory what is right may prevail. In Central Europe we also have a powerful influence to deal with, even in the case of a victory. For we have a connection with something that is strongly pervaded by Lucifer. It was once Europe's blessing that the Arab culture of the Moors was disseminated throughout southern Europe. What has today become Aramonic was fully justified at that time. Readers aside, the word Aramonic is there with a S-I-C after it. It's possible that's supposed to be Luciferic. Just readers aside, end of readers aside. We are burdened by the weight of the bond with the Ottoman Empire. We must find the proper standpoint and not, as it were, believe that we can let our feelings be determined by outward political points of view. That which lives in the outer world is truly not capable of keeping the Aramonic element at bay. Journalistic literature plies its course toward the Aramonic principle and floods what seeks to see beyond the powers interacting in our world with mockery and scorn. It is for this reason that what in our time appears under the sign of blood and sorrow should be seen as the great awakening call to make souls receptive to what wants to flow to the present from the life of spirit. And our souls must develop the inclination for what has been prepared in Central European culture, especially in the way that it really brings to expression how we are placed between two forces that pervade the world in a pendulum-like fashion and how we must find the balance. It must be clear to us that, on the one hand, the world strives toward an aramonic hardening, becoming ossified in the fire of the purely material, that, on the other hand, it strives egotistically to rise to an abstract conception of the spirit. To follow either the one or the other would be the undoing of people in Central Europe. Merely to follow the science bound to the outer senses would bring us to the point of tearing the roses from the cross and contemplating only what has become lifeless. We would gradually acquire a world conception which would completely stop people having any perception of the spiritual world, which would enable them to behold only what is aramonically ossified. Try to envisage the ideals of aramonic science. It is a world of whirling atoms, a purely material world structure. Everything of a spiritual nature is to be rejected from this picture of the world. The conception that people have, and it is taught already to children at school, is that there was once a swirling movement of gaseous cosmic masses out of which the sun was formed and the planets in their turn were expelled. This is made clear to children at school by putting a drop of oil in water, placing a small round piece of paper at the position of the equator, piercing it in the middle with a pin and turning the pin. Through this, little drops split off and a little planetary system arises. Of course, this proves what is being shown, but the most important thing is forgotten, that the teacher has to turn it. Thus, if one is honest, one in truth has to imagine a great master teacher who turns the whole system in space. But the thoughts, feelings, and sensations that aspire toward Araman are those very ones that conceive of the rising of the sun and the planets in the manner just described. And in this lay what led to the prevailing historical conception, 
Hermann Grimm once said, A piece of carrion, around which a hungry dog is circling, is a more appetizing sight than this world conception, which is based solely on this Copernican world conception. This is one danger, to tear the roses from the cross and to have only the black charred cross. The other danger is to tear the cross from the roses and to want to aspire only to the Spirit, to despise that which the Godhead itself has placed within world evolution, not to want lovingly to embrace the thought that what is here in the sense world is an expression of the divinity. This is the one-sidedly religious view of the world which despises science, which wants only the roses and unconsciously aspires toward the Luciferic element of the East. Just as the science that wants to tear the roses from the cross and wants merely to retain the charred cross aspires toward the West. But we in Central Europe are called upon to have the roses on the cross, to have what is expressed only through the connection of the roses with the cross. And as we look upon the bare, inflexible cross, we feel that what has come into the world as rigid matter has come into the world through the gods. It is as if the spiritual world has created for itself a circle within the material world, ex Deo Nasimor. We feel, too, that if we understand it rightly, we should not merely enter with Lucifer into the spiritual world, but that we die. In that we are connected with what has come down into the world from the divine higher self, in Christo Morimor. And in combining the cross with the roses, the material world conception with the spiritual world conception, we feel how the soul of man can awaken in the spirit, per spiritum sanctum levivissimus. Thus the cross engirdled by roses was the symbol of someone who entered deeply into the spirituality of Central European culture, Goethe. It must therefore be our symbol. And so as we gather in this space, we want insofar as we can be present in the future to be mindful of what our ideal must be out of the great tasks of earthly evolution, to entwine roses around the cross neither to tear the roses from the cross and only keep hold of the cross, nor to value the roses alone and through only the roses to rush abstractly into blossoming, sprouting spiritual life. This is what is expressed in our symbol, in the rose cross, which we want to take ever more and more into our hearts and our feelings when we gather in a space devoted to our strivings. We can then be sure that the spirits who guide earthly evolution in a good sense will be working invisibly amongst us, that our words, that all that which we think and feel as we devote ourselves to spiritual scientific endeavors, that all this will find the support of the spiritual powers and forces guiding our efforts in such a space. And as we engage in our spiritual scientific contemplations, we can feel ourselves constantly inspired by the spirits who invisibly hold sway in such a space. It is these spiritual powers whom I wish to call upon, that they may always be with those striving souls who give expression in an honest, loving way, in this space, to their aspirations with full sincerity. If this can happen we may be sure that this spiritual scientific world conception will be a means of finding the path which the gods have always made accessible to human beings. We gather today in such spaces. They are isolated from the intentions of what is happening in the world. The powers lying behind these intentions view what goes on in our spaces as sectarian, as superstitious. We are, in a certain sense, therefore, gathered underground with respect to present-day culture. Above, on the earth, is this present-day culture, which in the east is deeply pervaded by Lucifer and in the west by Araman. Then, in order to strengthen our hearts, to enliven our souls, we again and again recall that at a different stage, the Western world conception has ascended from what was underground to what came to be above it. There was the world conception of the Roman Empire, 
the world conception that had been the recipient of the noble philosophy and artistic world conception of the Greeks. Brilliant minds featured among those who lived in ancient Rome and its surroundings with this old world conception. And those who cultivated a wholly new teaching underground in the catacombs were deeply despised. But those who were cultivating the new teaching in the catacombs isolated from what was at that time regarded as the right world conception above ground knew that they had to hold fast to what has come into the world through the Christ impulse. They cultivated their endeavors in the catacombs and knew up above there were living those who had designs upon their lives, who persecuted them, who did not understand them. Once we have brought before our minds these conditions of the Roman Empire, let us consider human evolution as it has developed a few centuries later. What had been above has disappeared. What was living down in the catacombs has risen up. It lives victoriously throughout the Western world. It lived already in the souls of those who, outcast, scorned and despised down in the catacombs, aspired to what was to conquer the world. So must we, my dear friends, feel, as it were, spiritually outcast, derided, and persecuted by those who in our time cultivate the so-called right world conception. But just as how it turned out in the first stage of Western Christian evolution, so will it develop further. That which people would most like to destroy not as it was done formerly by being encased in pitch and burnt, but by being scorned and despised, will come to gain acceptance. That which scorns and despises and seeks to gain mastery of the ground of the earth solely with an Aramonic and Luciferic world conception will be done away with, just as the old Roman culture, the old world conception, was eliminated in the form that it took at the time. But what is cultivated in our catacombs, they are spiritual catacombs, for the world has, after all, made some progress. What is being thought, contemplated, and felt in these catacombs of ours, and is pervading our hearts and souls, will rise up and make its triumphant progress manifest in a future culture. We may be mindful of this in every moment when we cross the threshold of such a space, As we dwell there, we may be mindful that we are still as though in a boat under the sea, which will nevertheless take an upward course, and will surely do so if we strongly and powerfully immerse ourselves in the connections that our souls have formed. It is with this pledge that we wish strongly to imbue ourselves with a spiritual Christ impulse that seeks to take a further step in its development. It is with this conviction, this pledge, that we want to enter this space. We want to enter it in the sense of these feelings that everything must be regarded as consecrated to the spiritual powers, to the spiritual individualities, who, as we can know, weave powerfully through our movement, who protectively extend their hands of blessing over us. This is what we wish to be mindful of when we gather here in future. The end of Lecture 10 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death. Fifteen Lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is Lecture 11, given in Linz, on the 18th of May, 1915, entitled Christ in Relation to Lucifer and Armon, the Threefold Nature of This Form. When our building in Dornach that is dedicated to spiritual science is completed, it will, in a significant place, contain a sculptural group which will depict in particular three figures. At the center of this group there will be a figure who may be seen as the representative of the highest human essence 
that could develop on the earth. One will therefore also be able to experience this figure of the highest human essence in earthly evolution as the Christ who dwelt within earthly evolution for three years in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. It will be a special task to portray this Christ figure in such a way that one will, on the one hand, be able to see how the being in question is living in an earthly human body, but, nevertheless, how in every expression, in everything relating to it, this earthly body is spiritually pervaded by that which entered from cosmic spiritual heights into this earthly body as the Christ in the thirtieth year of its life. Then there will be two other figures, the one to the left and the other to the right of the Christ figure, if I may call this figure that I have indicated with a few words the Christ figure. This Christ figure appears to be standing in front of a rock, which rises up especially in the vicinity of Christ's left side, so that its top extends over his head. Up on the rock there is another figure, a winged figure, but its wings are broken. And because its wings are broken, this figure is falling into the abyss. What will have to be artistically fashioned with particular acuity is the way in which this Christ figure raises his left arm. For through this raising of the left arm of the Christ figure, this falling being breaks its wings. But it should not seem as though Christ had broken the wings of this being. For the whole must be artistically fashioned in such a way that in Christ's raising of his arm it is apparent already in the whole movement of his hand that he has nothing but infinite compassion for this being. But this being cannot bear what is flowing upward through the arm and the hand and which additionally becomes visible through the indentations that the fingers of the outstretched hand seem to leave in the rock itself. What this being feels as it comes into the proximity of the being who represents the Christ may be expressed in words such as these, I cannot bear it that something of such purity is flowing up toward me. This is what is living in this being and in so fundamental a way that its wings are broken and as a result it plunges into the abyss. Herein lies a particularly significant artistic task. You can see what could be lacking if Christ were to be sculpturally portrayed, so that simply by raising his hand a power would stream forth from him that breaks this being's wings and causes it to fall. It should not be portrayed like this, but so that the being should itself bring about its fall. For the being that is depicted plunging down with broken wings is Lucifer. And on the other side, on the right of the Christ figure, where a ledge juts out from the rock, there is a concave cavity. In this cavity there is also a form that has wings, and this winged form is with its arm-like organs directing its attention toward the ledge above. You should therefore visualize the cavity in the rock on the right, and in this cavity a winged being, whose wings are, however, formed quite differently from those of the figure up on the rock. This latter figure has more eagle-like wings, whereas the figure in the cavity has bat-like wings. The figure in the cave has the appearance of being encased within it. One sees it working down there in its fettered state, hollowing out the earthly realm. The figure standing in the middle, the Christ figure, reaches down with his right hand. Thus, whereas his left hand extends upward, his right hand is directed downward. Again, it will be a significant artistic task to portray this, not as though Christ wanted to keep this figure, which is Araman, in bondage, but he has infinite compassion for Araman. But Araman cannot endure this. He writhes with pain, through what radiates from the hand of Christ. And this radiating quality causes the golden veins down below in the cavity to wind around Araman's body like cords and bind him. 
The same that occurs with Lucifer also happens with Araman. We shall then try to depict this same motif, which is conceived as a work of sculpture, which will stand at a significant place in the building, in the form of a painting which will express it in a completely different way. And so there will be this group of three figures, Christ, Lucifer and Araman, in the form of a sculpture, and above it a painting representing the same motif. We are portraying this relationship between Christ, Lucifer and Araman in our building in Dornach, because spiritual science really does show us in a certain sense that the next task with regard to an understanding of the Christ impulse consists in that man comes to know the nature of the relationship in the world between these three powers of Christ, Lucifer, and Araman. For much has hitherto been said about Christianity and the Christ impulse, but what came into the world through the Christ impulse as a result of the mystery of Golgotha is something that has not become completely clear to people. They speak of the existence of Lucifer and also Araman, but in speaking of them, they often speak as though one must flee from them, as though it would be appropriate to say, I want to have nothing to do with Lucifer and Araman. If the divine spiritual powers, which can be sought in the way I described in yesterday's public lecture, also did not want to have anything to do with Lucifer and Araman, the world would not be able to exist. One stands in the right relationship to them not by saying, Lucifer, I shall flee from him, Araman, I shall flee from him, but by regarding what man has to strive toward as a result of the Christ impulse as the state of equilibrium of a pendulum. The pendulum is in the middle in a state of balance, but it must oscillate to the one side and to the other. It is the same with man's earthly evolution. Man has to oscillate to the one side in accordance with the Luciferic principle and to the other in accordance with the Aramonic principle. But he must maintain his equilibrium by developing what Paul has expressed in the words, Not I, but Christ in me. We must conceive of Christ in his essential activity as being a reality, as a living force. This means that we must be clear that what flowed into our earthly evolution through the mystery of Golgotha was indeed an actual happening. It does not so much matter how well or how inadequately people have understood this until now, but rather that it has been a present reality in the earthly evolution of humanity. Much could be said about what human beings have not hitherto understood about the Christ impulse, and spiritual science will need to make its contribution to the understanding of what flowed from spiritual heights into earthly evolution in the form of the Christ impulse through the mystery of Golgotha. In order to evoke an awareness of how Christ has been actively involved, I shall, and I have also spoken of this elsewhere, draw attention to two moments in the earthly evolution of humanity which are important for the whole development of the Western world. You will know from history what an important moment it was when Constantine, the son of Constantius Chlorus, overcame Maxentius, and Christianity was, through him, introduced into the further evolution of the West. That this could happen, Constantine had to win that important battle against Maxentius, which then led to him making Christianity the state religion of the Western Empire. The whole map of Europe would have become different if this battle of Constantine against Maxentius had not happened. But military strategy, that which the people of that time could achieve with their powers of reason, was not the decisive element in this battle. Something quite different was at work. Maxentius had consulted the so-called Sibylline books, the prophetic oracles of Rome, which caused him to lead his army, which had been well protected within the walls of Rome, into the open field to confront that of Constantine. Constantine, however, had had a dream before the battle, in which it was indicated to him that if he marched toward Maxentius, in the sign of the mystery of Golgotha, he would achieve something great. 
And so Constantine, whose army was a quarter of the size of his adversaries, advanced into battle with the sign of the mystery of Golgotha, the cross at its head. And inspired by the power emanating from the mystery of Golgotha, Constantine won that significant battle through which Christianity was outwardly introduced to Europe. If we call to mind what people at that time understood intellectually of the Christ impulse, we find an endless string of theological quarrels. They argued over whether Christ is eternally equal with the Father and over other similar matters. It has to be said that it does not so much matter what people knew at that time of the Christ impulse, but rather that it was a present reality then, that through Constantine, through a dream that Constantine had, it guided what was to happen. It is the reality of Christ, the real power of Christ, that is important. We only begin to understand what the Christ impulse is from within spiritual science. Another moment was the one when Europe again took a formative step in its development in the struggle between France and England. Of this one can say that if France had not been victorious against England, all the circumstances would have become different. But how did this happen? Until our time, when it must become more and more conscious, the Christ impulse has been working in the subconscious regions of the soul. And in the spiritual evolution of the West, we see how the Christ impulse seeks out those states in the souls of human beings through which it can exert an influence through particular individuals. Legends have preserved for us the way that the Christ impulse can assert itself within the spiritual evolution of the West. In some cases, these legends point back to those ancient pagan times when an understanding of Christianity was beginning to germinate. If the soul does not consciously strive for initiation on the path indicated in title, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved?, but as it were on a natural path, and has been imbued with the Christ impulse through a natural initiation, the most favorable time in which this Christ impulse can inspire the soul is the time from Christmas Eve until Three Kings Day, the time from 25 December until 6 January. We can understand this if we clearly understand that for occult knowledge it is totally apparent that our earth is not only what geologists speak about, What geologists speak about is equivalent to man's skeletal structure. But our earth also has the spiritual aspect that belongs to it, and it is into the earth's aura that the Christ has entered. This earth sleeps and is awake, just as we sleep and are awake in the course of twenty-four hours. We must also be aware that the earth's state of sleep is during the summer, while its state of wakefulness occurs during the winter. Moreover, the spirit of the earth is most awake during these twelve or thirteen nights from Christmas until Three Kings Day. In olden times, when, as you know from many indications in my lecture cycles, people elevated themselves to the spiritual principle of the world more in a kind of dreamlike clairvoyance, the most favorable time for this was the summer. It is perfectly natural that anyone wanting to raise themselves to the spirit in a more dreamlike clairvoyance, found it easier during the earth's sleep during the summer. Hence the St. John's Festival was in these ancient times the most favorable period for raising the power of the soul to the spirit. But in the place of the old way in which the spirit realm influenced the earth, a new, more conscious way has emerged. And now the best time for this is when the earth is awake. Thus the legends tell us that particularly gifted human individuals, people who are especially suited by virtue of their karma, enter around Christmas time into a particular state of consciousness, which is only similar to sleep, but which is inwardly such that it can be inspired by the forces that elevate human beings to the realm that we call the spirit land. There is a very beautiful legend, a Norwegian legend of Olaf Astason, where we are told that he goes to church on Christmas Eve, falls into a sleep-like condition, and then awakes on 6 January. 
and is able to relate what he has experienced in this sleep-like state. And this Norwegian legend, indeed, tells us how Olaf Astason experiences something that one first perceives to be the soul world, and then something that one feels to be the spirit land, but everything is expressed pictorially in the form of imaginations. This time was the most favorable in that era, when human beings were not yet so advanced as in our time. The time is now past when the Christ impulse is able to stream into human souls through a natural initiation. People today have to be just as conscious of their path of ascent toward initiation as is described in titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. We live at a time when natural initiations are becoming ever rarer and will eventually disappear altogether, so that we should no longer be counting upon them. But an initiation which can essentially be called a natural initiation was that through which the Christ impulse influenced the inner being of the simple country girl known as the Maid of Orleans, through whom the victory of the French over the English, which in so fundamental a way transformed the map of Europe, was brought about. Again, it was not what could be achieved by human reason, but what guided the maid of Orleans at that time over and above all the strategies of the army generals, and through which Europe acquired a new form, namely the Christ impulse, which worked right into the subconscious of a single individual, but in such a way that from this individual there radiated forth what exerts an influence upon the whole of history. Now, we would need to consider whether there could have been something similar to a natural initiation in the case of the Maid of Orleans, whether the soul of the Maid of Orleans had been inspired during the nights between 25 December and 6 January. In biographical terms, it seems difficult to prove something, such as the Maid of Orleans having been in a sleep-like state in the 12 or 13 days from 25 December until 6 January, in which especially the Christ impulse might have been able to exert its influence upon her, so that as a human being she could have been the vessel of purely the Christ impulse on the battlefields of France. Nevertheless, this is what happened. There is a time that if the karma of the individuality concerned renders this particularly possible, can indeed be suitable for such a sleep-like state to come about. This is the time of the last days in which a human individual is still in the mother's body before he perceives the physical earthly light. He is then living in a dreamlike, sleep-like state. He has not yet perceived with his senses what is taking place outwardly in the world. If by virtue of his karma a person were especially suited to receive the Christ impulse in these last days when he is dwelling in his mother's body, these days would also be days of natural initiation. Such a person would then already be strengthened and fortified by the Christ impulse residing within him by the time that his eyes open for the first time after the initiation, that is, in this case, after birth, and such a person would have to be born on 6 January. The Maid of Orleans was born on 6 January. This is the mystery of the Maid of Orleans, that she was born on 6 January, that she spent the time from Christmas until Three Kings Day in that particular sleep-like state in the body of her mother and received her natural initiation. Now consider the deep connections that stand behind the external developments that we normally refer to as history. What is expounded from documents in history is by and large the least important aspect The simple date indicated in our calendar that the Maid of Orleans was sent into the world on 6 January is of immense historical significance. This is how the forces from the supersensible world work right into the sense-perceptible world, and we must read this occult script through which this influence of the supersensible world upon the world of the senses is made manifest. Thus what was at work in the Maid of Orleans was an in-streaming of the Christ impulse, by way of a natural initiation already before her physical birth. I want to explain these things in order to evoke within your souls a feeling for the fact that 
behind the scenes of what one ordinarily calls history, powers and associations of which outward perception has no knowledge are involved. Since the mystery of Golgotha, however, the Christ impulse has, in particular, been guiding the history of European humanity. Whereas in the Orient, in Asia, a worldview has been retained of which it can be said that in its feelings and sensibilities it has not yet arrived at the Christ impulse. To be sure, Europeans have allowed themselves to be tempted to regard Indian wisdom as something especially profound. But it is characteristic of this Indian wisdom and the whole religious sensibility of Asia that all its attention is devoted to the time preceding the Christ impulse, while, in addition, it has preserved the state that was present in the religious sensibility of earthly humanity before the Christ impulse. To remain behind in evolution always signifies embracing something of a Luciferic nature, and therefore Asian religious development is the bearer of a Luciferic element. As we consider the religious development of Asia, we cannot but be aware of seeing much in it that mankind once previously had, but which it has had to abandon. But in Western culture we must cleanse all this from the Luciferic element and in part raise it up in such a way that the Christ impulse can flow into it. If we move from Asia to Europe, we find disseminated throughout Eastern Europe in Russian culture an orthodox Christianity that has remained at an earlier stage of Christian evolution, that did not want to advance further and wanted to retain something of a Luciferic quality. In short, as we look toward the East, we have what I might say the wise spirits guiding the world and the whole evolution of mankind left behind as the Luciferic element. As we look toward the West, we have a different distinctive quality, The characteristic of this American culture is that everything is sought in externalities. Great and significant achievements result from this. But the answer to everything is sought in the outer world. Let us take an example. When we in Europe, and especially Central Europe, see that someone who had not hitherto had the opportunity to focus his heart and mind upon Christ and the spiritual cosmic forces has suddenly made a complete change in his life, we have an interest in what happened within him to bring this about. We are not so much interested in that he experienced a leap in his development, for one finds this everywhere. Indeed, there is something wholly inappropriate about the claim formulated by modern science that nature does not make leaps. From the green leaf of a plant to a red petal is a mighty leap, from the flower to the calyx is likewise a mighty leap. It is a totally false claim, and the truth of evolution rests on the fact that leaps are a regular occurrence. Thus, if someone who has for a while been taken up with external matters is suddenly able to have an inclination toward the spirit, this is not what we find especially interesting, but the inner power and industry that cause what one might call a conversion to a spiritual awareness do indeed interest us. We shall want to look into the deepest feelings of such a person. We want to know what brought him to such a radical change. It is the inner soul aspect that we find interesting. What does an American make of this? He does something quite peculiar. In America, one would have plenty of opportunity to observe such conversions taking place. An American would ask those who have undergone such a conversion to write letters. He would then gather all these letters together into a bundle and say, I have received letters from a number of people. Approximately 200 people have written letters. 14% of all these souls who experienced such a conversion wrote that it was caused by a fear of death or hell that suddenly came over them. 5% claimed altruistic motives. 17% ascribed it to an aspiration for moral ideals, 15% to pangs of conscience, 10% to following teachings that they have been given, 13% to imitating others whom they had seen being converted, 19% because it was thought that they should be given a good hiding, 
and so on. In this way one selects the most extreme cases, sorts, and tallies them, and arrives at a result that is based on scientific fact. This is then compiled in books that are published on the theme of soul science. All other ways of arriving at conclusions are unsound, according to these people, and are based on subjective notions, so they say. There you have an example of the externalization of what is most intimate, and it is the same with many other aspects of life in America. At a time that calls for a particular degree of spiritual deepening, spiritism of the most external kind is rampant in America. People want to make everything tangible and matter-of-fact there. This is a materialistic conception of spiritual and cultural life. We could point toward many other things through which you would see that the culture of the West is gripped by Aramonic influences. When the pendulum swings to the other side and we look to the East, we have the Luciferic element. If we look toward the West, we have the Aramonic element. And the infinitely significant task that we in Central Europe have between East and West is to find the balance. Thus, it is our wish to represent in the form of the sculptural group the greatest of the spiritual demands of our age, finding the balance between the relationship to Lucifer and the relationship to Araman. One will recognize what the Christ impulse wanted of earthly evolution only if one portrays Christ not simply as an entity, but if one knows that Christ is that power that exemplifies for us the balance in the relationship of Lucifer and Araman. That there is as yet no clarity with respect to the relationship of man and of Christ to Lucifer and Araman may be illustrated by means of the following example. Even the greatest things, or things containing a measure of greatness, are not free from the one-sidedness associated with a particular time. It is impossible to overestimate the significance of that picture that Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel in Rome, titled The Last Judgment, a truly wonderful picture, depicting Christ in triumph, directing the good to the one side and the evil to the other. Let us focus our attention upon this Christ. He does not have the kind of features that we want to emphasize in the Christ who is to be represented in our building in Dornach. Here it must become visible that Christ raises his hand in compassion to Lucifer above him. Lucifer should not be depicted as falling because of the power of Christ. He falls of his own accord, because he cannot bear what streams forth from Christ as he approaches him. And Christ looks up as he gestures with his brow toward Lucifer. Moreover, Araman is not overcome by Christ's hatred. He feels that he cannot endure what streams forth from Christ. Christ stands in the middle as the one who brings the Parsifal element into the modern age who through his very being, and not through his power, induces the others to overcome themselves, so that the others overcome themselves rather than being overcome by him. With Michelangelo we still see that Christ, through his power, sends the one to heaven and the other to hell. This will in future not be the real Christ, but a Christ who is very luciferic. Such an observation does not, of course, detract from the greatness of the painting. This can be recognized, but one has to admit that Michelangelo was not yet able to paint Christ, because world evolution had not advanced sufficiently far. It must be clearly understood that one should not direct one's attention only to the Christ, but rather to the threefold form of Christ, Lucifer, and Araman. I can only hint at this, Spiritual science will eventually bring to light the full content of this mystery of Christ in relation to Lucifer and Araman. But now consider the following. If we look toward the east, we see Luciferic powers in our near proximity, and in the west we see Aramanic powers. In our spiritual scientific studies, it must be our way to look at things not with sympathy and antipathy, and also to consider nations and folk souls, 
not with sympathy and antipathy, but as they actually are. What one refers to as the national heritage of a person who identifies himself with the character of his people is mainly dependent upon what lives within the physical and etheric body. When we are dwelling as a being of soul and spirit in the form of our astral body and ego, between going to sleep and waking up, we live outside our familiar national identity. Only between waking up and going to sleep, when we are immersed in the physical body, do we partake in our nationality. Thus nationality is also something that a person gradually overcomes during his stay in Kamaloka. And as he overcomes his national identity in Kamaloka, he aspires to the universally human, in order then to live for the greater part of the time between death and a new birth in the realm of the universally human. Thus among the qualities that are laid aside in Kamaloka is that which specializes us in terms of our nationality. In this respect, the various nationalities are very different from one another. Let us, for example, compare someone from France with someone from Russia. The Frenchman has the distinctive quality that he quite particularly adheres to and dwells within what the folk soul imparts to his physical and etheric body during his life between birth and death. This comes to expression in that the Frenchman, not as an individual, but as a Frenchman, has a definite picture of what it is to be French, that it is of primal importance to think of himself as French. But these thoughts that Frenchmen and speakers of Romance languages in general form of their nationality lead to the idea that they have about their nationality being firmly imprinted upon the etheric body. When a Frenchman has passed through the gate of death, he discards his etheric body after a few days, and it then becomes a firmly closed entity that remains for a long time in the etheric world. This etheric body is, for a long time, unable to dissolve, because it is firmly impregnated with the conception that he has of his nationality, and these ideas keep the etheric body intact. Thus, if we look toward the west, we see the field of death filled with firmly defined etheric bodies. If we look more closely at the east, at the Russians, the distinctive quality of Russians is that when souls pass through the gate of death, bearing such an etheric body, it dissolves relatively very quickly. This is the difference between the west and the east. The etheric bodies of western Europeans that are separated out after death have the quality of wanting to maintain their rigidity. What the Frenchman calls gloire imprints itself firmly upon his etheric body as a national gloire, so that he is condemned to direct his attention to this etheric body, to look at himself for a long time after his death. Readers of Saddam attempting this uh, French word, spelled G L. O-I-R-E with a grave over the E. Gloire. My pr- apologies for that if it's wrong. And of readers aside. A Russian, on the other hand, looks at himself very little after his death. Through all of this, a person from Western Europe is exposed to the Aramonic influence. This materialization process of the etheric body is under the sway of the Aramonic principle. The diffusion and rapid ascent of the etheric body is accompanied by a feeling of pleasure in the nationality concerned. How does this come to expression in the East? Central Europe does not understand this, just as it does not have an inner feeling for it. If one studies Dostoevsky and even Tolstoy or other leading writers, who are always speaking about the Russian man, This comes over as a feeling of pleasure in the national character, which cannot in itself be defined. We even find with Soloviev how something oppressive lives in his philosophy which Central Europeans cannot reconcile with everything that is active in Europe as a spiritual power. In Central Europe there is an intermediate state, something that could be explained further than was possible in yesterday's public lecture. 
I said that something exists in Central Europe that is of an inner aspirational nature. Goethe would have written his Faust no differently in the 1840s. Strive ever onward, he would have said. But this striving is deeply inward in nature. It was in Central Europe where the mystics appeared who wanted not only to recognize the divine spiritual world, but to experience it in their own souls. They wanted to experience the Christ event inwardly. Now, if one takes Soloviev, one finds that before all else he proceeds from the thought that Christ historically died once for mankind. This is perfectly correct, but there lives in Soloviev a soul that sees spiritual life rather as a cloud outside himself, a soul that sees that everything has, so to speak, already happened, whereas the Central European demands that each one experiences the Christ event anew within himself. Meister Eckhart would have said something on the following lines to someone like Soloviev, where Soloviev emphasizes repeatedly that Christ had to undergo death in order that man can find his true potential. Meister Eckhart would say, you are viewing Christ as one looks upon something external. What matters is not that we always focus our attention upon historical events, But we must experience Christ within ourselves. We must discover something inwardly that passes through states similar to Christ, at least spiritually, so that the Christ event is experienced anew on a spiritual plane. Now, it may surely seem contrived and fantastic if people today are told that evolution as a whole, and specifically the folk spirit living in the language of Central Europe, has brought it about that this connection of the ego with the Christ impulse, parentheses, capital I dash CH equals Jesus Christus or Jesus Christ, close parenthesis, is imprinted within the German language. Ich is conjoined so that it becomes Ich or I. And as one speaks the word in Central Europe, one is pronouncing the name of Christ. This is how closely one feels the ego or I to be inwardly connected with Christ. This intimate association with the spiritual world in the way that it must be striven for in all areas of cultural and intellectual life in Central Europe is not known either in the West or in the East. Therefore, something needs to happen in the 20th century in order that the Christ principle can correspondingly gradually spread throughout the whole continent of Europe. I have frequently stated in various lecture cycles that that spiritual being, whom we call Michael, became, so to speak, the leading spirit. This leading spirit is now preparing the event, which in the first of my mystery plays is referred to as the appearance of the etheric Christ on earth, an event that must occur in the twentieth century. It will then happen that at first a few individual souls and then an ever-increasing number will know that Christ is really here, that he is an earthly presence, but in an etheric and not in an earthly form. This must be prepared. If in the course of the twentieth century certain souls were to open their spiritual eyes clairvoyantly, and this will happen, to what is living in the etheric world, they would be disturbed by those etheric bodies that emanate from Western Europe. Their spirit vision would rest first on them, and they would have a distorted perception of the figure of Christ. Michael, therefore, has to fight a battle in Europe. He must contribute something toward the diffusion of these inflexible etheric bodies from Western Europe in the etheric world. To this end, he must take those etheric bodies that readily diffuse, those from the East, and battle with them against the West. The result of this is that since 1879, there has been a mighty battle in the astral world between Russian and West European etheric bodies, and this battle rages through the whole astral world. A mighty battle is indeed going on in the astral world, led by Mykaya, between Russia and France. This is what in the astral world lies at the foundation of the battle now raging in Europe. 
And just as we are often so staggered to find that something taking place here in the physical world has its counterpart in the spiritual world, so is it the case here. The alliance between France and Russia, which was concluded at the instigation of Araman, and resides in the first instance within the Aramanic realm, as is betokened by the 20 billion francs that France gave to Russia, is the physical expression of a battle that now rages between French and Russian souls, a battle that directly involves Central Europe as it strives in its innermost soul toward an encounter with the Christ. And Europe has fallen victim to the karma that precisely in Central Europe there has tragically to be an experience of what the East and the West and the West with the East, must resolve between one another. The matters that the German element has outwardly to sort out with the French element can be understood only through the fact that the German element lies in the middle between the East and the West and serves as an anvil for both sides. For what is colliding from both sides in Germany is in truth the affair of these two sides. This is the spiritual truth, which is totally different from what is going on outwardly in the physical world. Just think how different the spiritual truth is from what is taking place outwardly in the physical world. This must surely sound grotesque to people today, but it is the truth, even if we find it shocking. But there is something else that is of extraordinary interest. It surely contradicts everything that we can learn from history, that England, having been united with Turkey against Russia, now suddenly must fight with Russia against Turkey. One can understand this contradiction only if one makes the following occult observation. Whereas, here on the physical plane, England, allied with Russia, is fighting against Turkey, what presents itself to occult observation is the following. If one studies this battle from an occult standpoint and views it first on the physical plane and then on the astral plane, it emerges that from a northern perspective, Russia appears to be allied with England, while from a southeastern perspective, there appears to be an alliance of Turkey with England. This is due to the fact that the bond between England and Russia only has a significance on the physical plane, but is not reflected in the spiritual world since it rests wholly on material interests. From below one sees that England and Russia are allied in the north only on the physical plane. In the southeast, looking through the physical plane, one perceives on the astral plane that the English are, in a soul sense, allied with the Turks against Russia. Thus on the physical plane England is fighting on the same side as Russia, while, on the other hand, Russia is being fought by England. This is how we must view the events taking place outwardly, insofar as they manifest themselves as outward history, for what lies behind it is something entirely different. A time will come when people will speak quite differently about present events than happens now. It must be said that there is something thoroughly unpleasant about war literature in general and one aspect of it is particularly unpleasant. It is constantly said that one cannot speak at present about who is to blame for the war and so forth. People like to delude themselves about such things. They say that we shall learn from archived documents who was at fault. With respect to the outward events, however, it is not so difficult to resolve this if one judges dispassionately, and even if he is wrong about certain details, Chamberlain, in his title, War Essays, is right when he says that it is possible to know the key issues about this war. It is true that there is no doubt about that, but one needs to ask the right question. There is, for example, one question which, if it is rightly posed, can be considered quite unequivocally. It is the question, who could have prevented this war? The constantly recurring question, who bears the blame for this war, and many other questions, are not the right ones. Who could have prevented this war? The obvious answer would be that the Russian government could have prevented it. 
Only in this way will one be able to find the way to define the impulses that are at work in each situation. Of course, the war that the East has been wanting for decades would not have been able to come about if there had not been a certain relationship between England, Russia, and France, so that one can also, if one wants, ascribe the greater blame to England. But all these conjectures do not take into account the underlying causes that made the whole world war a necessity. It is naive to think that the war could have failed to materialize. People speak now as if this war did not need to happen when it was, of course, part of European karma. I wanted to indicate this by speaking about the contrasts between East and West. It does not so much matter that we raise questions about the outer causes, for these are not important. We simply need to realize that this war is an historical necessity. The specific causes are then unimportant. What is important, however, are all the various effects toward which we must develop the right attitude, and one effect can impress us in a highly significant way. One remarkable characteristic phenomenon is that through such a war many unspent etheric bodies are engendered, And since this is the greatest war that humanity has engaged in since historical records began, this has featured in a major way. Unspent etheric bodies accumulate. After all, a person's etheric body can nurture him for a long time until he is 70, 80 or 90 years old. But in time of war, human beings are sacrificed in the prime of their lives. When someone passes through the gate of death, The etheric body, as you know, is expelled after a short time. But in the case of those who have fallen in battle, the etheric bodies that are expelled would have been able to sustain these human lives in the physical body for several decades. In physics, it is recognized that no force is lost. It is similar in a spiritual context. These etheric bodies that pass prematurely into the etheric world continue to have their forces intact. Just think of the countless number of unspent etheric bodies that there are of those who are passing through the gate of death as young men. Moreover, there is something distinctive about these etheric bodies. I should like to illustrate this by means of an example closely connected with our movement and then go on to consider the etheric bodies of the fighters who have passed through death, which will become part of the etheric world in the near future. Last autumn we experienced in Dornach the death of the little son of a family belonging to the Anthroposophical Society and currently employed in the vicinity of the building, the death of seven-year-old Theodor Feiss. The father had previously lived in Stuttgart. He then came as a gardener to Dornach and lived near the building together with his family. He had himself been called up soon after the outbreak of the war and was, at the time of the incident that I want to speak about, in a military hospital. Little seven-year-old Theo was a really sunny child, a wonderful, lovely boy. Now one day the following occurred. We had just had a lecture in accordance with my practice of speaking in Dornach in relation to what was happening with the building. After the lecture, someone came to say that Little Theodor Feiss had not returned to his mother since the late afternoon. It was then ten o'clock in the evening, and it was impossible to avoid thinking that a great misfortune had occurred. On this same afternoon, a furniture van had arrived and had taken a direction near the so-called canteen, where there was a bend that it had to negotiate. The van had reached this spot where, it can be said in all confidence, No van of such a size, and perhaps no furniture van of any description, had ever come, and none has come since. Now before the van had reached this little bend, little Theo had been in the canteen. He had been delayed there, otherwise he would have returned home earlier with the food that he had fetched from the canteen for supper. He then set off home, and it is only a very short distance, at such a time that he was at the very spot where the van overturned and fell on him. No one had noticed the accident, not even the coachman. 
for his main concern had been for his horses when the van had overturned, and he did not know that the child was underneath it. When we were notified of the child's absence, we had to try to lift the van. Friends fetched tools, and the Swiss soldiers who had been alerted helped us with this. Of course, the child had already been dead since 5.30 in the afternoon. The furniture van had immediately crushed the boy, who had died of suffocation. This is a case that can be used as an example of what I have often tried to clarify through a comparison, namely that causes and effects are confused. I have often used the following familiar instance. Suppose that we see someone walking beside a river. This person then falls into the river. Those who see this happening hurry along and find a stone at the spot where he fell into the river and think that he must have stumbled, fallen into the river and died as a result. They therefore say that he died because he fell into the river. But if an autopsy is conducted on him, one may perhaps find that he had had a heart attack and that he fell into the river as a result. He therefore did not die because he fell into the river, but he fell into the river because he was dead. You quite frequently find such confusions of cause and effect in the assessing of life situations and even more so in ordinary science. The situation with little Teo was that his karma had run its course, so that one can indeed say that he had ordered the van to go where it did. I mention the whole case, which was outwardly tragic in the extreme, for the reason that we have here to do with the etheric body of a child which could have sustained the life of this child for decades. This etheric body is passed into the spiritual world with all its unused forces. Where is it? Since then, anyone obliged to work with artistic intentions on the building in Dornach, or is simply quietly pursuing thoughts within its confines, knows, if at the same time he is gifted with occult perception, that the whole of this etheric body is expanded in the aura of the Dornach building. We must make the distinction that the individuality is elsewhere. It goes its own way. But the etheric body that was expelled after a few days is now present in the building. And I shall never hesitate to say that among the forces that one needs for intuition are the forces of this etheric body which was sacrificed for the building. The relationships behind ordinary life are often totally different than one is supposes. This etheric body has become a protective power for the building. There is something of immense significance in such a relationship. And now consider what a vast amount of power rises up into the spiritual world in the unspent etheric bodies of those who are now passing through the gate of death on account of the events of the war. Things are connected quite differently than people may imagine. The karma in the world is fulfilled in a wholly different way. Spiritual science has to be prepared to put spiritually true ideas in place of fantastical imaginings. We can, to give just one example, barely conceive of anything more fantastic and untrue than something that has occurred in the last few decades. One may well ask what has been accomplished as a result of the establishing of a special, in quotes, peace treaty in order to replace war with law, with international law, as it was called. At no time in human history have such terrible wars occurred since the peace society has existed. And in the last two years this peace movement has had, among special patrons, the monarch who has waged the bloodiest and most terrible wars that have ever been conducted in world history. Thus the initiating of the peace movement on the part of the Tsar must appear as the greatest farce that has ever been perpetrated in world history, the greatest farce and at the same time the most abominable. This is what should be called the Luciferic temptation of the East. One can say that it makes a shocking impression on the soul when one sees, however, one may wish to view the situation, that at the outset, when the war impulse was making its presence felt in Europe, people had assembled in Central Europe and moreover in the German Parliament in Berlin and hardly said anything at all. 
Little was said, but events spoke for themselves. There was, however, endless talk both in the West and in the East. But in a certain sense, one receives the most shocking impression from what was said by the various parties in the St. Petersburg Duma. The representatives in the Duma uttered all manner of meaningless clichés with the greatest fire of enthusiasm. It was shocking. But the Luciferic temptation was at work here. All this indicates to us that the fire that is burning in this war is a warning that people must truly heed. Everything that is now happening points toward the need for a few souls to say to themselves, things cannot continue in the world as they are at present. A spiritual element must flow into human evolution. Materialism has found its karma in this most terrible of wars. In a certain sense, this war is the karma of materialism. The more human souls perceive this, so much the more will they stop discussing whether this or that faction is to blame for the war and will say to themselves, this war has been sent into world history as a warning that we should turn toward a spiritual conception of human life as a whole. Materialism does not only make the souls of human beings materially oriented, but it also perverts logic and dulls the feelings. Within Central Europe, people are still far from fully understanding the implications of what I have been saying, that in Central Europe there needs to be an intimate understanding of the continuing development of the Christ impulse. But this means, among other things, that a start must be made with understanding those individuals who have already sown the seeds for this. Just one example. Goethe wrote a theory of color. Physicists regard this as something that they smile sympathetically about when they say, what did the poet understand about color? He was a dilettante. Since the 1880s, I have been laboring to gain acceptance for Goethe's theory of color against the tide of modern physics. People cannot understand it. Why can they not understand it? Because the materialistic principle which emanates from the British folk soul has gained its entry into Central Europe. Newton, whom Goethe had to oppose, has gained the victory over what in Goethe derived from the spirit. Goethe also established a theory of evolution, in which it is shown how, through the embracing of spiritual laws, beings advance from the least to the most perfected state. This has been too difficult for people to understand. When Darwin brought his theory of evolution expressing this in a simplified form, people understood this. Darwin was victorious over Goethe. The materialistic thinker who is inspired by the British folk soul has prevailed over Goethe, who derived his insights from the most intimate dialogue with the German folk soul. Ernst Haeckel's experience was a tragic one. He was intellectually nourished throughout his life by what Huxley and Darwin have given him. Ernst Haeckel's materialism is fundamentally an English product. Now when the war broke out, Haeckel was furious about what emerged from the British Isles. He was one of the first to return British medals, diplomas and honors. However, what should be returned are not these decorations and insignia, but British Darwinism and physics. One needs to come to this point of view in order to see how Central Europe can strive toward an intimate dialogue with the laws of the world. The greatest damage is done when one fills a child's soul with what goes on to develop further in a purely materialistic way. This has been on the increase for centuries. Araman has inspired a British author of considerable standing to write a book that was specifically calculated to influence the soul materialistically from childhood in such a way that one does not notice because one does not see all this as preparing for a materialistic view. This is Robinson Crusoe. The whole manner in which Robinson is described is so ingenious that once the ideas underlying this saga have been imbibed, they prepare the mind in such a way that it can later only think materialistically. 
Humanity has not yet been healed from the inventors of such tales. They existed before and are still with us now. This is not to say anything derogatory about the peoples of the West, who have to be as they are. My intention is, rather, to indicate how people in Central Europe must find the connection with the great values with respect to future developments that are as yet only in germinal form. Austria has a quite particular part to play in this regard. In recent decades, one could see how individuals, such as Hammerling, in the realm of literature, have aspired to the highest ideals, as has Carneri, who wanted to extend Darwinism to encompass the moral realm, and also Bruckner and other artists working in a variety of different fields. It is important that a people has an awareness of such things. Now, let us consider the unspent etheric bodies that are in existence. These etheric bodies have been cast off, by those who had learned in the course of a great event to sacrifice themselves for something that, at any rate ostensibly, no longer exists for them, for their people. If, as a spiritual scientist today, one speaks of a folk soul in terms of an archangel, one will be ridiculed. What a materialist calls a folk soul is merely the abstract sum of the qualities that the people belonging to a particular folk share. When he refers to a people or folk, he has in mind simply the totality of human beings living together in the same geographical area and with a common outlook. When we speak of a people or nation, we do so out of the knowledge that the folk spirit is present as a real being of the rank of an archangel. Even if someone who sacrifices himself by going through death for his people has no proper awareness on the field of battle of a real folk spirit, he confirms through the manner in which he dies that he believes in an existence that continues beyond death, that he believes that there is more to a people and its culture than what meets the eye, E-Y-E, namely its connection and its interplay with the supersensible world. Thus, regardless of their awareness of this, all those who pass through death are confirming as they do so that there is a supersensible world, and this is imprinted upon their etheric bodies. Thus, when peace has been re-established, in addition to those who will be living in the physical earthly world, there will be the unspent etheric bodies continually sending forth tones to the music of the spheres, declaiming that there is more in the world than what can merely be seen with physical eyes. Spiritual truth will sound forth into the music of the spheres through what the dead leave behind in their etheric bodies, wholly irrespective of what they take with them with their individuality that they retain throughout their life between death and a new birth. But what lives in and resounds from these etheric bodies must be heard, because these etheric bodies have been laid aside by those who have passed through death, affirming the truth of the spiritual world. It will be mankind's greatest sin not to listen to what those who have died call out to us by means of the awakening cries of their etheric bodies. And as one looks up to the spiritual world, how infinitely one's perception will be enlivened if one considers that the fathers and mothers, the sisters and brothers, sons and daughters, who have lost their loved ones, must be saying to themselves, what has been sacrificed continues to live for the whole of humanity as an awakening call for what is to come. If one were to rely merely upon what is taking place in the physical world, one might not have much hope for the successful continuation of the spiritual movement that is being nurtured out of our spiritual scientific world conception. What a good, faithful colleague died recently, aged around thirty, in the words that I directed toward this soul that crossed the threshold of death. I asked that it might work with us in our spiritual scientific endeavors as faithfully and courageously as it had here on earth utilizing everything that it had come to know. This colleague has worked industriously with us on the physical plane. In my 
words to him in this life between death and a new birth. I ask that he might work with us after death, as he has done before he died. For we count upon these dead people, the so-called dead, as we do on the living. Our spiritual scientific world conception must be so alive as to bridge the gulf between the so-called dead and the living, that we feel the dead among us as if they were alive. We want not theory, but life. Thus we also want to point out that when peace is resumed, there will be a living bond between those living on the earth and those who have passed through the gate of death. People will be able to learn from the dead how they are collaborating in the manner indicated in the great spiritual progress that must encompass the earth. It sometimes happens in life that one sees that human logic does not alone suffice. I should like to offer an example, not for personal reasons, but in order to characterize the way that people relate to our movement. Some years ago one could read an article in a well-respected South German journal that a famous modern philosopher had written about our spiritual science. And because the article was written by a great philosopher, spiritual science was portrayed in such a way as to make a certain impression on the readers of the journal. The editor of the journal took great pride in the fact that he was able to publish an article about spiritual science by such a famous man. Of course, the picture that he presented of spiritual science was unfavorable, and the facts were distorted. But what did it take for the editor to see what kind of a judgment he had conveyed in his monthly journal about our movement? The war broke out. The man who had written the article wrote some letters to the editor. These letters contained some of the most repulsive things that it is possible to say about Central European culture, upon which he poured his mockery and scorn. The editor now published these letters as an example of how foolishly it is possible to think about this culture, adding that the only place for a man who writes like this is a lunatic asylum. So, the fact is that something of this kind was necessary for the good editor to see that the man who several years before had written this article about spiritual science, which had severely damaged the movement's public image, belongs in a madhouse. But if he now belongs in a madhouse, so did he also belong in one when he wrote an article about spiritual science. This is the way of the world. Additional help is needed beyond what is available to people today to form a judgment. The spiritual scientist stands firmly on the ground that clearly shows that the truth eventually finds its path. But spiritual science must exert its influence within human evolution in order that what is necessary occurs. And so, as at that time when the Emperor Constantine had his task to fulfill the Christ impulse, had subconsciously to intervene from the spiritual world, as with the Maid of Orleans the Christ impulse had to bring its influence to bear in order that what had to happen did indeed happen, So must the Christ impulse continue to work further, though now more consciously. There must in future be souls who will know that up there in the spiritual world, those who have sacrificed themselves as individuals are calling us to follow them in the belief in the efficacy of the spiritual world, which they have attained in death. And the forces from unspent etheric bodies are sending their call into the future, a call that one only needs to understand in order to receive it into one's own soul. But there must be souls down below that hear this call. There must be souls that prepare themselves through the right living understanding of our spiritual science. Our spiritual science must foster souls here on earth that are able to sense what the etheric bodies of the dead will speak in the future. Souls that know that up there reside the forces that are able to evoke a sense of urgency within human beings who had to be left to themselves on earth. And when spirit-conscious souls direct their attention to the hidden sounds of the spiritual world, the right fruits will arise from all the blood that has flowed, the sacrifices that have been made, 
on the sorrow that had to be borne and will continue to be borne. In the hope that many, many souls may come together through spiritual science and hear the voices that will sound forth from the spiritual world, especially through this war, I should like to speak words that summarize the concluding part of what has been said today and which express the feelings that I wish to evoke within your souls. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. With such feelings in our hearts, we want constantly to imbue ourselves with the meaning of the Rose Cross, so that we may rightly view it as the motto for our working, weaving, and feeling. Not the Black Cross alone. Anyone who would tear the roses from the Black Cross and has only the Black Cross would fall prey to Araman. The Black Cross represents life in its aspiration toward lifeless matter. Nor will anyone who tears the cross from the roses and wishes to keep only the roses find the right path. For the roses, when separated from the cross, want to elevate us to the spirit. But this life would seek egotistically to strive only toward the spirit and not make the spirit manifest within the material realm. Not the cross alone, not the roses alone, but the roses on the cross, the cross bearing the roses, both in harmonious interplay. That is what our true symbol should be. The end of Lecture 11 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death. Fifteen lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is Lecture 12, given in Elberfeld on the 13th of June, 1915, entitled Spiritual Science as a Conviction, the Etheric Body as a Reflection of the Universe. We are at present living in the midst of an era when there are events that arouse all manner of feelings in the human soul, of the deepest and most meaningful kind. We are involved with events which lead to that which is forever regarded by spiritual science as a riddle, namely death, occurring many, many times over a relatively short period throughout the earth. We live at a time when countless souls are having to bear pain and sorrow, and at a time when it would be our hope that significant forces for the furtherance of the evolution of mankind may be engendered. If so much has to be born out of pain and sorrow, and if indeed spiritual science teaches us that much has to be born out of pain and sorrow, spiritual scientific studies may in this fateful time be especially suitable for awakening within us wellsprings of confidence and hope. Thus, some thoughts will be presented to you today that are not directly but nonetheless indirectly connected with such feelings as may be evoked within us in this sorrowful, storm-tossed time. What we see and feel so often taking place at present is that human beings are leaving the physical plane at a relatively early stage of their physical existence. The distinctive aspect of such experiences as these is that young lives are called away from the physical plane. We know that when someone passes through the portal of death, he has to give his physical body over to the elements of the earth, that as he crosses this threshold, he is at first still united with his etheric body, his astral body, and his ego. We know that after a relatively short time, this etheric body is separated from the person concerned and that he undertakes his further journey that he has to make between death and a new birth 
in the ego and astral body, united with those members of his spiritual nature that he is initially able to acquire only in the spiritual world. Whereas for his further journey, during the time between death and a new birth, the etheric body is separated from the human individuality and follows its own path. Now it must strike us that when someone dies young, this etheric body must be in a completely different state from when a person dies who has reached a normal stage of life. We know that scientists speak of how forces can be transformed but not lost. Thus it is recognized as a truth of physical existence that forces are never lost but are merely transformed. Spiritual science teaches that this must also be applied to the spiritual world. When an etheric body is cast off from someone who has passed through the gate of death at a young age, this is an etheric body that would have been able to sustain this person on the physical plane for many decades. After all, an etheric body must be so constituted that it can provide all those life forces that he will require until old age. If someone crosses the threshold of death in, say, his 25th, 26th, or 30th year, his etheric body parts company from him, but this etheric body still has forces through which he would have been enabled to maintain physical human life, perhaps into his 60s, 70s, or 80s. These forces are in the etheric body. They are not lost. And precisely at such a time as the present, when so many such etheric bodies are being, as it were, entrusted to the spiritual worlds, we need to concern ourselves with the question, what happens with the etheric bodies of those people who have passed at so young an age through the gate of death? It will be good if, in order to answer such a question really properly, we familiarize ourselves with the path followed by the etheric body of a human being, during his life between birth and death. The outward physical body of a human being constantly becomes older. This is not the case with the etheric body. However difficult it may seem to be to grasp this, it is not at all the case with the etheric body that it is always getting older. For in the same measure that the physical body grows older, the etheric body becomes ever younger and it reaches what one might call a certain childlike stage of etheric existence at the time when the human individual is of an age when he would normally cross the threshold of death. Thus we must say to ourselves, when we enter physical earthly existence through birth, the etheric body that has united itself with our physical body is, comparatively speaking, old, and becomes ever younger in the course of life, and reaches its childhood stage when we pass through the gate of death. We could therefore also say that when someone dies when he is young, his etheric body is not young enough, but retains a certain quality of age. But what does this actually mean? We may find the following example instructive in this respect. It is one that a number of you will already be familiar with, but I must nevertheless mention it again here, in that it is a concrete instance from recent times which a number of friends may have experienced. This concrete example relates to a young child, the little son of one of our members. It happened that on an evening when there was a lecture in Dornach, we learned after the lecture that a seven-year-old boy, the son of our friend Feiss, was missing. It was soon clear that a great misfortune must have occurred. Late that afternoon a furniture van had come to the vicinity of the building in Dornach, curiously, to an area where such a van had not ventured for a long time, or perhaps never, and where none have most likely come since. This furniture van had overturned at a certain place. This had happened toward evening, and nothing further had been noticed, but the boy was missing. And when, between ten and twelve o'clock in the evening, our friends, together with others, made every effort to lift the furniture van, which those to whom it belonged had decided to leave until the following morning, 
because it had fallen very awkwardly, thus making the task very difficult. It emerged that the child, little Theodore Feiss, had passed by at the very moment when the van had overturned and that it had fallen on the child. This child, who was only seven years old, was a very likable boy, a child with remarkably fine qualities. In order to place such a fact in the light of spiritual scientific consciousness, I should like to recall a logical train of thoughts that I have often cited in our circles. I have often said that people can confuse causes and effects through ordinary thinking, through undisciplined thinking, and that such confusions between cause and effect are actually very frequently encountered. I have tried to show this by means of an example, an example that is only intended as a means of illustration. Suppose that you see in the distance someone walking beside a stream. You then see that he falls into the stream, and in your efforts to arrive at the spot, you see that at the very place where the person fell into the water, there is a stone. You try to pull him out of the water, but he is dead. What could be more natural than to say that he stumbled over the stone, fell into the stream, and was drowned? But this need not be the case, for a simple physical investigation may perhaps tell us that at the moment when he had come to this place, and without his destiny having had anything to do with the stone or with anything else, he had suffered a heart attack and fell into the water as a result, so that the heart attack was the cause of his falling into the water. Whereas if one does not go to the trouble of finding out what really happened, one would say that his falling into the water was the cause of his death. One would therefore assume the opposite of what actually occurred. It is more difficult to discern the relationship between cause and effect when one is concerned with events connected with the spiritual world. Thus one must say that in a case such as that of this child, who meets his death through such extraordinary circumstances, and they were extraordinary in several other respects, one has, from a higher standpoint, not to think that this happened because the furniture van came along and overturned and the child was by some chance underneath it, and that therefore the van was the cause of the child's death. The right way to think about such a case, spiritual, scientifically, is that the child's karma had run its course, and that the reason for the van arriving at that place was actually that the child was to meet its death, that Therefore the van merely provided the outward circumstances to enable the death that was prefigured by the child's karma to take place. To express it trivially, one could say that the child's higher self's wish that the child pass through the gate of death had arranged the whole situation, the whole series of events. To be sure, when someone who thinks in accordance with our present time hears such an idea expressed, he will find it perfectly crazy. However, spiritual science has to show us that much that people consider crazy today is actually true. The significant point is, however, that in this particular case, the etheric body of a seven-year-old child separated itself from the child's individuality, from what goes further with the ego and astral body through the spiritual worlds. It is not now my intention to speak about the further path taken by the individuality of little Theodor Feiss. My task is rather to draw attention to the fact that, in this case, the etheric body was one that had nurtured physical life with its life forces for only seven years, even though the forces residing within it could have sustained a long life between birth and death. These forces remained within the etheric body, and the significant thing is that anyone who had a spiritual connection with the building that we intend to erect in Dornach, in the service of spiritual science, could know directly from little Theodor Feiss's death what had become of his etheric body. So much needs to be done in connection with the building. We shall be speaking further about the inspirations that need to be brought down from the spiritual world today, Helping forces are needed if all that must be brought from the spiritual world indeed becomes available to us. 
and it became apparent that since the death of little Theodor Feiss, our building in Dornach has been enveloped to quite a wide extent by the enlarged etheric body of this child, as by an aura. It is possible to determine how widely it extends. If you see the Dornach building, and those who have already seen it are aware of this, it is a circular building with two cupolas. There we have a boiler house, shaped in a particular way, in accordance with spiritual scientific principles, and here we have another house where the glass windows for the building are cut. Readers aside, there is a diagram here, and of readers aside. I might mention, by the way, that somewhere here is the so-called House Hansi, where we live. Now, it is remarkable that this aura of little Theodor Feiss envelops the whole building as far as this spot where the wood begins, then past the boiler house, and then, after passing directly through this building where the windows are being cut, passes by House Hansi without enclosing it. Thus, as one enters the building, one actually steps within this etheric aura. I have often drawn attention to the fact that the etheric body becomes larger when it frees itself from the physical body. We should not, therefore, be surprised that this etheric body appears in so an enlarged a state. In this etheric body are the forces of mediation that enable one to receive certain impressions from the spiritual world that one needs in order to incorporate them in the forms and artistic structure of the building. And anyone whose task it is to work on the building knows what he owes to this etheric aura. I shall never hesitate to admit that since the death of little Theodor Feiss, the work has been made possible for me through the mediating forces for inspirations that have been made available by this boy's etheric body, which has been enveloping the building. One could well pride oneself in not needing such mediating forces, but what really matters is to acknowledge the truth of the situation. If we bring the facts that have just been described before our minds, we will gain an impression of how it is with an etheric body that has to be separated from a human life, when this life is brought to an end, when the person is still young. Now, it is important to be aware that the etheric body of a human being does not continue to be some kind of nebulous formation within which the physical body is embedded. Indeed, we also do not come to know the nature of a physical human body by describing it merely as a mass of muscles and bones and so on, but by recognizing it as a kind of temple of the divinity as a microcosm. We only rightly come to know what a physical body is if we become aware that the forms that it takes on are indeed derived from the whole universe, that man is by virtue of his physical body a form of miraculous proportions. Whoever is able to sense the feelings expressed in the first conversation of the second mystery play titled The Soul's Probation will form some idea of how an individual human being is, with respect to his physical body, placed into his physical existence by all the hierarchies. The whole world of the gods sees it as its aim to incorporate man in physical existence. We can come to a full awareness of the significance of this physical body if we take account of the observations of clairvoyant knowledge. Clairvoyant knowledge comes about when a person draws his soul-spiritual nature forth from his physical body and is then able to become a consciously perceiving agent in the realm of soul and spirit outside his body. There is essentially no fundamental difference between someone who perceives clairvoyantly and someone who is asleep, whose soul-spiritual nature has also withdrawn from the physical body. By virtue of the fact that clairvoyant consciousness is able to perceive outside the physical body, it can form an idea of what is happening with someone who is asleep. The following schematic drawing may make this easier to understand. Let us suppose that this is the physical bodily nature, and this is the soul spiritual nature of someone who is asleep. Of course, when someone is awake, 
the soul spiritual part is within the physical bodily part. We are therefore visualizing a person who is asleep. The physical body and the etheric body are then in the bed, but they do not contain the astral body and the ego as they do in the waking state. But one could say that what the astral body and the ego bring about within the physical body during the waking state does not entirely cease during sleep. As far as any initial observation is concerned, the person lying in the bed is as though devoid of soul, but this is not the case for a clairvoyant consciousness. The clairvoyant must give an entirely different interpretation of the sleeping physical and etheric human being. He must say, During the entire day the region of the earth where people are now sleeping was bathed in sunlight. Parenthesis, I am speaking of normal circumstances, where one sleeps during the night and is awake during the day, not of those prevailing in the city and metropolitan environments of today. Close parenthesis. Darkness descends over the region where the sun was shining during the day. Remarkably, one notices that the earth as a living being begins to think, and the organs through which the earth thinks are these sleeping human bodies. Just as human beings think by means of their brain, so does the earth think through these sleeping human bodies. It is constantly perceiving during the day. Its perception consists in its being illumined by the sun from cosmic space. That is the earth's perception. While, during the night, it assimilates in thought what it has perceived. The earth thinks, says the clairvoyant, and it thinks by making use of sleeping human beings. Every sleeping human being is in a certain sense a brain molecule of the earth. Our physical body is so ordered that when we are not ourselves using it, it can enable the earth to think through it. But just as the earth thinks through the physical body, so does it imagine, and you know what imaginative knowledge is, everything that is not earthly on the earth itself, that which belongs to the earth from the whole cosmos. In man's sleeping physical body one discerns parts of the earth's brain, and in man's etheric body, when he is asleep, one discerns an imaginative picture of that part of the universe that initially belongs to the earth. In wonderful pictures, there stream into the etheric body all the forces that must flow to the earth from the etheric world in order that the events of this earth can take place. Just as man belongs as a physical being to the earth, it is equally true that as an etheric being he belongs to the heavens. Moreover, we can only use our physical body as an organ of thinking because it is organized for this purpose, because in a certain sense the earth sets it free while we are awake. Equally, we can only use our etheric body in such a way that it gives us life forces because the heavens make it available to us during our waking hours and because the heavenly forces of imagination are transformed within us into life forces while we are awake. Thus we would wish to speak of our etheric body not merely as a vague, nebulous form, but as a microcosmic structure reflecting the heavens. Our etheric body is given to us at our birth as a specially perfected structure. When we are born, our etheric body inwardly glistens and shines with pure imaginations that come to it from the great universe. It is a magnificent reflection of the universe. And whatever a person is able to acquire during his life by way of education, knowledge and forces of will and feeling as he approaches old age between birth and death is derived from this same etheric body. The cosmic forces of the heavens make available to us what they have to give to us during life between birth and death. Hence, as etheric beings, we are once again young if we have pursued a normal life between birth and death, 
because we have drawn everything forth from this etheric body. But if an etheric body belonging to a youthful body goes through the portal of death, there is still much, much heavenly light within it. It therefore becomes a mediator of such forces as I have been describing. Quite irrespective of what becomes of the individuality of such a human soul as the one of whom we have been speaking, its etheric body becomes something of the nature of a heavenly gift, a gift of the spiritual worlds. This etheric body is therefore able to have the inspiring influence that I have indicated. It would be going much too far to speak of the particular karma that such a human soul must have to be able to make such a sacrifice, for this cannot be brought about artificially, but must be connected with the whole karma of such a person who is called upon to make a sacrifice and who has something to do that is destined to play a part in the spiritual advancement of mankind as indeed lies behind our intentions for this building in Dorna, that is to house our spiritual scientific endeavors. But now bring to your awareness that we are living at a time when many, many such etheric bodies, not from people of so young an age, but nevertheless from those who are still young, will be in the spiritual atmosphere. Those who have passed through the gate of death on the bloody fields of battle, all pass differently through the gate of death from someone who dies in his bed or through an ordinary accident or misfortune. The way that they cross the threshold of death is that in a certain sense they reckon with their death, even though more or less subconsciously. Their astral body reckons to a certain degree with death. Indeed, one can always speak of a sacrifice in the case of such a death. All the etheric bodies of young people that thus ascend into the spiritual world will have unused forces. And we are living in a period of human evolution when human souls will be able consciously to look up into the spiritual world and say to themselves, A time has gone by that has sent many, many unspent etheric bodies into the spiritual world. And unspent etheric bodies contain forces of which we can already say today, from a spiritual scientific standpoint, what significance they will have for the evolution of mankind. When things of this nature are discussed, one must emphasize that what can be said in this regard does not apply to every war that has taken place on earth in the course of human evolution. What is going on spiritually and can be discerned with the help of spiritual science is not as simple as natural science would make it. Other wars in former times demanded that they be spoken of differently. What I have to say now applies to our present fateful times. Just consider the following. I have on various occasions and at various opportunities had to emphasize that there is nothing arbitrary about whether we pursue spiritual science today, but that it is really part of the evolutionary process of mankind that people gradually familiarize themselves with spiritual science. We know that every epoch of human evolution has a particular task. We can discover this from several of my lecture cycles. And we may be aware that the blossoming of the future and immediately impending evolution of humanity can be ensured only if what can be revealed through spiritual science may become the spiritual and intellectual property of an ever greater number of souls. But now let all of you, who are for the most part full of a heartfelt enthusiasm for spiritual science, consider what difficulties are associated with the propagation of spiritual scientific truths at the present time. Consider the extent to which people out in the world oppose these spiritual scientific truths. Consider, too, how these truths are slandered, how people look upon them as daft, crazy and insane, and as sheer fantasy. I could give some striking examples, but all examples would form only a small part of what everyone who has enthusiasm for spiritual science 
can feel when he confronts a world that he would so dearly want to take an interest in spiritual science and that has so little wish to do so today. The spiritual scientist may now say that what the mere earthly forces of mankind are able to attain seems so weak, utterly weak in comparison to the tasks of spiritual science. But in the near future, the unspent etheric bodies of those who have had to carry their lives and souls to the portal of death on the battlefields of our time will be there, and these etheric bodies, with their unused forces, will be forces of inspiration and help in the near future. We only need to develop the attitude of looking up, not in a theoretical intellectual way, but with our hearts and souls, to the heavenly etheric bodies of those who have in our destiny-laden time passed through the gate of death in their early youth, and to direct our souls as in a mood of prayer to these etheric bodies. And those who are filled with enthusiasm for spiritual science need only to direct their souls toward these forces, and they will receive help from these etheric bodies. Thus, if an ardent spiritual engagement with these etheric bodies becomes possible through a real embracing of spiritual scientific ideas, among the many fruits that may be engendered by our destiny-laden time will be that the forces residing in these etheric bodies sacrificed by young people will flow into the souls of those people of the future who have an enthusiasm for spiritual science. The forces of sacrificed etheric bodies will therefore be able to stream through the souls of those who will be living in a physical body in the near future if these souls are pervaded by a genuine understanding for this. And these will be heavenly forces, that is, forces of the spiritual world. Entirely different forces will then hold sway in the world in order to be able to bring to this world the spiritual scientific convictions that need to come to it. If we can but find the possibility of recognizing what is taking place now in accordance with the explanations that have been given, these fateful times will acquire a deep significance also for those who are involved with spiritual science. As we have said, the imaginative forms that indwell man's etheric body are magnificent. Nevertheless, they would present a different aspect if they had not passed through a human etheric body. But the proposition, quote, out of nothing comes nothing, close quote, is also valid in this realm. This is not an absolute truth, but it is valid in this particular realm. Thus the etheric body that a person receives, through the fact of a human soul entering physical existence through birth, gathers forces of the spiritual world that are used during physical life. These forces are not derived from nothing. They exist in the spiritual world. They may, of course, be discovered in the spiritual world, but it is difficult to find them directly there. Far greater powers would be needed for this. If, however, they have passed through a physical human being who died young and appear to one together with what they have within them through passing through that human being, it is easier to avail oneself of their help. All the forces that lived in the youthful etheric body of little Theodor Feiss would otherwise be in the spiritual world, but it would, in a spiritual sense, be a Herculean task to draw them forth without him. Because they have become available through the boy, it has become significantly easier and also a different process to be inspired by them. Think how enormously significant it is for the whole further evolution of mankind that such a great number of etheric bodies with unused forces is being made available to it in the immediate future. But through the circumstance, through the fact that these heavenly, and I must emphasize the word heavenly, forces have passed through human beings, these forces have, as it were, been freed from the laws within which they belong in the cosmos. 
it is impossible for these forces that are drawn directly from the cosmos to be used in an evil way. We may regard it as a fact that without the war, all those people who are now passing through the gate of death, as a result of the war or through other related circumstances, would not be providing such a quantity of etheric bodies. All these forces would of course anyway exist in the cosmos, but they could not be used by human beings on earth because it would be too difficult to use them. Another reason why they could not be used would be that they would be being used in the lives of those reaching their normal age. It is of great significance that these heavenly forces have passed through human bodies, that thereby become free from the ordinary process of evolution, and this freedom makes it possible for these forces to be used for purposes other than the good of humanity. They can also be used in a different way. Human life has to evolve in the light of freedom. Let us suppose that Araman would succeed in darkening the thoughts and reasoning power of human beings to such an extent that they would reject spiritual science. These etheric bodies would then be there, but there would be no souls inspired by spiritual science to place these forces at the service of earthly progress. Lucifer and Araman would then intervene and would be able to use them to further the kingdom of either Lucifer or Araman. Just think how immensely significant this is. It means that it has been entrusted to human hands, as it were, to determine in what way the forces that have been made available to the world through sacrificial deaths are incorporated in earthly evolution. There is the possibility that if they bring inspiration to what has been kindled through spiritual science, they will serve the evolutionary progress of the earth. But it could also be that if materialism were to extend its grip over all minds, or if nationalism were to be disseminated in a purely passionate way, Lucifer or Araman would put these forces to the service of their own ends, and these forces would then be unable to further the advancement of earthly evolution. Only if one becomes aware of these connections does one realize the whole deep significance of spiritual science for the evolution of humanity and the earth. Only then will one be enabled to say how necessary it is that if sacrificial forces are to be used in the right way in evolution, there are human individuals who are capable of understanding the insights that can emanate from spiritual science. Thus, if one considers spiritual science in the context of the spiritual background to these destiny-laden days of ours, it becomes something immeasurably great and sacred. The intellectual awareness that we can develop from spiritual science will thereby become something that can be compared to a prayer that can be summarized in the words, O Cosmic Spirit, let us be wholly imbued with these convictions emanating from spiritual science, so that we may not fail in the right sense to wrest from Lucifer and Araman what can bring salvation and genuine progress to the earth. Our building is intended to serve as a symbol of the ideas and convictions that spiritual science wishes to make manifest to mankind. Hence it is constructed in such a way that in its forms there comes artistically to expression what spiritual science can give. I would have to say much if I were to explain to you what is contained in every detail of this building. You will become familiar with all this when you come to see the building over the next few years and participate in what takes place within it. I wish today to speak of only one aspect in connection with what I have just explained. At a significant place in the building, at the point where it is directed toward the east, there will be a sculptural group. This sculptural group is intended to give expression in particular to what the consciousness of our time must imbue itself with in the right measure. Apart from what will be added to it, this group will essentially consist of three figures. Three beings will come to expression in this group. A kind of rock will feature in it. 
This rock has a ledge that projects forward, and beneath this projection is a cavity. The central figure will stand upon the projected rock. One may call it whatever one wishes, but one will need to see in it the representative of earthly humanity in the highest sense of the word. And if one sees the ideal of earthly humanity in that human being, who for three years of his earthly life bore the Christ within himself, one will also be able to see the Christ in this central figure. But this should not happen in such a way that one comes before this group with a consciousness that it is meant to be the Christ, for everything must be felt artistically. This means that it should not be interpreted in an outwardly symbolic way, but everything must follow from the forms. Up here is a second being. This being has a head that resembles, I can only say that it resembles a human head. One might say that a human head is reminiscent of this head, for it is formed in such a way that the skull is powerfully developed and especially the forehead. Whereas in man these parts are relatively fixed, in this being everything is mobile, that is, everything is expressive of the soul. Just as we can move our hands and fingers, but not the upper part of our head, this being can move everything in this region. One can see from the work that has been done on the sculpture that everything there is mobile. The lower part of this being's face recedes quite markedly. One could say that the mighty form of the skull dominates the rest of the face. I can only speak about certain aspects, for each individual line of this figure is of great significance. A characteristic feature is that there is in this being a connection between what in man has atrophied and become the larynx and the ear. The lobe of the larynx extends upward and becomes the lower part of the ears, while their upper part is formed by the brow. On the other side there are two structures resembling birds' wings, between which there is a form that as a whole gives the impression of a transformed human countenance. Wings and larynx and ear are formed as one entity, so that one can see that with its wings this being lives in the music of the spheres, and this is localized in the ear. In man all this has atrophied, through the raising of the left hand of the representative of humanity, the wings of this figure are broken on the rock and as a result it plunges down from the rock. You would be right to suppose that this figure falling down from the rock with its broken wings is meant to portray Lucifer. Down here, in the cave, there is another figure. Instead of bird-like wings, it has wings resembling those of a bat, a kind of dragon-like or worm-like body, and a head that is again reminiscent of a human head. But the mighty development of the brow possessed by Lucifer has totally receded in this figure. It has atrophied. The lower parts, as far as the mouth, are strongly developed in this figure, and it is entwined by what within the earth is gold. The gold of the earth becomes bonds that chain this figure. It is bent beneath the influence emanating from the hand of the representative of humanity, the Christ, as it extends downward. This figure down below is Araman, fettered by the gold of the earth. With what I have just said, you will have some idea of the whole, but this idea only gives some indication of what it is about. We would never want to imitate the bad habit of the old theosophists, who always worked with symbols. What matters to us is that everything emanating from spiritual science that tends toward human feeling is transformed into something artistic. One should not therefore not say that these forms express this or that, but that through what they are artistically and through what one sees in them, they portray the relationship of man or of Christ to Lucifer and Araman. This, therefore, also cannot come to expression with the old artistic means. Every movement of the fingers and of the hands, and the way that the hands are formed, will be significant, for they need to express something significant. 
One could initially have the idea that Christ raises his left hand and, through what he wills, transmits forces that break Lucifer's wings so that he falls, and that through the hand that he extends downward, forces are again released that bind Araman. And yet it would be quite incorrect to think like this. In order to explain the full significance of this, I should like to remind you of something that is one of the greatest works of art hitherto produced, titled The Last Judgment by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Here one sees Christ sending the good to heaven and the wicked to hell. Christ appears as one who dispatches some to the good world and others to somewhere less pleasant. This Christ, as he is portrayed, is not the Christ whom we may understand in his true nature only through spiritual science. Christ, who is the true Christ, does not condemn, does not delight in applying anger or ordinary love, but he works through what he is. Lucifer's wings are not broken, but he breaks them himself, through his own soul condition, as he comes close to Christ. And Araman binds himself through what goes on in his soul, as he is in the proximity of Christ. Hence Christ's hands, as they are raised and extended downward, must express nothing but the purest compassion for the world. Lucifer, in his lofty vantage point, cannot bear the hand of Christ coming close to him, and because of what he is inwardly experiencing, he breaks his wings. It is not that Christ breaks them, but he breaks them himself. It is similar with Araman. Michelangelo did not yet understand how to portray Christ as he really is. The Christ being is so significant, the understanding of the Christ being is so difficult, that this can only be achieved in the course of time. Only in future will the Christ, who causes beings to condemn or redeem themselves, by virtue of what he is, be understood. The way that Michelangelo has portrayed him still has something luciferic and aramonic about it, because through his anger he leads the evil to hell and the good to heaven and is therefore governed by his passions, whereas here the Christ's stance is not a personal one, and the beings who come near to him judge themselves. You see, from this that man's position in the world, which includes the Luciferic and Aramonic forces, will come to expression in a prominent place in our building, that beings must be depicted who can be found only in the spiritual world. All naturalism in art, everything toward which art has aspired in recent times, as a result of the materialism that has taken hold of human beings, must be overcome by the art that is being nurtured here. Something so entirely new must also artistically enter the world through spiritual science that it will also transcend even the greatest of artistic achievements, Michelangelo's figure of Christ in the Last Judgment. It is permissible to say such things if, on the one hand, one emphasizes something that should not be forgotten, that our building can, of course, be no more than a primitive beginning for all this, Everything is imperfect, everything is elementary, everything is only a beginning, but it is the beginning of something totally new. We can, of course, be aware that everything is imperfect, but it is essential to draw attention to something that is an impulse which will enter into the whole of human life. Consider how easy it would be to pass by with indifference a gift of human life, consisting of the unspent etheric bodies of human beings. Consider that the forces of these etheric bodies could fall prey to Lucifer and Araman if it is not possible for us to use them as a healing impulse for earthly evolution. We are touching here upon a great mystery associated with the evolution of humanity on earth, the mystery of the relationship of the Christ impulse to those of Lucifer and of Araman. It will increasingly become possible to understand this relationship of the Christ impulse to that of Lucifer and to that of Araman in the near future. Luciferic and Aramonic forces exert their influence in the world, and through his consciousness of Christ, 
Man must become like a being who is, as it were, sitting in a boat that has to navigate its path amidst the storms stirred up by Lucifer and Araman. It will find its way through the sea, whose living substance consists of Lucifer and Araman, but through which man can, nevertheless, ply his Christ boat. We do not come together in our branches in order to learn in a theoretical way something that spiritual science can reveal to us. Rather, do we gather here so that what lives in our souls is filled with an inner orientation that can flow from this spiritual science? What matters is not what we think out of spiritual science, but how we think, feel, and will, and whether we focus our attention on the most insignificant or the greatest things that we can observe in the earthly evolution of humanity. Everything shows us how necessary it is for the people of the future to familiarize themselves with the significance of the threefoldness of Christ, Lucifer, and Araman. Not only Michelangelo, but also the times that are now past, have not been able rightly to see how this threefoldness has its place in the world. But one will also only rightly come to know Christ in his essential reality if one sees him in his relationship to the beings of Lucifer and Araman who work in the world as its south and north poles. Much will be said about these matters in the coming days for those who are able to be present. It has been my wish today to place before your souls thoughts that enable one to see that the ideas of spiritual science also have an importance for significant events, that someone who can perceive what is happening physically in its spiritual context will be able to discern taking place in the spiritual world in the near future. One would, in this sense, entreat the good gods and spirits who protect the earth and humanity to give human beings the strength so that what must happen for the healing and well-being of mankind can take place. Up there in the realms of spirit will be the unused etheric forces of young people who have passed through death. But there must on earth be human hearts and human souls that look up to these forces so that they can be led by them in the right evolutionary direction. It is not only essential that these forces, which can fall prey to Lucifer and Araman, are there, but it is of essential importance that in physical bodies there are human souls who send their reverent thoughts up to these sacrificial etheric bodies. On this will it depend how the forces that have been forged on the bloody battlefields, where these sacrifices are made, and suffering is born, flow into the evolution of mankind. This more or less indicates the contribution that can be made from spiritual science to the future course of human evolution, if there are a number of people who understand what can be recognized only by spiritual science. I should like in conclusion once again to express to you in a few pragmatic words what can potentially arise out of these present destiny-laden times, quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice. There will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. The end of Lecture 12 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com as well, you can hear these podcasts at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, 15 lectures entitled The Mystery of Death, translated by Simon Blacksland DeLang. This is Lecture 13, given in Dusseldorf on the 15th of June, 1915, entitled Community Above Us, Christ Within Us. We have gathered here today, my dear friends, primarily in order to celebrate the festival 
of the inauguration of the branch founded by our dear friend Professor Kramer, who seeks to dedicate its forces to the spiritual and cultural life of the present and future in the manner adopted by our spiritual scientific movement. On such an occasion, it is always good to call to mind the essential significance of our meeting together in individual groups and to ask ourselves why we form working groups and why we focus upon the wealth of spiritual insights that mean so much to us in such groups. In order rightly to answer this question, we must be clear that in a certain sense we make a distinction, even if only in thought, between the work that we do here and the way that we pursue our other work in the world. Those people in our present time who are unwilling to acquaint themselves in more than a rudimentary way with certain more intimate truths concerning the spiritual progress of humanity might well ask whether we could not engage with spiritual science without gathering together in self-contained groups by simply finding lecturers and enabling people who do not have any particular knowledge of one another, to come together quite freely, to have access to the spiritual riches of which we speak. We could, of course, also do this. But as long as it is in some way possible for us to establish, in the wider and narrower sense, associations of people who know one another and who come together in a spirit of friendship and brotherliness in these working groups, We want to do this in full consciousness of the attitude of soul that links us with spiritual science. For it is not for nothing that in our circles people meet to focus their attention upon the more intimate part of our spiritual knowledge and make a solemn resolve to be together in brotherly love and harmony. It is not only that there is a certain significance in the way that we relate to one another and how we associate with one another, that we are speaking with kindred spirits, with souls who are consciously connected with us. It is not only that this is so, but something else is also involved. With such associations in individual groups, we are actually establishing something that is intimately connected with the whole conception that we should have of our spiritual movement if we understand it in the deepest sense. Our spiritual movement must enable us all to be fully aware that it does not only have a significance for the existence that the senses are able to encompass and for the existence that the human intellect that is directed toward outward things can embrace. It must be pervaded with the clarity that our souls are seeking through it in a real genuine connection with the spiritual worlds. We must again and again say to ourselves with full consciousness that when we pursue spiritual science, we are, in a certain sense, shifting the focus of our souls to those worlds which are not only inhabited by earthly beings, but which the beings of the higher hierarchies, the beings of invisible worlds, inhabit as their place of existence. In the work that we do, we must be fully aware that we are indeed within these invisible worlds and that our work is of significance for them. Now, the fact is that for the spiritual world, the spiritual work that we undertake when we work together in working groups with people who know one another has a completely different significance than if such work were to be carried out not within such working groups but outside them and dispersed in various places in the world. Thus the work that we accomplish together in brotherly harmony within our groups has a wholly different significance for the spiritual worlds from work that we might do otherwise. In order to understand this fully, we need to recall something of importance that has featured in a variety of ways in our spiritual scientific work during recent years. Let us recall that the course of our earthly evolution for us human beings, has been such that in the post-Atlantean age it was carried, firstly, by that cultural community that we associate with the ancient Indian period. This cultural period was then continued by what, to use an expression that is more or less appropriate, we do not need to enter into the details of this now, we may call the ancient Persian cultural period. 
Then came the Egypto-Chaldean Babylonian cultural period, then the Greco-Latin, then our fifth post-Atlantean cultural period. Each such cultural period has in particular to cultivate the culture and spiritual life as is assigned to it, initially with respect to the outward visible world. But at the same time it has to bear within itself, by way of preparation, what is to come in the next cultural period. The first post-Atlantean cultural period, that of ancient India, had to prepare the ancient Persian epoch the ancient Persian, the Egypto-Chaldean, and so on. And our fifth post-Atlantean cultural must prepare the sixth culture period of the immediate future. I have often said that our spiritual scientific task is to use what we make our own not only for something that, while being completely right, is not the only thing that matters, namely to acquire spiritual riches for ourselves, for the eternal life of our soul, but to prepare what will constitute the content, the particular outward endeavors of the sixth cultural period. This is how it has been in each of the post-Atlantean cultural periods. And those places where the particular outward aspect for the next cultural period was always prepared were the mystery places. These were those associations of human beings in which something other was cultivated than in the outer world. You will also know that in the case of the first post-Atlantean cultural period, that of ancient India, it was primarily the human etheric body that was cultivated by this ancient Indian culture, while the culture of ancient Persia was mainly concerned with the astral body that of Egypt and Chaldea with a sentient soul, and that of Greece and Rome with the intellectual or mind soul. Our cultural period cultivates and will bring to its full development that which one calls the consciousness soul. But preparation must also be made for what in the sixth cultural period will give to outward culture its particular content and character. This Sixth cultural period will have many features which will be radically different from the characteristic features of our time. We can emphasize three characteristics which, as we must realize, we should carry in our hearts as our ideals for the sixth post-Atlantean cultural period in preparation for this sixth cultural period. There is at present, lacking in human society, a quality that will exist in the sixth cultural period, among those people who may be reckoned as having reached the aim of the sixth cultural period and have not fallen short of it. Thus, among those who in the sixth cultural period have not remained at a mere primitive or barbaric stage. One of the most important characteristics of these inhabitants of the earth in the sixth cultural period, thus those who will be at the peak of culture at that time, will be a certain moral quality. There is at present little evidence of this characteristic amongst mankind. A person today has to be delicately organized if he is to feel pain when, quite apart from his own existence, he has to look upon, observe, or simply see other people in the world who are worse off than he is. To be sure, sensitive natures even today feel sorrow when confronted by the suffering that many people in the world have to bear. But these must be highly sensitive individuals. In the sixth cultural period, those who will be at the height of cultural development will not only have that feeling that we experience today as pain with respect to poverty, suffering, and misery in the world, but such a person in the sixth post-Atlantean cultural period will experience the other's suffering as his own. If he sees a hungry person, he will feel the hunger so acutely right down into his physical organism that this hunger of the other will be unbearable to him. What is being indicated here is that in the sixth cultural period, to a far greater extent than in the fifth, it will be a moral characteristic that the well-being of the individual will be dependent upon the well-being of the whole. So just as now the well-being of a single human limb depends upon the health of the whole body, 
And if the person as a whole is not healthy, the individual limb will not be in a good shape either. In the sixth cultural period, a common consciousness will embrace the civilized, cultivated people of that time, and the individual will, as does a limb of the whole body, feel the suffering, need, and poverty, or the wealth of the whole, to a far greater degree. This is the first pre-eminently moral trait which will characterize the sixth cultural period. A second fundamental characteristic will be that everything that we refer to today as beliefs and religious convictions will depend to a far, far greater extent upon the individuality of a particular person than is the case today. Spiritual science expresses this by saying that in every sphere of religion in the sixth cultural period, a total freedom of thought will prevail amongst people, so that what someone wants to believe and wants to be convinced about, in a religious sense, will rest wholly within the power of his own individuality. Religious compulsion, as is still so widespread today, and is in so many different ways a dominant force in various human communities, will no longer be a prevailing element in the part of humanity in the sixth cultural period, which will then be civilized. Everyone will feel that complete freedom of thought in the sphere of religion is a necessary human quality. And the third characteristic will be that people in the sixth cultural period will think that they have real knowledge only if there is a spiritual dimension in it. When they recognize that a spiritual quality pervades the world, and that the human soul must connect itself with it. What people call science today, what, as science, bears a materialistic stamp, will no longer be called science. It will be regarded as an old superstition, to which only those people who have remained behind at the stage of the superseded fifth post-Atlantean cultural period adhere. Today we consider it to be an old superstition, if someone with primitive beliefs thinks that no limb should be separated from his body after his death because he would then be unable to enter the spiritual world as a whole human being. Such a person today still connects the idea of immortality with pure materialism, with the belief that an impression of his entire form must pass into the spiritual world. He therefore thinks materialistically while believing in immortality. And as we know today from spiritual science that the spiritual aspect of our being has to be separated from the body and that only the spiritual element enters the supersensible world, we must therefore regard that materialistic belief in immortality as superstition. Similarly, all materialistic beliefs also in the scientific domain will in the sixth post-Atlantean cultural period be regarded as outmoded superstition. People will purely as a matter of course accept as science only what, as spiritual science indicates, has pneumatology or a spiritual conception as its foundation. You see, the whole purpose of spiritual science is to prepare the qualities that have been specified for the sixth cultural period. We try to cultivate spiritual science in order to overcome materialism, so as to prepare the kind of science that must exist in the sixth cultural period. We establish human communities where there is absolutely no trace of a belief in authority, of a tendency to accept a teaching merely because it emanates from some particular person. We establish human communities in which everything must be based on the soul's free assent to the teachings. We thereby prepare what spiritual science calls freedom of thought. And by joining together in brotherly associations in order to develop spiritual science, we are preparing the kind of culture and civilization which will pervade the sixth post-Atlantean cultural period. But we must look still deeper into the course of human evolution if we want wholly to understand what will be the real concern of our brotherly associations. In the first post-Atlantean cultural period, people cultivated what then came to prevail in the second cultural period, also in communities 
which had their particular mystery character. That is, in the associations peculiar to the first post-Atlantean or ancient Indian cultural period, there was already an endeavor to focus upon the cultivation of the astral body, which was to be the dominant concern of the second epoch. It would take us much too far to describe today what was practiced in these associations peculiar to ancient India, as distinct from what constituted ancient Indian culture itself, in order to prepare the cultural epoch of ancient Persia. But it can be said that when these people of the ancient Indian cultural period came together in order to prepare what needed to be made ready for the second cultural period, they felt, this has not yet been achieved. We do not yet have within us what will come to be ours when our souls will have reincarnated in the next cultural period. It, as it were, still hovers over us. And so it was, too. In this first cultural period, that which was only to come down from heaven to the earth in the second was still hovering over human souls, and through the work that people on earth accomplished in intimate associations connected with the mysteries, forces had flowed upward, enabling the spirits of the higher hierarchies to nurture what was then to stream down into the souls of human beings in the second ancient Persian cultural period. One could say that the forces, that having gained greater maturity, descended into the souls who were incarnated in ancient Persian bodies, were like little children in the first epoch. These souls received, up in the spiritual world, the forces from the work of human beings that streamed upward from below in preparation for the next cultural epoch, and through these forces there was nurtured what was then to stream down, and so it must be in every further cultural period. In our cultural period, we need to be aware that it is the consciousness soul that has developed within us through ordinary civilization, through ordinary culture. It is that which began in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries to take hold of people as science, as outer materialistic consciousness. And it will have arrived at its full development once the fifth cultural period has run its course. In the sixth cultural period, however, it must be the spirit self that takes hold. The spirit self must be developed in human souls in the way that the consciousness soul is being developed now. And it is the distinctive quality of the spirit self that it presupposes the existence of these three characteristics of which I have spoken, brotherly social life, freedom of thought, and pneumatology. A human community within which the spirit self is developed as the consciousness soul is developed in our souls of the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period through outer culture needs these very characteristics. We may therefore picture to ourselves that through the fact that we meet together in a brotherly way in working groups, what we may conceive of as the child of those forces of the spirit self being nurtured by the beings of the higher hierarchies, hovers invisibly over our work, so that the spirit self can stream down into our souls when they will again be there in the sixth cultural period. We carry out work in our brotherly working groups that streams up to the forces that are being prepared for the spirit self. So you see that it is only essentially out of the wisdom imparted by our spiritual science that we are able to understand what we are really doing with respect to the higher spiritual worlds when we gather together in such working groups. And the thought that we are doing this, that we undertake the work that we do in our working groups, not only to benefit ourselves, but in order that it may stream up to spiritual worlds, the thought of this work in connection with the spiritual worlds gives the right consecration to a branch undertaking such work. As we cherish such a thought, we imbue ourselves with the mood of consecration that founds such a working group within our spiritual movement. It is therefore of particular significance that we grasp this fact in its true spiritual sense. We come together in working groups. 
which in addition to studying spiritual or pneumatological science, in addition to wanting to be based on freedom of thought and having nothing to do with dogma or ideology, imbue their work with brotherly collaboration. What matters is that we really take this idea of community right into our consciousness, that as it were we say to ourselves, apart from the fact that as souls of the present day we belong to the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period and therefore follow a very individual path of development whereby individual personal life is increasingly drawn forth from the life of the community, we must again develop a sense for a higher community that we establish out of free brotherly love in the form of the breath of magic that we breathe in our working groups. The deep significance of West European culture is that the consciousness soul is being sought within the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. It is the task of West European and quite especially of Central European culture that human beings increasingly develop within themselves an individual culture and individual consciousness. This is what matters at present. We can compare this cultural period of ours with that of Greece and Rome. In the Greek cultural period we see it especially clearly. There is still a prevalence of a group soul quality, a quality which is specifically evident in civilized Greeks. A person who lived and was born in Athens felt himself above all to be an Athenian. The sense of community between the city and what belonged to it had a different significance for the human individual than a human community has today. In our time, a person wants to grow out from the community, and that is the right task of the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period. In Rome, a person was first and foremost a Roman citizen. This is what he was primarily. But in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period, we want above all else to be human individuals, to aspire in our innermost being to our true humanity. What we experience as being so painful today when we see people battling it out with one another on the earth is simply a reflection of the ceaseless striving of the fifth cultural period toward the free development of the universally human. Because of the hostile way in which the various countries and peoples are shutting themselves from one another, all the more strength will need to be developed as a counterweight which above all enables people to be anchored in their true humanity and grow as individuals beyond any form of community. But on the other hand, they must in turn prepare communities based on full consciousness and established on their own independent initiative into which they will enter freely in the sixth cultural period. There hovers before us as a high ideal a form of community that will so encompass the sixth cultural period that civilized human beings will quite naturally meet one another as brothers and sisters. One thing that we know from the many lectures that have been given in recent years is that in the east of Europe a people is living whose particular task will be to bring the elemental forces residing within it to clear manifestation only in the sixth cultural period. We know that the Russian people will have developed the maturity only in the sixth cultural period to bring the forces that are currently present within it in an elemental form to the point where they can make their mark upon the world. Western and Central Europe have the task of bringing to human souls what can be brought through the consciousness soul. This is not what the East is called upon to do. Eastern Europe will have to wait until the spirit self comes down to the earth and is able to pervade the souls of human beings. This has often been mentioned. It can very easily lead to arrogance and supercilious pride, specifically in the East. The height of post-Atlantean culture is being reached already in the fifth cultural period. What is to follow in the sixth and seventh cultural periods will be a descending evolutionary path. Nevertheless, this descending cultural development in the sixth cultural period will be inspired and pervaded by the spirit self. Today, the man of the East, who is called the Russian man by leading representatives of the East themselves, 
feels instinctively, albeit often in a perverted way, that this is so, even if his consciousness of it is for the most part thoroughly hazy. It is thoroughly characteristic that this expression, the Russian man, occurs so frequently. There is genius in language, as when something of this kind is derived from it and people say, not as they do in the West, the British, the French, and Italian, the German, but the Russian man. Many members of the Russian intelligentsia attach importance to the constant use of the expression the Russian man. This is deeply rooted in the whole genius of this culture. The term refers to a quality of universal humanity that extends over a community as brotherliness. This is indicated by emphasizing this human aspect in the expression, but it also shows that the full height of what is to be attained in the far future has not been reached, in that the term includes something that is sharply at variance with the noun. The adjectival word Russian nullifies what is expressed in the noun. For when true humanity has been attained, there should be no such adjective that renders this humanness in any, as in any way exclusive. But the idea that a certain conception of community, of brotherliness, must prevail in future, lies at a far, far deeper level at present among members of the Russian intelligentsia. In this respect, the Russian soul already feels that the spirit self is to descend. But it can only do so if there is a human community that is imbued with brotherliness. It can never be disseminated in a community of human beings that is not pervaded by brotherliness. For this reason, the Russian intelligentsia, as they call themselves, make the following reproach to Western and also Central Europe. They say, you pay no heed to anything resembling true community life. You are only concerned with individualism. Everyone wants to be someone in his own right. Everyone wants only to be an individual. You take the personal element whereby every human individual feels himself to be a self and individuality to its highest extreme. This is what sounds forth from the East to Central and Western Europe in very many reproaches with respect to barbarism and the like. And those who want to become conscious of what is actually going on say that the whole of Western and Central Europe has already lost all feeling for human connections. Confusing the present with the future, they say that true human connections, where everyone feels himself to be the brother of the other, where each person relates to the other as his little father or little mother, exist only in Russia. So speak the Russian intelligentsia. They therefore say that Western Christianity has not succeeded in developing any true human community. But, so they say, Russians still know what community is. Alexander Herzen brought this to its ultimate conclusion when he said that no one in Western Europe will ever be really happy, however hard one may try in the context of Western European culture and civilization. Humanity will never find contentment there. Only chaos can ever prevail there. The only possible salvation lies in Russia, where people have still not become separate from community, where in their village communities they still have something of the nature of a group soul quality, which they firmly hold on to. What we call the group soul, in which animals still wholly live, but from which mankind has gradually been emerging, is revered by the Russian intelligentsia as something great and significant amongst their people. They cannot rise to the thought that the notion of the community of the future should hover as a high ideal that has yet to be realized. They hold firmly to the thought, we are the last people in Europe to retain this. The others have already abandoned this group soul quality, which we have preserved, and we must continue to do so. This kind of group soul life has no place in the future, for it is the old group soul quality. It would only be a luciferic group soul, one that has remained behind at an earlier stage, whereas the true group soul that is to be aspired to is that which we seek in our spiritual science. 
but the extent to which one needs the spirit of community for the descent of the spirit itself can be recognized in the urge and longing of Russian people. Just as it is being sought there along a false path, so in our spiritual scientific stream must it be sought on a true path. And we would want to call out to the East precisely what you are to preserve, namely the old Luciferic Aramanic community, is the thing that we must utterly overcome. A community of a Luciferic and Aramanic nature will have just as firm a religious compulsion as the Catholic Church in its orthodox form had to exhibit in Russia. This kind of community will not understand what freedom of thought is, and it will least of all be able to rise to the point where complete individuality is nevertheless combined with a social brotherly life in community. It would therefore want to preserve what has remained of a blood brotherhood, of relationships governed purely through blood, a community that is based not upon blood but upon the spirit, on the community of souls, is what must be striven for on the path of spiritual science. This is what we are aspiring toward when we say to ourselves that we must create communities in which the blood no longer has a voice. Blood will, of course, continue to be a significant factor. It will come to expression in family relationships. What must remain will not be eradicated but something new must emerge. What is significant in the child will be preserved in the forces of old age, but a person needs to develop something new in later life. The factor of blood should not be interpreted as encompassing the great human communities of the future. This is the great error that plays in the East into the bloody events of the present, that a war is broken out under the heading of a community of blood amongst the Slavic peoples. What has just been discussed is indeed entering into the fateful events of our present time, but the true kernel of it all is the instinctive feeling that the spirit self can only appear in a brotherly community. However, it should not be a community of blood, but it must be a community of souls. What will then grow as a community of souls and what should be developed there is something that we are cultivating in its childhood phase in our working groups in our branches. Whereas what binds Eastern Europe so firmly to the group soul nature, in that, for example, it regards the Slavic group soul as something that it does not want to abandon, but on the contrary wants to view it as the all-encompassing principle underlying the whole development of the state, is what must be overcome. It is hugely symbolic that of the two states from whence the war originated, Russia, together with the whole Slavic world, gives blood-related brotherhood as the reason for the war, while Austria, as the opposing force, has thirteen official nationalities in thirteen different languages. The order for mobilization in Austria had to be issued in thirteen languages because thirteen nationalities are represented in Austria, Germans, Czechs, Poles, Ruthenians, Romanians, Magyars, Slovaks, Serbs, Croats, Slovenians, among whom there is a distinct Slovenian dialect, Bosnians, Dalmatians, and Italians. Thus there are thirteen different races, if one disregards further minor differentiations, united in Austria. Whether one sees this or not, it shows that Austria consists of a collection of people where community can never be based upon a brotherhood of blood, for this bizarrely formed border contains thirteen different bloodlines. One could say that the most diverse composite state in Europe stands in opposition to the state that most aspires to the group soul or to conformity. But this aspiration to a group soul quality brings much else in its wake, and this leads us to something else that has a significant bearing on our theme today. Yesterday in the public lecture I referred to the great philosopher Soloviev as one of the most eminent figures of all Russia. Soloviev is a truly remarkable thinker, but he is thoroughly Russian, and he is very difficult to understand from a West European point of view. But anthroposophists should become familiar with him, 
those whose thinking is based on spiritual science should come to understand him at least for, to a certain extent. I now want to speak from our more intimate standpoint about Soloviev's main central idea. Soloviev is far too much of a philosopher to accept without further ado the idea of a group soul. He has difficulties with it, and he contradicts it on several occasions. But there is one idea that predominates in him, even though not fully consciously, so that one would wish that Soloviev were fully clairvoyant and could foresee what his soul will only see on the earth when it is incarnated in the sixth cultural period. The idea that is from the outset very difficult for the Western European, and of course also for the Central European, to understand and which became the main central idea in Soloviev's mind is the following. We in Western Europe try, among many other things, not least as a means of preparing for the sixth cultural period, to understand death in its significance for life. We try to understand that death is the manifestation of a form of existence, that in death the soul is transformed into a different form of existence. We describe how man lives in his body and what kind of a life he leads between death and a new birth. We endeavor to understand death. We endeavor to overcome death by understanding it, by showing that it is only a semblance, that the soul in truth lives on when it passes through death. It is for us a primal aim that we seek to overcome death through understanding. We are dealing here with one of the points Indeed, one of the main points where the ideas of spiritual science radically differ from the conception that Soloviev, the great Russian thinker, has of this matter. His idea is this. There is evil in the world. It is a part of reality. If we behold evil, wickedness, with our senses, we cannot deny that the world is full of evil. This, says Soloviev, refutes the idea that the world is divine. For when we behold the world with our senses... How can we believe in a divine world, since a divine world cannot be evil? But the senses see evil everywhere, and its most extreme form is death. Because there is death in the world, the world is revealed in all its evil. Death is the ultimate form of evil. This is how Soloviev characterizes the world. He says, and I quote almost verbatim, that you should simply look at the world with your ordinary senses. Just try to understand the world with your ordinary intellect. You can never deny the fact of evil in the world, and it would be absurd to want to understand death. Death is a reality. It makes itself everywhere apparent. Knowledge acquired through the senses can never acknowledge death. It therefore reveals a world of wickedness, a world of evil. Can we believe, asks Soloviev, that this world is divine when it shows us that it is full of evil, when it shows us death wherever we go? We can never believe that this world is divine if it shows us death. For in God there can be no evil, no wickedness, and above all no evil in its ultimate form. In God there can be no death. If, therefore, God were to come into the world, I am repeating what Soloviev says almost word for word, if he were to appear in the world... Could we readily believe him to be God? No, we could not so easily believe that he was God. He would first have to prove himself. If a being came who claimed to be God, we would not believe him, and he would first have to prove his identity. He would, says Salovia, first have to produce some sort of a document enabling us to know that he is God. Nothing of this kind can be found in the world. Through what is in the world, God cannot prove his identity, for everything that is in the world contradicts the very notion of divinity. By what means, therefore, can he demonstrate who he is? He can do so only if, when he comes into the world, he shows that he has conquered death, that death can have no power over him. We would never believe that Christ is God if he did not prove his identity, and he has done this through his resurrection, by showing that death, the ultimate evil, is not in him. Thus, here we have a consciousness of God based solely upon a real historical resurrection of Christ that proves God to be God. 
Nothing in the world other than the resurrection enables us to know that there is a God. If Christ had not risen, Soloviev quotes these words of Paul again and again, all our belief would be in vain, and everything that we can say about a divine process in the world would also be in vain. Hence, Solovia formulates the following proposition. If we behold the world, we see in it everywhere only wickedness and evil and decay and meaninglessness. If Christ had not been resurrected, the world would be meaningless. Therefore, Christ has risen. Soloviev has said that there may be people who believe that it would not be logical for one to say that had Christ not been resurrected, the world would be meaningless. Therefore, he has risen. But he goes on to say, this is a far better logic than anything that you might say to the contrary. In this strange demand for a document to prove God's divinity, which we find in Soloviev's writings, I have given you a specific instance of the distinctive aspect of thoughts as they exist in the East, of how curiously thoughts accumulate in order to understand the means whereby God directly demonstrates that He is God. How different it is in the West and in Central Europe. What is the aim of our spiritual scientific endeavors? Try to compare and survey everything that we pursue out of spiritual science. What is its aim? What do we want to achieve? We want to recognize from knowledge, so that we can have insight into it, that the world has meaning and significance, that it is not only full of evil and decay. We want to understand directly through knowledge that the world has meaning, and by understanding that the world has meaning, we want to prepare ourselves for experiencing the Christ being. We want to comprehend the living Christ. We want to accept all these things as a gift of Christ. We know that what can be given to us in accordance with the words, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, is indeed so. We want to accept all that Christ unceasingly promises us, for he speaks not only through the Gospels, but also within our souls. This is what he means by the words, quote, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, close quote. He can always be found as the living Christ. We want to live in Him, to receive Him into ourselves. Not I, but Christ in me. This is the most significant of Paul's sayings for us. Not I, but Christ in me. Thus through Him we see wherever we may turn, there is meaning. Faust wanted to say the same thing when he expressed his whole conception of the world in these words, quote, Spirit sublime, you gave me gave me all for which I asked. Not unto me in vain did you turn your visage in the fire, gave me nature's splendor to be mine, power to feel her touch and to enjoy. No cold, amazed encounter do you grant. You teach me in her deepest heart to gaze as dwelling in the bosom of a friend. The ranks of living creatures do you lead before me, teaching me to know my brothers in air and water and the silent glade. And when the storm in forests roars and rages and giant pines in poppling cause their weight to bring their neighbor trees down to the ground and in falling make the mountain shake, then to a sheltering cavern do you lead me, showing me myself, and to my heart deep mysterious wonders are revealed. Close quote from Faust, Part 1, Scene 14, Forest and Cavern. Thus gaining a spiritual understanding of the outer and inner worlds, meaningfully understanding death itself, and realizing that it is the transition from one form of life to another. And in therefore seeking the living Christ, we also follow him through death and through the resurrection. We do not begin from the resurrection, as do those from Eastern Europe. We follow Christ, by whom we are inspired, Christ, whom we receive into our imaginations. We follow Christ until death. We follow him not only by saying ex deo nascimur, but by saying in Christo morimur. 
We scrutinize the world and know that the world is the document through which God gives expression to His divinity. In that we experience and try to understand the weaving and working of spiritual realities, we in the West cannot say that we need a document for God to establish His identity if He should come into the world, but we seek God everywhere. We seek God in nature and in the souls of human beings. The fifth post-Atlantean cultural epoch therefore also needs what we cultivate and the brotherly associations of our branches. It needs the conscious cultivation of the spiritual aura nurtured by the higher hierarchies that still hovers over us, which will flow into human souls when they come to live in the sixth cultural period. We do not want to cling to something that is dead, as does the East with respect to the group soul, to an outdated form of community. We want to cultivate the early stages of a living reality, which is community spirit of our branches. We have no wish to look for what speaks from the blood in order to summon together those in whom something in common is addressed by the blood and cultivate some kind of community on this basis. We want to call together people who resolve to be brothers and sisters and to have hovering over them what they want to develop by cultivating spiritual science and by feeling the good spirit of brotherhood hovering over them. This is what we want to receive into ourselves as a dedicatory thought at the inauguration of one of our branches. With such a thought we consecrate a branch when we found it. Community and quickening life. We seek community above us, the living Christ within us, who needs no document, who does not first have to be authenticated by the resurrection, who is worthy of belief because we experience him within ourselves. Community above us, Christ within us. This is what we make our motto, our motto of consecration when we found a branch. Whether two or three or seven or many, many people are gathered in Christ's name, Christ lives in them. And all those who acknowledge Christ as their brother in this sense are themselves sisters and brothers. If we are able to receive such words of consecration and carry out our work with such an attitude, the right spirit of our spiritual scientific movement will hold sway in whatever we do. Even in these difficult times, our spiritual scientific friends from elsewhere have gathered together with those who have founded their branch here. This is always a good practice, for those who work in other branches will thereby also carry the dedicatory thought, the motto of consecration, and they pledge themselves to think constantly of those in a branch who have undertaken to work with one another on behalf of our movement. In this way, the invisible community that we want to establish through the nature of our work will grow and grow. If such an attitude, connected with our work, becomes more and more widespread, we will do justice to the demands placed upon us by spiritual science with respect to the progress of mankind. And then we may believe that those who guide human progress and human knowledge as the great masters of wisdom will be with us. To the extent that you are working here, in accordance with our spiritual scientific ideals, I know that the high masters who guide our movement from the spiritual worlds will also be in the midst of your work. From this point of view, I call today upon the power, the grace and love of these masters of wisdom who direct and guide the work that we do in brotherly associations in our branches. I call upon the grace, the power and the love of these masters of wisdom who are directly connected with the forces of the higher hierarchies, that they may descend upon the work of this branch. May your good spirit, you great masters, and may the good spirit of our spiritual scientific movement be with this branch. May they hold sway in its work. The end of Lecture 13 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com as well, you can hear these podcasts at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. 
There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death, 15 Lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is Lecture 14, given in Dusseldorf, on the 17th of June, 1915, entitled Man's Experiences After Passing Through the Gate of Death. I have often said in relation to many spiritual scientific observations that the concern of our spiritual scientific movement and what it endeavors to achieve is not primarily one of theoretically absorbing those concepts and ideas that one may acquire through spiritual science, but that the fruits of spiritual science should become part of the most intimate stirrings and impulses of our life of soul. To be sure, we must proceed from the results of spiritual scientific knowledge, and one can only acquire such knowledge if one studies it and concerns oneself with it. But spiritual science should not be apprehended like any other science, so that one knows merely in hindsight that one has heard something or other, that this or that is true with respect to some established fact. Rather, should spiritual science work upon our soul in such a way that the soul becomes different in a certain aspect of its feeling life, that it becomes different as a result of receiving what can flow through spiritual science. The concepts, ideas, and images that we acquire through spiritual science should stir our soul in the most intimate way. They should unite with our feeling life so that we learn through spiritual science not only to see the world differently, but also to feel differently about it than we would otherwise. A spiritual scientist should enter into certain life situations quite differently than is possible without spiritual science, and only if he can do this has he really achieved what spiritual science has to offer us. We are living at present at a difficult time, when an aspect of the most important questions of spiritual science, that of death, is appearing in so many innumerable instances before our eyes, souls, and hearts, for some in a very immediate sense, for others somewhat more remotely. The spiritual scientist should also, in this grievous time, be able to keep spiritual science alive in his heart. He should be able to relate differently to the events of the time, even when he is very close to them, than someone else. One person may need consoling, Another may need cheering up, but both should find these in spiritual science. Only when this can be the case have we understood spiritual science in its true sense. The intensity with which the ideas of spiritual science affect us enables us to experience that we learn to feel quite differently about many things than we feel about anything in the world without spiritual science. If we peruse much of what has already been said in the context of our spiritual science about the riddle of death, you will be able to understand much of what I should like to say today. This will augment what I have already explained and will not merely be a repetition of previous statements. We must learn not only to think differently about death, but we must learn to feel differently about it for the riddle of death is indeed connected with the deepest mysteries of the spiritual world. We must be quite clear that we lay aside all that enables us to form perceptions and acquire knowledge in the physical world, and hence to experience anything of the outer world when we pass through the gate of death. We form ourselves in the physical world through our sensory impressions of the world. We lay these senses aside, when we enter the spiritual world, we have them no longer. This should already serve us as a proof that we must make efforts to think in a different way from how we have learned to think through our senses when we think about the supersensory world. It is true that we have a kind of reference point in that something analogous, something of a similar kind to the experiences in the spiritual world, 
manifests itself also in the ordinary life that we spend between birth and death. This comes in the form of the dream experiences that enter into ordinary life. We do not apprehend dream experiences through our senses, and indeed our senses have nothing to do with them. Nevertheless, they are clothed in images that are sometimes reminiscent of sensory life. In these dream images, albeit in a weak form, we have a reflection of the manner in which spiritual existence approaches us as a world of imagination between death and a new birth. We have imaginative perceptions after death. Experience manifests itself in images. But if, for example, you see a red color in the world of the senses and feel moved to ask what lies behind this red color, you will say that it is something that fills the space, something of a material nature. The red color also appears to you in the spiritual world, but there is nothing material behind it, nothing that would give a material impression in the ordinary sense. Behind the red is a soul spiritual being. Behind the red is the same that you feel with your soul as your world. One could say that from the sense impression of the color we descend in the outward physical sense to the material world, whereas from imaginative perceptions we rise up ever higher into spiritual regions in the spiritual world. Now we must be quite clear, and this is especially emphasized in the new edition of titled Theosophy, that these imaginative perceptions do not present themselves to us as do sense impressions of the physical world. These imaginations are certainly there, but we encounter them as experiences. The red, the blue, are in that context experiences. One may justifiably refer to these imaginations as red or blue, but they are of a somewhat different nature than the sense impressions of the physical world. They are far more intimate. We are connected with them in a far more intimate way. In the outward context, you are separate from the red color of the rose, but you feel yourself to be within the red color in the spiritual world. You are connected with the red color. When you perceive something red in the spiritual world, the powerful will of a spiritual being is unfolding. This will rays forth, and what it radiates forth is red. Yet you feel yourself to be within this will. And this experience of being within, of feeling oneself within, you then quite naturally characterize as red. It could be said that the physical color is like a frozen spiritual experience, a congealed spiritual experience. This is just one example of how we must develop the capacity in many areas, to think somewhat differently, to give different values and meanings to our concepts, if we really want to rise to an understanding of the spiritual world. Then we also need to be aware that in the spiritual world, the relationship of what we call imaginations to the spiritual beings who express themselves in, for example, colors, is not like the relationship of a color to a sense-perceptible being. The rose is red. That is a quality of the rose. But when a spirit comes near to us, and in accordance with what has just been said, we are aware that the spirit radiates red. The red is not a quality of the spirit in the way that the red is a quality of the rose. This red is rather a revelation of the inner aspect of the spirit. It is more like a script that the spirit inscribes into the spiritual world. One has but to discern what lies behind the imaginations. The activity that one develops here is only to be compared in the physical world with its aramonic reflection, that is, with reading. We behold the rose's red color and we know that red is a quality of the rose. The red in the spiritual world is something that we do not merely behold, but we interpret it though not in a fanciful way. I must forever be warning against this. Our soul discovers out of itself 
that it has been presented with a sound, a letter, something that needs to be deciphered or read, enabling one to know what is meant. The spirit means something when it manifests itself as red or blue or green or as C or G sharp. The spirit means something by this. One begins to speak with the spirit. One begins to read its script. Our ordinary cultural life depends on the fact that such things, which have their deep wisdom in the spiritual world, are then also transplanted into the outer world. We speak rightly of an occult reading, or someone who acquires a clairvoyant consciousness, who enters into the spiritual world, who perceives the imaginations and learns to decipher them, beholds the essential nature of the souls that live in the spiritual world, not only through colors, but also through other impressions, which are reminiscent of sense impressions and those that have newly arisen in the spiritual domain. This activity, which is purely of a soul spiritual nature, is under the sway of rightly evolved spiritual beings. Here in the physical world, Araman forms a reflection of what I have been characterizing. Ordinary reading of characters in the physical world is an Aramonic reflection of this occult reading. For all reading in the physical world, through signs that are formed artificially, is an Aramonic activity. Not without justice has the invention of printing been experienced as a, in quotes, black art, as it has been called. One ought not to think that one might be able to escape from the clutches of Lucifer and Araman through expedients of whatever kind. Lucifer and Araman must have their place in outward culture. It is only necessary to find the point of balance, of finding the middle way when life inclines constantly toward the Luciferic and Aramanic side. If someone were not to want to be affected by Araman, he would never learn to read. But it is not a question of fleeing from Araman and Lucifer, but that we enter into a right relationship with them, that in spite of the fact that we are surrounded by their forces, we are able to relate in the right way to them. When we know that we follow what we have so often referred to as the Christ impulse that dwells within us, and when we embrace the spiritual feelings that inspire the will to follow Christ at every moment of our lives, we can also read. We may then learn, and we will do so if it is karmically right for us, that Araman initiated reading, and we will view this Aramanic art in the right light. If we do not discover this, we will be verbally giving praises to Aramanic culture, to the progress, to the glory of Aramanic culture as exemplified by reading. But all such things also entail obligations, and it is a question of honoring them. Especially at our present time, much can be said by way of defending or opposing one thing or another. Indeed, we have what we may call a flood of war literature. Every day brings not only brochures, but also books. Among these, one can also often read statements such as, This country has such and such a number of illiterate people, of people who read and write, and so on. It would not be consistent with what someone familiar with spiritual science might say, out of his sense of responsibility, to accept such a statement at face value. Were I, for example, to want with respect to what I have to say about our present time, to adduce all sorts of bad things about a particular nation, and in order to make my point, say that there are such a number of people in this country who cannot read and such a number of people who cannot write, I would not be speaking rightly from a spiritual scientific point of view. Only those things should be put forward for which one can bear responsibility in terms of one's occult obligations. From this you see, I merely wished to cite this as an example, that spiritual science must really also enter into life in this deeper sense and honor its obligations. And if the spirit researcher says things that others also say, you will always be able to see that they are said in a completely different context, which is what matters. To someone who is unfamiliar with spiritual science, 
Much of what is said within spiritual science will therefore quite naturally often seem very strange. Since he is used to having different conceptions and will sometimes feel obliged to say to himself, this spiritual science calls black white and white black. And in fact, this is sometimes necessary. For if one reaches up into the spiritual world with the ordinary concepts and ideas that one acquires in the physical world, many concepts have to be fundamentally altered. Let us from this standpoint consider one of the most enigmatic concepts that we are faced with from the impressions of the physical world, that of death. In the physical world, a person always sees death from one side, from the side whereby he sees human life developing to the point where a person dies, that is, where the physical body initially falls away from the higher members of human nature and then decomposes within the physical world. One can truly say that what the person sees concerning death from the perspective of the physical world means that he is viewing it from the one side. Viewing it from the other side means seeing it in an opposite light, seeing it completely differently. When we enter through birth into physical life, our experience is such that we have not yet fully attained the high point of physical consciousness. You know that we do not remember the first years of our life with our ordinary physical consciousness. No one can, with his ordinary physical consciousness, remember his birth. At any rate, there is no one who will maintain that he can remember with his ordinary consciousness how he was born. We may say that it is a matter of physical consciousness that the moment of a person's birth must be forgotten. It is forgotten just as the first years of life are also forgotten. When, in our physical life, between birth and death, we look back at our life, we remember back to a certain point. Then our memory breaks off. The point where it breaks off is not our physical birth, but includes a period subsequent to it. No one can know by experience that he was born. He can only conclude that he was. We conclude that we were born by and only by observing people being born after us. When scientists assert that they will only accept what they can see, none of them, if they were logically consistent, would be able to assert, in accordance with this principle, that they had been born. For unless one is clairvoyant, it is impossible to perceive one's own birth. One can only infer it. Precisely the opposite happens with regard to death. The moment of the death that the person has previously undergone stands before the eyes of his soul as the most vivid and most light-filled impression throughout the time between death and a new birth. But do not think that this is a painful impression. You would then be imagining that the dead person looks back upon what you see of death in the physical world, the decline and dissolution. Rather, does he see death from the other side? He sees in death something that one must call the most beautiful of experiences even in the spiritual world. For in what man is normally able to experience in the spiritual world, there is nothing more beautiful than the sight of death. To behold this victory of the spirit over matter, this radiating of the spiritual light of the soul from the dim darkness of the material world, is the greatest, most significant thing that can be perceived on the other side of the life through which man passes between death and a new birth. When a person lays aside the etheric body between death and a new birth and has gradually, fully re-established his consciousness, which occurs not very long after death, the situation is such that he no longer has the same relationship to himself that he has here in the physical world. When someone is asleep here in the physical world, he is unaware of himself. And when he awakes, he becomes aware that he has a self, an ego, or I, capital. In the spiritual world after death, it is somewhat different, since his self-consciousness is at a higher stage. It is not quite like that. I shall speak shortly about how it is. 
But there is essentially something like a reflective awareness of the ego, the self. Just as one needs to engage in self-reflection in the morning when one awakes, so is this also the case in the spiritual world. But this self-contemplation is a matter of looking back to the moment of death. It is always as if, in order to perceive our ego between death and a new birth, we were to say to ourselves, You have really died, therefore you are I, capital. You are an ego. This is the most significant point. One looks back at the victory of the spirit over the body. One looks back at the moment of death, which is the most beautiful experience that one can have in the spiritual world. And in this looking back, one becomes aware of one's self in the spiritual world. This is always not exactly like an awakening. This would be a one-sided way of interpreting it. But it is a case of becoming self-aware through looking back at one's death. It is therefore so important that a person has the possibility of really looking back at the moment of death with the full consciousness that emerges after death so that he does not in any way really dream what he beholds then but can fully understand what he perceives. This is enormously important. We can there, moreover prepare ourselves for this already during life by trying to practice self-knowledge. It is a fundamental task of spiritual science to give people the self-knowledge that they need. For spiritual science is essentially a means of leading a person into his wider self, that self through which one belongs fundamentally to the whole world. I said that consciousness after death is somewhat different from here in the physical world. If I were to give you a pictorial impression of the nature of consciousness after death, I would do so in the following way. There's a picture. Here we have an I, E-Y-E, and here an object. How do we become aware that there is an object outside us? By the impression that the object makes upon our I. The object makes an impression on our I, and we come to know something about it. The object is out in the world. It makes an impression on our senses and we take the mental picture that we are able to form of the object into ourselves, into our soul. The object is outside us. The idea that we then form is given to us by it. In the spiritual world, it is different. Because I cannot draw it differently, I should like to draw what I always refer to as an I, E-Y-E, of the soul in the form of an I, although it is not strictly correct. This I of the soul, which a person has after death, is not so constituted that he, for instance, sees an angel or another human soul, which is also in the spiritual world, in the way that he sees a flower in the physical world. Rather does this I of the soul have the characteristic and We shall not at first think in terms of seeing a human soul, but rather a being of the higher hierarchies. That when an angel or archangel is present, the eye is not conscious of seeing an angel outside itself, but is instead aware of being seen by an angelic being. It is the exact opposite of the physical world. We live into the spiritual world in such a way that with respect to the beings of the higher hierarchies, we become aware that we are known by them, that they think us. We feel ourselves embedded in them. We feel ourselves comprehended by the angels, archangels, and spirits of personality, just as the realms of minerals, plants, and animals feel themselves comprehended by us. Only with respect to human souls is it the case that we can both be seen by them so that we have the feeling that they see us and we also have the feeling that our perception enters into them. It is a seeing that both we and other human souls undertake. With respect to all other beings of the higher hierarchies we have the feeling that we are perceived, thought, and visualized by them. And in that we are perceived, thought, and visualized by them, we are in the spiritual world. 
Suppose, therefore, that we are dwelling as a soul in the spiritual world, just as we abide in the physical world. We will constantly have the feeling of relating to the beings of the higher hierarchies, just as here in the physical world we have the feeling of entering into connection with the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms. The only difference is that we need constantly to be aware that we have a self. Then we look back to our death and say to ourselves, This is who you are. This awareness is ongoing. It is a constant component of our consciousness. What I am saying today represents an addition to various descriptions that you can derive from my cycles and books. What is expressed more inwardly here is described more from an external viewpoint in, for example, my book titled Theosophy. But only by perceiving something of this nature in more of a soul sense does one enter rightly into the experiences that one must have with respect to these matters and to the spiritual world as a whole. It is therefore self-knowledge that leads us forward, that makes us strong for the life between death and a new birth. This was brought home to me recently in a particularly vivid way when I had the task of speaking on several occasions at the cremations of friends of our movement. I always felt the necessity of saying something intimately connected with the character, with the self of the one who had gone through the portal of death. Whence came this inspiration or intuition to convey to those who had died something connected with their being? It derived from the life of those individuals after their death. Anything that strengthens the forces of their self-knowledge is helpful to them. By speaking immediately after their death, when their consciousness has not yet awakened, of those qualities that they feel within themselves, it was possible, as it were, to liberate something of the strength that they need in order gradually to be able to develop the capacity to look back at the moment of death, when their whole being, in the way that it has developed between birth and death, appears in a concentrated form. One therefore helps the deceased person if one enables some aspect of what they remember of the qualities and experiences that belong to them to flow to them directly after their death. In this way, one strengthens the power of self-knowledge. And if one is able clairvoyantly to enter into the soul of such a dead person, one feels in one's soul the urge, especially at this time, to hear something about the way he was, about things that he experienced, or about his main attributes. As you may understand, just as here on earth the life of one person is not like that of another, but the lives of all people differ one from another, so it is with those who have passed through the gate of death. No one's soul life is like another between death and a new birth. It could be said that every soul life that one can observe is a new revelation, and one can only emphasize certain particular qualities. I should like, both today and the day after tomorrow in Cologne, to speak about such things. I shall now speak of one specific example. Some time ago in Dornach we witnessed the departure from the physical plane of a member who had reached a fairly advanced age, a member whose Life had been spent in diligent, thoughtful work, but who in her last years had for some time been closely aligned with our spiritual scientific view of the world and had impressed it deeply into her heart, into her own soul. So one can say that this person had arrived at the point where in the latter part of her physical existence she was, as regards her feelings and sensibilities, completely at one with our world conception. Now, as you know, when a person goes through the portal of death, he first lays aside his physical body, continues for a while to bear his etheric body, and then lays this aside as well. Then comes a time when the person must first gradually acquire the consciousness that will be his between death and a new birth. As we know, he then experiences a full review of his life as a great life's tableau. At this time, the powerful impulses residing within his soul emerge all of a sudden, so that much that is of significance in this respect may appear quite differently than during his life. 
while he is alive, a person is to a large extent bound by the limits that his physical body places upon him. Immediately after death one overcomes the heaviness, burdensome nature and solidity of the physical body, which weaken the clarity of many soul impulses. If the soul has during life strongly absorbed the impulses of spiritual science, if it has embraced these impulses with its innermost feelings, it can also unfold these impressions after death in a quite different way, since it has the availability of the supple, flexible, etheric body that is no longer constrained by the physical body. One could especially see this in that individual of whom I have just spoken, who shortly after her death, after I had managed to enter fully into her soul, poured forth from her soul what had lived within her by way of spiritual scientific impulses. She would not, of course, have expressed herself in such words during physical life, but because the etheric body was still there, she was able to clothe it in physical words. What she had taken into herself through spiritual science became the expression of her soul, while she still retained her supple etheric body. And the necessity then arose that a few days later at the cremation of the person concerned, I had to speak these very words that had sounded forth from her being, which therefore belonged not to me, but to her. Quote, in world expanses, I will to bear my feeling heart that warm it may become in the fire of the working of holy forces. In world thoughts, I will to weave my own thinking that clear it may become in the light of the eternal life in becoming. In soul foundations, I will to immerse the sense of what has been that strong it may become for true aims of human working. In God's peace I so aspire, midst life's struggles and concerns, myself for the higher self preparing. Striving for peace in joyous work, sensing world being in my own being, I would fulfill man's highest duty. May I live expectantly in the light of destiny's star that grants me the place in the realm of spirit. Close quote. In these words, which express a soul's feelings after death, there resides what this soul has become through spiritual science. Then came the time which everyone has to pass through more or less after death, a time that cannot really be called a time of sleep. For when one has laid aside the etheric body, one is indeed immediately fully within the spiritual world, but one is blinded by its rich abundance. One cannot take it all in. One first has to adapt the forces that one has brought with one to the spiritual world and thereby attune oneself to it. One sees too much after death. There is indeed consciousness and it must first be adjusted to the level of the forces that one has acquired. One then begins to be able to orient oneself and really live in the spiritual world. It is not actually quite correct to say that one awakes to consciousness after a certain time. One should say that one has too much consciousness and would need to tone it down to the level where it becomes bearable. This is then the moment of awakening. The soul of whom I have just been speaking therefore entered into this state when the etheric body has been laid aside, of not being able to bear the spiritual light. But it had a great deal of strength. You can see this from the words that I have read. And this strength had gradually been wholly permeated by the influence that spiritual science is able to bring to bear upon a person's feeling and willing. Some time after death it therefore happened, that this being, this soul, arrived at a state of consciousness which it could bear. One could, of course, say much about the time that then begins for a soul, if one were to describe everything that such a soul experiences. Only parts of this can be described, and in that we stand within our movement, the most significant thing to be observed in souls is what connects them to our movement. One can learn from what connects human souls in general after death with the whole world. 
but one can best observe the life of the soul after death through souls that are as closely affiliated to one as this soul of whom I am now speaking. And so it happened that it could first be observed that this soul came to a self-orienting consciousness by participating in our meetings, by actually taking part in our meetings. This involvement fully manifested itself at this year's Easter festival in Dornach, where the attempt was made to explain to our dear friends in Dornach something of the profound meaning of Easter. This soul was present. It took part, just as she had formerly participated with an inner warmth, just as many who still inhabit their physical body have the need to add something to what they have heard. It wanted to say something, and the remarkable thing is that it formulated in words because through this it had the possibility of understanding their meaning, how it was now living, and especially with regard to what it had experienced at this Easter lecture. And what then came was something like an addition to the verses communicated shortly after her death. These additional words, which now emerged from her consciousness, are as follows, To human souls I would direct spirit feeling, that wills to awaken the word of Easter in the heart. With human spirits, I would think warmth of soul, that powerfully they can feel the risen one. Close quote. One can see that this soul wants to work further with those with whom it was connected in our spiritual scientific movement. It wants to dedicate itself to them, so that the message of Easter awakens in their hearts, as the Easter lecture had sought to achieve, so that they may develop a right feeling for what in spiritual science we call the Risen One. But something that came to expression in the following three lines was of particular significance. This was especially beautiful and deeply moving. I had in those Easter lectures and in many other lectures that I gave at that time, made a repeated effort to do what I have already done, namely to draw attention to the significance that spiritual science has not only for this present earthly life, but for the whole world. Someone who passes through the gate of death can have a direct experience of this and have an understanding of what is happening within spiritual science. I therefore advise so many people whose loved ones have passed through the portal of death to read or speak to them about spiritual scientific teachings. For what has been formulated in spiritual scientific words has significance not only for souls living in the physical body, but is deeply meaningful for souls that are disembodied. It comes to them as a spiritual breath of life, as a spiritual water of life. Or to put it another way, they perceive light emanating from us who are down below. For us, this light is, one might say, symbolic, for we hear words and receive them as thoughts into our soul, but the dead really see it as a spiritual light. Now, it is highly significant that this soul, who has often heard such things, wanted formally to say, I have understood this. It is really so. For its words in this connection were, quote, Earth flame of spirit knowledge brightly irradiates death's dark appearance. Close quote. It is a reality for the soul. It wishes to say, What you speak in those nether regions shines upward like a flame. And it expressed this by saying, Earth flame. It brightly irradiates death's dark appearance. Why does it speak of death's dark appearance? If you think about it, you will understand. It said this because it has often heard us referring to the world as Maya. On the earth it lives in the senses world of appearances. Now it is also in a world of appearances through which it must for the first time perceive real being. Quote, earth flame of spirit knowledge brightly irradiates death's dark appearance. Close quote. Steiner again, and then something that strengthens the soul. Quote, the self becomes world eye and ear. Close quote. World ear is what is meant. It means that the whole self now becomes like a mighty sense organ, 
becomes an organ of perception for the whole world. There is a beauty in the way in which the dead person shows how she is aware that what spiritual science says is true. For this soul it is characteristic that immediately after death it wants to express itself and say, Yes, I have reached the point where that which I have learned on earth is presented to me as true. These words had a certain importance for me because they came from the spiritual world, from that soul of whom I have been speaking a few weeks after another deeply satisfying event had occurred. Friends of our movement lost a fairly young son in the present war who had voluntarily enlisted. The young man fell in battle. He had begun to show an interest in spiritual science shortly before his death. He was only seventeen or eighteen. He had died after falling in battle. After some time it could be seen that the soul of this young man, and it is often the case that souls who have crossed the threshold of death in battle come fairly quickly to consciousness, approached his parents, really came close to them. And it was possible to hear him say to them, I should like you to understand that it is becoming clear to me that what I have been hearing in your house about spiritual science, about spiritual light and spiritual beings, is true, and that what I have been hearing is helping me. I mention this not because there is anything special about this, but because it shows the nature of the connection between earthly life and spiritual life. There is also something else remarkable that I want to mention in this connection. After a lecture that I gave in one of our branches, I went to the parents in question and told them this. I had at the time written down the words that had come through, and also informed them of the night when it had occurred that the young man approached his parents and had addressed their souls in the manner described. The father then said, This is quite extraordinary. I very seldom have dreams, but that same night I dreamt of my boy. I dreamt that he appeared to me, and that he wanted to say something to me, but I had not understood it. Close quote. People outside our spiritual movement today will find it strange if such things are related to them, and so it is best to keep them as far as possible to ourselves. But it is, nonetheless, important that we explore these things more fully, for our knowledge is formed out of these individual building stones of experiences from the spiritual world and we will only be able to arrive at a clear picture if we do not merely confine ourselves to listening to beautiful theories about the spiritual world, but if we are able to make spiritual science so vitally alive within our souls that we are able to bear it when the spiritual world is spoken of in the way that reasonable people speak of what they experience in the world of the senses. Spiritual science will only become alive within us in the right way, and it should indeed become fully alive within us, if we derive life from it and not merely knowledge or a teaching. This will enable it to bridge for us the gulf that through materialism, which in the absence of spiritual science will inevitably spread ever more widely, exists between the physical sense perceptible world through which we pass between birth and death and the spiritual world in which we live between death and a new birth so that we gradually learn to become citizens also of the spiritual world. It is this that matters, that we learn to feel that a person who has passed through the gate of death has merely taken on a different form of life, and for our feeling may be regarded after death as someone who, through the events of life, has had to emigrate to a distant country, where we shall be able to follow him at some later date. So, all that we have to bear is a time of separation. But this must be livingly felt and experienced through spiritual science. If you do but form a picture formed of various specific facts, you will see that even for someone who cannot perceive the spiritual world, these facts harmonize and are in accord with one another, that the belief that one has before perceiving the spiritual world is no blind belief, no belief in authority, but a belief carried by a feeling that is deeper than critical knowledge, by the human soul's innate feeling for truth. We are living at a time when the outer destiny-laden events 
indicate that we need to enter more deeply into human life. It would be much better if instead of discussing who is to blame for this war and who is doing this or that, people would consider the events of the war as an awakening call to gain a deeper understanding of human souls than the overwhelming majority of people have achieved so far. Among the most important things that I have said is that I have indicated that we must learn through spiritual science to transform, to review our conceptions and ideas. Among these conceptions we can now, and this will be added today to our considerations of this highly important subject of death, include that of the war. One would be right, also from a spiritual scientific point of view, to regard the war as an illness of evolution. It is certainly an illness, but you should bear in mind that you do not do justice to an illness if you judge it for what it is. What manifests itself through an illness is also largely what preceded the illness in the human body, the lack of order, the disharmony. Then comes the illness, which often arises in order to counteract what was disorderly in the body. Even when someone has an illness before death, this is so. He is carrying certain disharmonies which make it impossible for him to enter directly into the spiritual world. The spiritual world would perhaps be imperceptible to him for too long or there would be other hindrances because there are disharmonies within him that cannot be brought into the spiritual world. This is why an illness may befall someone before death. This makes his soul sufficiently free from disharmony that he can enter the spiritual world. If it is an illness that leads to recovery, the reason for this illness is that what preceded it, what was determined by the karma of former lives, perhaps by thousands of years, may be balanced out. It is, for example, not a good thing to say that if a child has measles, it should not have had this illness. One cannot know what might have happened to the child if it had not had the measles to deal with. For what was living deeply within the child came out through the illness and found its balance. So it is also good to observe the war and to see what is wrong, not so much in what now has to be undergone in blood and iron, but also to contemplate what has taken place within cultural streams over long, long periods of time. People must learn to look more deeply into these connections. After this war, a time will come when people will begin to reflect about it. They will then come to realize how many empty words have been spoken in the course of assigning blame to one party or another. And even if it is fairly long after the war, something will surely emerge, and people will speak quite differently than they do now. There will be people who will say, if history continues to be studied as it has been studied hitherto, one will find this or that in this or that act of diplomacy. These things are recorded in one place or another. But if one proceeds in the way that history has hitherto dealt with everything and seeks objectively to judge everything, as one says, one will never discover why this war arose. One will then become aware that it is necessary to look beyond the outward causes to the deeper reasons that spiritual science will have to explain. Unfortunately, it is only possible today to give some hints about these things. One will find that in many places, at the time of the outbreak of the war, some event happened where consciousness did not play a significant part, but something unconscious took place beneath the threshold of outer events, so that those things which the historian is accustomed to look upon as factors pertinent to discovering the causes of the events are not of any relevance. One will learn from this example that history in its customary form does not tell us anything at all. It will be an awakening call to look for deeper reasons. Just as in virtually each one of the lectures that I have given recently, I had to direct a kind of awakening call to our souls by way of a conclusion, I should like to do so again today. One has to bear a certain responsibility simply through having developed some relationship to spiritual science. The spiritual scientific conception of the world must at least enable one to become capable of thinking 
that those superficial judgments, which because of the hold that materialism has over the world, are everywhere favored, should not be the judgments that we make as advocates of spiritual science. What is taking place today is a superficial hatred from nation to nation. I have spoken much about this in our branch lectures. It does not need to fill us in the same way, but we should also not become unfair, and we can learn from the old theosophical society how to become really unfair. What they impressed upon their members with respect to religions was that all religions are the same. This is more or less the equivalent of telling people that there are some condiments or food supplements on the table, pepper, salt, sugar, paprika, they are all the food supplements of some kind, one should not give preference to one over another. Thus, if I have a cup of coffee and add pepper to it, that's all one and the same. The same logic applies when one says that the same kernel of truth underlies all religions. This logic does, to be sure, save one the trouble of studying the great wonderful evolution of the world in all its details, for one arrives at the proposition that one kernel of truth is at the foundation of everything. But with respect to this we have long freed ourselves from the most superficial judgments. Thus the wish to enter with loving understanding into the distinctive quality of every nationality, which we rightly acknowledge, should not prevent us from seeing where our hearts need to stand when guided by our understanding. It will not be possible for all our friends to agree in this respect. This, however, is not the point. What matters is that our souls endeavor to detach themselves from the standpoint of the outer world and enter into the distinctive qualities of the various folk souls. We shall then see that those who identify themselves with our spiritual scientific world conception have in many respects a certain responsibility, the responsibility toward a thoroughness and a deeper insight into actualities that spiritual science makes possible. One then sometimes makes some painful discoveries. One learns that the great awakening call that confronts us through the fateful events that surround us does not make all souls feel obliged to enter with their hearts more deeply and more thoroughly into what is going on in the form of the superficial judgments of materialism, which we wish to overcome. In this respect, one would wish and yearn for souls who are within our movement to form a host of people who adopt a certain thoroughness also with respect to the questions that stir us deeply today. And thoroughness is necessary today in so many ways. One has no idea of all that is possible in our time. I could say a great deal about things that can deeply stir the heart of anyone who really follows, with human love, what is going on in our time. Much in the way of thoughts and views is being disseminated, sometimes with the best of intentions, out of an unhealthy world conception ensnared by Araman but especially with regard to the flood of literature about the war. We must in many ways deepen our thoughts about the tasks of cultural development. Such an attempt is now being made in our lectures by indicating the real position of the various peoples, for it is in many respects a matter of defending thoroughness against superficiality. It has, for example, in recent weeks been possible to experience something very remarkable. For understandable reasons, I would not want to give the title of a book that appeared outside Germany, although in the German language, which it is maintained was written by a German. I should expressly like to emphasize that one can bring oneself to understand any possible viewpoint. One can, perhaps, understand the most anti-German viewpoint when it is presented by someone or other. One will try to understand it. One does not need to share it, but one can perhaps understand it. But this book to which I am referring has features which have nothing to do with the fact that it adopts a thoroughly anti-German standpoint, pouring venom in every line upon Germany and the German nature. One could even understand the fact that it is poisonously written. But nevertheless... 
No one should come and say that if a German speaks in this way about the book, we can understand this to mean that he is saying something disparaging about Germany and its culture. However, there is something else that really matters here. The book is written in such a way that anyone who has a little feeling for inner objectivity and inner thoroughness, and who has had some education, must find that it is the most dreadful imitation of the worst kind of trash. Quite irrespective of the viewpoint that it expresses, it is in a literary sense so abysmal that if anyone finds something worth having in the book, this shows that he is taking what is, from a literary point of view, mere trash, a book that has been cobbled together and written out of sheer, utterly overt ignorance, as something that should be taken seriously. Thus, it is not a question of the author's standpoint. It is that one sees from the manner in which it is written, such as no one who has learned to think, even in a formal sense, would write, that one is dealing here with a book of very limited value. Nevertheless, I have had to hear judgments that this book, whose title I shall not give for particular reasons, is taken seriously. When such things occur, it is up to us not to shrink back, but to form a judgment on the basis of a certain comprehensiveness. Even if someone may perhaps agree with certain sentences expressed in this book, he still does not need to take the book seriously, for the very reason that it is a dreadful, shoddy piece of work, and one does not take such a shoddy piece of work seriously. Because one would not wish that something that is itself true should be expressed in such a dreadful manner, with the worst possible feeling, and in an uncultured way. I wanted to characterize such an example purely for the reason that I wanted to draw attention to the fact that many things are involved when the spiritual scientist tries to form a judgment about the world. If it were really possible to consider a book to be good, even if it is stylistically a disaster, this would be a sign that one has not made spiritual, scientific feeling sufficiently alive in one's heart, in one's soul. It is certainly not for any reason other than to draw attention to the way in which spiritual science must livingly penetrate our feeling and thinking to the most radical degree that such specific examples are cited in this realm. And it is indeed necessary that such specific impulses are sought within our souls. I must admit that the dreadful rejoicing that has hitherto brought people a particular sense of satisfaction when journeying through Germany is not now in evidence, even after great victories. One has observed something of the way that in every soul there has at the same time been pain and grief concerning the immense losses. I believe that it is so. The vain rejoicing at victory is not the only sound to ring forth. For these fateful, destiny-laden days that we are now experiencing demand not only immense sacrifices, but they open up an enormous number of wounds, also spiritual wounds, if one considers the behavior of many people. It is therefore necessary that we, now and again, recall, especially when we are considering important elements from the realm of spiritual science, what responsibility has been placed upon our souls, and how we must be longing for times when the influences of the young, unspent etheric bodies, and those of the souls who are still on earth in the bodies of human beings, and are able to send up their feelings and soul capacities, can indeed meet one another. A time will come after this war when the unspent etheric bodies of those who have passed through the portal of death and have developed forces from the sacrifices that they have made, and who are now able to send them down for the spiritualization of mankind, will exert their influence. But down below there must be souls who are able to receive this, souls who will look up in living faith to what has ascended into the spiritual world from those who have passed prematurely through death, in order to radiate down to the earth forces for the spiritualization of mankind. In order that what I have been saying at the conclusion of this lecture may come clearly before our minds, I should like again to speak these words, quote, From the courage of the fighters, 
from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. The end of Lecture 14 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled The Mystery of Death, The Nature and Significance of Central Europe and the European Folk Souls. It is 15 lectures, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lange. This is the last lecture, Lecture 15, given in Cologne on the 19th of June, 1915, entitled The Overcoming of Death Through Cognitive Insight, Experiences of the Soul Before Birth and After Death. The day before yesterday at the branch in Düsseldorf, we gave consideration to what, in the context of life, one refers to as man's passage through the gate of death. The essential point here is that Western spiritual development gradually evolves toward a knowledge such that death is overcome through cognitive insight, by recognizing it as a transformation of life itself. It is quite natural that in our age, pervaded as it is by materialistic views, death must increasingly appear as a boundary of the world wherein man lives. We can easily imagine that in olden times this was significantly different. It was, of course, different because, as we know, people in these former times still had a kind of remnant of ancient dreamlike clairvoyance. This dreamlike clairvoyance was associated with a state of dwelling in the spiritual world. And in those times our souls were incarnated in bodies that made it possible to live clairvoyantly in the spiritual worlds. Our souls were connected with the spiritual world, thus making death at that time not so significant or final a phenomenon as it is in our times. But this present consciousness would become ever more pronounced if in our time the knowledge made available through spiritual science were not gradually to manifest itself. For one should not think that this spiritual science that we make our own does not have the greatest significance as a spiritual science also for the whole of human experience. To be sure, many of us will say that we are progressing on our path through the spiritual scientific movement in a twofold way. Firstly, by penetrating with our understanding and reasoning powers what spiritual science gives us. Secondly, by applying to our own soul the spiritual scientific methods that are outlined in, for example, the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved? We are endeavoring to arrive at a perception of the spiritual world already during our physical incarnation. But there will be many who say that only a very few are enabled, through their karma, to enter the spiritual world in a fully conscious way in this incarnation. It is certainly true that Someone might enter it merely by applying these rules, but noticing that one is within it and being attentive to the fact is more difficult than the process of entering it. And there are many who, even though they are within the spiritual world, find it impossible to devote their sensitive, intimate attentiveness to what they experience, so as really to be conscious of their position within it. It could be said that for someone who applies the rules given in the book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, it does indeed happen after a relatively short time that as regards his own self, he is within the spiritual world, but he does not notice it. In this regard, it must again and again be emphasized that an intelligent grasp of what is given in spiritual science does not in any way depend on whether one can oneself have insight into the spiritual world. 
We have often said that presenting the facts of the spiritual world is something that does, of course, require spiritual scientific perception. But if what has been found has been transmitted, anyone can understand it, provided that he applies his healthy intelligence, unobscured by materialistic prejudices, in an open-minded way. We must be clear that it is not enough to claim or persuade ourselves that we have gone far beyond the preconceptions manifested by the materialistic age. To be sure, we will have gone far beyond these prejudices in our will and our aspirations if we seriously devote ourselves to the spiritual scientific movement. For the fact is that no one will honestly and sincerely ally them himself with this spiritual scientific movement who does not have the deepest inner longing to rise above materialistic prejudices. But our habits of thought are influenced so fundamentally by these materialistic prejudices, and especially by what is not directly a materialistic prejudice, but is connected with such a prejudice. It is because of such an underlying materialistic prejudice or preconception that people are in a certain sense unable to develop the capacity to think in an all-embracing way. However much our time is based on reason and logic, there is little evidence in our time of a sharp intelligence and reasoning power among those whose endeavor it is to be at the forefront of the scientific or other cultural aspirations of our present time. People do not in our time strive toward clarity of thinking. If clarity of thinking was something toward which they fully aspired, they would also be able fully to understand spiritual science. Anyone who thinks with full clarity does not find anything to object to in what spiritual science has to say, at any rate in general terms. For the spiritual scientist can err over details, just as anyone else can. Countless examples could be given to show us how little our time is inclined to devote itself to clear, precise thinking. I should like to give you an example from what we are now experiencing. It has again been possible to read of a very familiar judgment on the part of a really great person, someone of considerable importance. This judgment has been repeated, and one of the German publicists has made much of the fact that this judgment has again been put forward. Thus a great person once said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. To many thinkers, who think in accordance with our time, this appears to be so infinitely logical. War is a continuation of politics. Of course, nothing should be said against the greatness of the man who expressed this observation. He means to say that nations conduct certain political negotiations between one another, and thereby order their mutual affairs. If these negotiations arrive at a certain point where they cannot, so to speak, be taken any further, what then should happen? Well, war comes in their place. In this way, the judgment of all people can be taken into account and directly acknowledged. But if one gives this a little thought, one comes to see how one-sided this judgment is. For it is, for example, equivalent to saying that there are two individuals who are friends or who have such a relationship with one another that they get on well together and perhaps love one another and that they then start quarreling. One could also say that quarreling is a continuation of love. Viewed outwardly, quarreling is the continuation of love. But one will not have said anything special about the nature of the quarrel if one knows that this quarrel is the continuation of love. One has therefore not achieved anything or said anything even remotely illuminating about the war if one sees it as the continuation of politics. It is indeed the case that judgments in our time may appear hugely meaningful but are nevertheless thoroughly one-sided. Many judgments today are greatly valued that have no particular bearing on the matter at hand. Nevertheless, such a judgment does not necessarily always need to be fruitless, and it can even have a significance of some value. 
but those who acknowledge the value of our world conception should be able to penetrate the veil of maya also with regard to outer life. Of course, it is not a question of objecting in the least to the judgment that appears in every other newspaper article, for it certainly has some merit. But one would have some strange inner experiences if one were wanting to examine it with clear thinking. Thus one finds today in almost every newspaper article statements such as We will be victorious because we must be victorious. As said, nothing shall be said against the justice of this statement, against the fruitfulness and worthiness of this statement. But if someone is standing before a river, which he has to cross, says, I will swim because I have to, the correctness of the statement is dependent on whether he can swim. And one can in this case attest with clear thinking as to the correctness of the statement of the non-swimmer. I want to swim across because I must swim across. What kind of value does such a statement have? Well, it has a great value, for it gives forces, it gives courage and confidence, it pervades the will, it is a statement that spurs on the will. It is not a statement that recognizes something but one through which the will is steeled. The statement is thereby significant and important. Do not misunderstand such things. They are put forward in order to show that a clear thinking that penetrates things is something altogether different from what is so often held to be valid. In our time, materialistic habits of thought are extraordinarily great and powerful. However, our judgment is most dulled if we were to become drawn into verifying what the spirit researcher says. It is the case that everything that the spirit researcher says can, even if one has never cast one's eye, E-Y-E, into the spiritual world, be understood if one really applies sound right thinking. There is no one who, even without being clairvoyant, would be obliged to oppose spiritual science if only he has a sound faculty of judgment. To be an opponent of spiritual science signifies that quite other reasons reside in a person's nature, in his soul. One of these is the following. When a human being stands in the physical world with his perceptive faculties, he has the constant availability for this purpose of his physical body, his etheric body, and also his astral body. These the physical body, etheric body, and astral body, have long been involved in the world's evolutionary process through the ages of Saturn, Sun, and Moon, and have been built up within man out of the forces of the divine hierarchies. They are today what they have become in the past. When a human individual enters his physical body, he is placed with what has been prepared for him in the course of long ages. All this supports him when he is engaged in physical perception. Every time that we have a perception and form an idea, an impression is made upon our physical body. We know nothing of this, but this impression indeed happens within the physical body. And that it happens is the reason why we have memory during physical life. One needs, however, to have a right picture of this. If we ask ourselves why we have memory in physical life, we must say that every time that we form an idea or mental picture, an impression is made upon the physical body. This impression is indeed more or less human-like. But every mental picture that we form does not, as someone who thinks in a materialistic or fanciful way may suppose, make an impression only somewhere or other in the brain, but upon the whole human being. Moreover, every such mental picture impresses itself in a manner depending on the nature of the formation of the head and also the upper part of the chest. It is really true that, as I am speaking to you now, perhaps a hundred syllables a minute, you will during these minutes have fifty human beings forming themselves within you so that fifty human beings are quickly removed, the one rapidly exchanging places with the other. You can work out for yourself how many such human images will have been formed within you by the time that the hour of the lecture is over. 
These human images are more or less similar in their outward form, but not entirely so. None is totally like another. Each is different from the others, even though only a little different. As a child might imagine it, one could have the idea that an impression that one is now having of the outer world, and which one recalls tomorrow, has taken up residence within one in some form. It has not done so, but an image, which is human-like, has remained within one. Indeed, from every impression of the outer world, an image remains, which is human-like. And when you recall the impression again, the following day, you transpose your soul into this human image that is within you. And the reason why you do not see this human image the following day, but recall the impression, is that you are reading in your astral body. It is a right reading activity, an unconscious reading activity. Just as when you write something down and want to read it, you do not describe the letters, but what the letters signify. So is it tomorrow when you recall what you have experienced today. You do not behold the image which arose within you, the human phantom that lives within you, but you interpret it. In your soul you put yourself into this human phantom, and your soul experiences something quite different from this human phantom. It experiences again what it has experienced yesterday. This should come as no surprise, for if today you read Goethe's Faust, what do you have within you? Masses of paper and printer's ink in whatever form. In an outwardly material sense, this is all that Faust is. And you would never have the Faust that Goethe wrote if you were not able to do something with the paper and printer's ink that you have in front of you. If you could not decipher it, it would be nothing but paper and printer's ink. With respect to the outer world, materialists are forever saying that what the spiritual scientist claims to be a reality is nothing of the kind. But these materialists are just as clever as someone who would say, Why do you go on about Goethe's Faust, when it is, after all, nothing but paper and printer's ink? This judgment about Faust is just the same as the judgment that materialists pronounce today about the world. But the same is also true in the case of our memories. Tomorrow nothing will remain in our human nature of today's impression of the phantom, the image, and everything beyond this must be left to the soul's work on this phantom. And just as from the paper and printer's ink the whole structure of Goethe's Faust emerges, so from what has remained within us of the phantom does the re-enlivening of today's impression appear when we recall it tomorrow. But this activity that must be carried out in order that we can remember is brought about by our wonderfully formed physical body and then our etheric body, which have been prepared by the ages of Saturn, Sun and Moon. They accomplish, they do this work for us. And a person who thinks materialistically senses and feels this. Now consider, the spiritual truths that are arrived at are gained without this help so that the help of the outer physical body is not demanded. In this case, forces that otherwise work in the body must be derived from the inner nature of the soul. The soul must be the source of this activity. When one has a spiritual perception that is not brought about through the outer world, we cannot, when we want to recall it, take ourselves back to an inner phantom that has remained and which is, after all, in the body. We have here to engender everything again from within, without this support, by means of a much stronger power. This, too, is nothing so very surprising. You only have to think of the difference when what I have in mind is reflected on a small scale. Suppose that someone reads a poem today, and this poem that he has read today he still has tomorrow in printed form. Then he can read it again tomorrow and again the day after. But suppose that he does not have a copy of it and must then speak it from memory. You see the difference. 
the one time we do something which involves no activity on our part. What we would otherwise have to do, the external piece of paper brings from the one time to the other. We have a support in the paper. We have to make more of an effort if we want to reconstruct the poem from our soul, from within. Thus someone who lives in the spiritual world has to make a greater effort with his will than one who depends on the support of his body. But this is connected with the fact that everything that is discovered in spiritual science or is only understood requires a considerable inner effort. One can be far lazier and more lethargic if one is a materialist than if one is a spiritual scientist. This is the reason why people are materialists, or at least one of the reasons. They are not materialists for the reason that they are compelled by some kind of logic. They are materialists through fear and also through lethargy, because they want everything that takes place within the soul not to be enacted through the inner forces of the soul, but rather through what is inscribed and recorded within the body. These are things that we need to be thoroughly aware of if we want to understand the reasons why so many people oppose spiritual science. But it is particularly difficult to embrace with one's thinking capacity something that will and indeed must be arrived at when a person passes through the gate of death. The day before yesterday I referred to what is essential when someone crosses the threshold of death, namely self-knowledge. Now, of course, this self-knowledge is not a simple matter. Some of you will have already heard me speaking about the extent to which people are prone to the greatest errors, even in connection with their outward form. There is a philosopher to whom I have often referred who lived in Vienna. This is Ernst Mach, a serious-minded philosopher. And I am not speaking of the Hamburg mocker of theosophy by the name of Mach. He wrote an title, Analysis of Feelings, where, with great naivete, he says the following, I was walking along the street when I suddenly had to stop, for I met a person of whom I thought, this is someone with a very unpleasant face, indeed with a repugnant face. And then I discovered that I had passed by a shop window, and the reflection was such that I had seen myself. This made me aware how unfamiliar I was with my own form. When he saw himself, he accordingly considered himself to be an unpleasant-looking person with a repugnant face. This is a professor of philosophy, a famous present-day professor. And in order to intensify the point he is making, he adds something else. When he had been a professor for some time, he arrived in a town after a long train journey and got on to a bus. He then saw a man who was also boarding the bus from the other direction, and he thought, here's a down-at-heel schoolmaster getting on board. But then he saw that there was again a mirror on the other side, and he discovered that he had mentally referred to himself as a down-at-heel schoolmaster. He points out that he was more familiar with his generic type than his own particular form. Now, if it is already so difficult to recognize oneself with respect to one's outer appearance, it may perhaps be easier with women because they tend to look more often in the mirror, it is quite another thing when it comes to matters of the soul. There is not really another possibility for our present time of coming to know oneself than to sharpen our cognitive powers through what one can receive within spiritual science. The concepts and ideas that we receive through spiritual science are suited in the best sense for sharpening our self-knowledge. Everything that we may receive through the book titled An Outline of Occult Science, Readers Aside, also known as An Outline of Esoteric Science, and of Readers Aside, is fundamentally based upon self-knowledge in a universal sense. All the thoughts and ideas that we receive through this book really lead us to the point of coming to know ourselves, of knowing what man really is. As we study how the human physical body, etheric body, and astral body have come into being through Saturn, Sun, and Moon evolution, we come to know what is within us. And by coming to know what is within us in a universal sense, 
our powers of imagination are sharpened in order that we may know ourselves in a particular individual sense far better than is otherwise possible. To what extent does this self-knowledge have a significance for the moment of death? For as long as we dwell here in the physical body, self-knowledge is simply knowledge. But when we pass through the gate of death, all the self-knowledge that we have acquired is transformed into will forces. The better we know ourselves, the stronger will be this kind of will force when we have laid aside our physical body. Let us suppose, for example, that we have in our earthly life come to see that in certain respects we were a person with a violent temper. Well, you know how difficult it is wholly to transform ourselves in physical life and to overcome something like a violent temper, even if we are aware of it. But in the moment when we lay aside our physical body, the mere knowledge that we had a hot temper becomes a force of will, and this will is directed toward excluding violence from our being. Every judgment involving insight becomes a will judgment when we pass through the gate of death. It becomes a force of will. And then something very significant arises, which we can, in a certain sense, call the reversal of something that is experienced before a person's birth, but which is forgotten, because he is unable to look back to the period before his birth. But let us imagine that he could already now accomplish what he will develop in Jupiter existence, when he is gradually preparing out of the spiritual world to enter once more into an incarnation, he would, in a highly remarkable way, experience something like a perception of his future form, his future life. He would also behold something of his physical form. But there is one thing that he would never perceive in this physical form, which would appear to him as two points. Let us imagine that as we advance toward birth, we would have our physical form hovering before us as though in a mist. We would see it as light. But within it we would see dark, impenetrable points, dark spheres, also much else besides, but also these dark spheres. Long before a human individual advances toward his physical birth, he sees, as it were in time, not in space, before him, this is what you will be. And he sees in a certain sense how his physical organism is fashioned out of the essence of the spirits of form. This appears to him more or less as a figure of light, but hovering within it two dark spheres. When the person approaches physical life, this happens in part already in the body of the mother, he takes certain forces from these surroundings which the mother then forms. He gradually feels connected with this figure of light, and then he feels as if he were especially within these two spheres. Previously they seemed to him to be impenetrable, Now he is within them, and then feels the forces that come toward him from all sides that enter into him. Then he pierces these two spheres, the space of the spheres, the space loses its impenetrability, and these are the spaces where the eyes will be. Thus when one is approaching physical earthly incarnation, what one does not immediately see is what enables us to see, namely the eyes. They are like impenetrable spheres that accompany our approach to life. Then one penetrates them in the last phase before one enters the physical world. If one were to experience this consciously, it would indeed be a wonderful phenomenon. Just think that as one makes one's way from the spiritual world to the physical world, one says to oneself, Now your soul is approaching this physical form. You will find there two dark spheres. You cannot look through them with your present soul vision. They are full of spiritual substance. Then one acquires the power to make what is spiritually impenetrable transparent. And when one then, as one says, perceives the light of the world, these spaces that were impenetrable to sight are the very reason why one sees. One cannot oneself see the eyes, were one to see them, one would not see the world. When one passes through the portal of death, the subsequent sight of death 
is also, therefore, such a wonderful phenomenon in the spiritual life of a human being after death, because something similar is happening with the whole human being as occurred here with the eyes. Only what now occurs with the whole human being is experienced consciously. One must, after death, acquire the feeling in one's inner experience. You have departed from the world. Hitherto, one had in the I, E-Y-E, the physical world as a physical experience, that which the etheric body finally still shows as a tableau. Now one comes through the portal of death with what one has engendered by way of self-knowledge, and this becomes a power of will. Now imagine that here, referring to a drawing, and there is one, is a dead person. He leaves his physical experiences behind. He radiates his power of will, this power of will that he has acquired through self-knowledge. And this radiant power of will that he has acquired through self-knowledge clears away that which prevents us from perceiving our spiritual surroundings. Just as when we approach our birth we clear away the obscuring aspect of the I, so do we remove what prevents us from perceiving the spiritual world through this power of will. After death, we make ourselves transparent. This is the significant event. When someone passes through the gate of death, for as long as he still has his etheric body, he surveys the whole of his life as a mighty tableau. This stands before him. But he also has the feeling, you are seeing yourself. This is you as you were living between birth and death. This is all you were. Now there stirs within him all the power of self-knowledge that he has acquired. And it has the penetrating power that I have described, which enables the etheric body to depart. It is then as if a veil were to fall away. And what is behind comes for the first time to manifestation, and this is the spiritual world. It is an immense experience to go through the gate of death and to have the whole last life before one through the etheric body, having become free, and to receive the feeling. This last life is a veil that covers up a vast world that you were not able to see during life. Now the power of will, deriving from self-knowledge, battles against this veil and removes it, and when the veil is torn, the spiritual world appears behind it. One does not need to have anxiety, for the reason that someone might say, in our present time so many people have done absolutely nothing to arrive at a certain self-knowledge. According to the judgment of many people, one can hardly be cleverer and more intelligent than a contemporary university professor of philosophy. This is, after all, the ideal of intelligence at present. And yet one cannot be so little cut out for self-knowledge as a really famous man who is even a philosopher, Ernst Mach, who really is a person of some significance. Thus someone might become troubled and say that self-knowledge is in a poor state at present. Admittedly, if the situation were such that it would be indicated to people that they would only have the power of will deriving from the self-knowledge ensuing from their present life, things would look bad for them. Present-day people are very proud of the immense advances in knowledge that have been achieved, and from a certain aspect also rightly. Just think how a modern doctor who knows everything about current medical practice, proudly looks down upon those who haven't been doctors for very long. They are all fools, he naturally thinks. With respect to outward knowledge, human beings have, over the course of recent centuries, achieved and come to know many things about the outer world, how external phenomena relate, and so on. In this sense, great advances have been made. But with respect to self-knowledge, the olden times when we were involved with former incarnations were far ahead of the present. So far, indeed, that a person of today, if he thinks materialistically, has absolutely no understanding of what derives from olden times. For what people today view as old prejudices was, in that it was experienced by the souls of these former times, basically self-knowledge. 
and what has been recorded are only the last remnants of self-knowledge. As regards earthly life, it is the case that someone with an ordinary sense-bound consciousness has no knowledge of his former incarnations. It is true that among the theosophists there are people who manage, after a relatively short time, to know terribly much about their former incarnations. In a European city, I once became acquainted with a society where Seneca, Frederick the Great, the Emperor Joseph, the Duke of Reichstadt, Madame Pompadour, Marie Antoinette, and certain others were sitting together at one coffee table. But apart from those who know so much about their former incarnations, after they have learned a little theosophy, people generally know not very much or nothing at all about their former incarnation through ordinary outward knowledge. For just as it is true that a person knows nothing of his previous incarnation through what the present cycle of human experience gives him, so is it equally true that he is dependent for his will development after death upon what has remained to him from former lives. Whereas between birth and death people know nothing of their former incarnations, in the life between death and a new birth they have all the forces of their previous incarnations within them and also that which is always lived through between death and a new birth. Thus when someone passes through the gate of death, he not only has that power of will that derives from the self-knowledge that people generally do not have today, but all the will forces that come not from the self-knowledge in this life, but from the self-knowledge that he has acquired in former lives. He is therefore not bereft of that power of will that clears away the fabric that has been woven through his own life. However, if in the course of the coming millennia a person wants to acquire new will forces, even this self-knowledge from olden times would become ever weaker, and this is why spiritual science is needed for the further evolution of mankind. For such is the course of human evolution, that the power of human will is still sufficient for today. But the time is now beginning when this power of will can be strengthened through man's coming to know the spiritual world during earthly development. The earthly evolution of mankind would be exposed to a danger if people were to resist in every respect receiving something from spiritual science from now onward until the end of earthly evolution. They would then increasingly come to the point of being little able to perceive anything of spiritual phenomena and happenings in the world of spirit. This would be ever less and less possible for them. They would have increasing difficulty in penetrating the veil of which I spoke. You see, therefore, what significant self-knowledge transformed into a power of will, has. Here this knowledge is self-perception, there it is self-will, which is directed toward removing the veil from the spiritual world. Especially in those who pass through the portal of death, one perceives how important it is for them that they are strengthened in their power of will as it has now been characterized in the power of will that derives from self-knowledge. It is therefore really meaningful that when a person passes through the portal of death, he concerns himself through these various stages with what is within him, with what is within his self, with what he was during his earthly life. And if someone has communion with a dead person, it is of great essential significance to make this communion especially fruitful by helping the person who has thus departed in strengthening his self-awareness in the fulfillment of this self-awareness. This is meant in a very real sense. Let us think of someone who was with us here in physical life and who has passed through the portal of death. As we have lived with him, we know how he was. We know what he particularly liked doing and so on. When he has passed through the portal of death, it is necessary, urgently necessary for him, as it were, to summon up everything that he wills through strong inner forces. And this must flow from his review of his life. We can help him in this if we think of him in such a way as he appeared to us in life, if we endeavor to send him thoughts that characterize him as he was. In addition to the various things 
that have been said about our concern with the dead who have departed from us, we can also make our help available to them by bringing them a kind of picture of their essential being. In this way we relieve them of some of the effort in the unfolding of that will which needs to tear away the veil that has been characterized. It therefore happened that the situation of which I spoke to you the day before yesterday arose for me. Thus, when I had to speak recently at the funeral of friends, I felt myself confronted with the need to express at the funeral itself what lives in these friends as regards their essential nature. What I had said was spoken not out of memories, but emerged from my own soul in such a way that this soul of mine put itself wholly into the other soul after it had crossed the threshold of death. When one has to do with the soul that has crossed the threshold of death, it is a matter of putting oneself in the place of this soul. Here in the physical world, one is directly confronted by the object, one beholds it from without. In the spirit realm, one is with one's whole being within this soul-spiritual essence. And so it was, that in the particular case of which I spoke the day before yesterday, it was possible for me to put myself into the soul of this person who had passed through the portal of death and who has been characterized by me as someone who had for many years before her death greatly concerned herself with this world conception of ours. So that for as long as she was still within her etheric body, she was, through her, having immersed herself in spiritual science, and having received certain forces, able to express in words something of her own essence, what she was as a being. I managed to catch these words from the dead person who had passed through the portal of death, and I had to speak them at her funeral. In other cases it was different. When I had to speak at the funeral of our dear Fritz Mitcher, who must be remembered with particular fondness by the members of our branch, The situation was that I felt the need fully to put myself within this soul who had gone through the gate of death. But now the need arose to put in words what this soul was in life for those who had befriended it and were around it also as members of our anthroposophical movement in order, together with this soul, after its death, to ponder and share in all that self-knowledge had contributed to encouraging the development of its will. It then became necessary to say things at this funeral that were in harmony with what our dead friend Fritz Mitcher experienced in the times of his development after he had joined forces with our spiritual scientific movement, what he had assimilated, how his inner karma had led him. And the words that I had to speak are, as I said, not my words. They emanated from the forces of his own soul, but formed in such a way that they expressed the essence of the years which had preceded his death. This is what I had to say. It was not a case of wanting to say what I myself had to say. They were, of course, not directly his own words. The soul in question would never have said this out of itself in life. It is what the other soul has felt, a soul that is linked with the soul of the one who has departed, as can be sensed only in the case of a soul that is already disembodied. I would like to share with you these words, that I had to speak at the funeral, quote, As a hope that gladdens us, so do we venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul-being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. Your longing had its deep affinity with a pure love of truth. The goal to which you tirelessly aspired throughout your life was creation from the spirit light. You cultivated your fine gifts to follow with sure step the radiant path of spirit knowledge, unswayed by outward opposition, as a true servant of the truth. Your spirit organs you enhanced, that they boldly and persistently thrust error from you to both sides of the path and create for you a realm for truth. To fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun-power of the soul might radiate its strength within you was your concern and joy. 
other cares, other joys, they barely touched your soul. For knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for you life's truest worth. As a hope that gladdens us, so do we venture upon the field where spirit blossoms of the earth would, through the power of soul being, manifest themselves to the questing spirit. A loss that deeply us aggrieves, so do you venture from the field where earthly seeds of spirit have matured for your senses' spheres in the womb of soul-being. Feel how we look lovingly up to the heights that called you now away for other creating. Extend your strength from realms of spirit to the friends you've left behind. Hear the entreaty of our souls sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. As a hope that gladdens us, a loss that deeply us grieves, let us hope that from far and near, unforsaken for our life, you shine as starry soul in spirit realms. Close quote. Although these words should not be regarded as having been spoken by the soul itself, they were nevertheless spoken in such community with it that after a relatively short time something was manifested from this soul that now came from it alone, thus not from my soul but only from the soul that had gone through the gate of death. And this then sounded forth, and since that time these words have repeatedly resounded to me, quote, to fashion myself, that it reveal the purity of light, that the sun power of the soul might radiate its strength within me, was my concern and joy. Other cares, other joys, they barely touched my soul, for knowledge, as the light that to existence meaning gives, held for me life's truest worth. Close quote. And when for the first time, it has often happened since, I heard these words from this soul that had passed through death, it occurred to me, for what I have read out was indeed written down word for word as I heard it in connection with this soul, that a dialogue could arise. At the cremation, the words spoken were, quote, to fashion yourself that it reveal the purity of light, close quote. In these verses, the second person is used. But this was not my doing. I only noticed when the words came back from the dead soul that these words were formed in such a way that they were given back in the first person, quote, to fashion myself that it reveal the purity of light, close quote. You see there a dialogue, a kind of mutual understanding extending beyond the grave. In connection with this, I should like to speak of something that is often mentioned in our spiritual scientific movement, but which cannot be spoken of enough. In the verses that were addressed to a soul that had passed through the portal of death, you find that something resounds, which comes particularly to expression, where it is said, quote, Hear the entreaty of our souls sent to you in confidence. We need here for earthly work strong power from spirit lands, which to our dead friends we owe. Close quote. Do not regard such a plea as mere words. This speaks of something that is in the deepest sense significantly connected with the whole nature of our spiritual scientific movement. When a soul has endeavored, as has the one in question, to imbue all the knowledge and experiences that it has assimilated, with spiritual scientific impulses, and it goes prematurely through the gate of death, it is indeed the case that such a soul can continue to be a faithful collaborator. Thus when I spoke these words for this soul, it was something of the nature of a plea, that it may become a helper for what must be our will to accomplish for the future of the earth. For you can regard it as an absolute certainty that the gulf between the living and the dead must be livingly spanned through our spiritual science over the course of earthly evolution. We must learn to regard the dead not as people who are dead, 
but as those who live and act creatively among us. Just as we live together with those who live in a physical body. Those who are the so-called dead will then work with us with those forces that are available to them. We must try to understand in a living way and not as a theory the impulses that spiritual science would have us translate into the living life that we want to contribute out of the future to cultural development. And it must truly be said that if one takes account of the present circumstances of our outward culture, the help of those in the spiritual world will be needed in the future. Those who truly provide access here on earth to the spiritual scientific movement will need the souls of the dead. Hence it was said that for earthly work we need the strength from the lands of spirit that we owe to dead friends. It is a plea that these souls that are working further with the forces which have been strengthened by what they have received here and imbued with what they have received in spirit lands may work together with us on earth, that they be imbued with that which is of the same nature as what we will. There are so many symptoms of the considerable difficulties and hindrances that confront what we refer to as our earthly anthroposophical task. Among many others that can be observed, one may now be cited. Some years ago an article appeared in a South German journal that created a sensation, because it was made known that its author was a leading philosopher. The editor of the journal was called Karl Muth. This Karl Muth had at the time accepted a lengthy article when my book titled Occult Science appeared. He published this article in connection with the book. It would not perhaps have been particularly difficult for me to repudiate, at any rate, the most hostile aspects of the article and its most foolish assertions. For the truth about that great philosopher is, while for many he is indeed a great philosopher, there are many others who have encountered him in life. He does not need to have come particularly close to them or to have sat opposite to them, to whom he appears as a kind of burr that sticks to them. This is also how he appeared to me, and I have had to keep myself away from him. But after he had written postcard after postcard, letter after letter to me, he also sent me this article in manuscript form. I could not bring myself to read the article, because it began in such a silly way. Thus he says, for example, that Steiner calls what he has written in his book Occult Science. But there cannot be such a thing as an occult science, for it is the essential nature of science that it is not occult but public. Thus an occult science contradicts the nature of science itself. This is how the article began. And as I skimmed through it, I came upon such shameless nonsense that it was totally beyond me to read the manuscript any further. It is still lying around somewhere. It is ridiculous to say such a thing about occult science, for one merely needs to have some knowledge of German to sense how silly it is. It is just as though someone were to say, no science is natural, but there is natural science. It is true that there is no science that is secret, but there is an occult science. It was therefore too silly for words, but the editor of the journal found that it was a particularly significant article. The article has been much read. And what he said about occult science, where he subjected it to thorough criticism, was considered to be very clever. Now the war came. The philosopher is no German, and he now considers himself to be among the most hostile enemies of Germany. He now writes a series of letters to the same Karl Muth, who at the time, please forgive the hackneyed expression, had licked his lips at the thought of having received the article from the famous philosopher. Such venom and poison has been disseminated about Germany and the German people, but nothing has been written that is as awful as what this famous philosopher wrote in his letters to Karl Muth. His judgments and criticisms about Germany and the German nature are of the most atrocious kind. What then ensued can even be regarded as a good sign. After spitting out this venom and poison, the philosopher in question wrote, unfortunately not with, in quotes, secret science, because the censor did not prevent him from overstepping the mark. 
so that it even arrived in Munich, and Mut found the courage to print more of it. But now, not in order to publish the significant article of a significant man, but some years later, the same Karl Mut prints these writings about Germany and writes, Of course, a man who writes like this must be someone who belongs in a madhouse. You see, for Karl Mut, these writings about the German nature were necessary in order to make him realize that the man is a fool. A few years ago, he let the same fool loose on our spiritual science. A sensible person could have known this already, but fools are also often reckoned to be famous philosophers, and this should not trouble anyone. But you see from this what dangers spiritual science is exposed to. Had the war not come and Karl Muth had not been taught that the good man, this Professor Vincenti Ludoslavsky, is actually a fool, he would have had occasion to accept another article from the pen of this famous philosopher seeking to destroy spiritual science. You also see from this that in our time people are often not inclined to determine through their power of judgment what standpoint they should adopt toward spiritual science. I only mention this in order to show, by means of an example, and one could cite many such examples, what hindrances our spiritual scientific movement is exposed to, that even those who are later necessarily regarded as fools are let loose upon it. It may perhaps also be justified to point out that much else that is said against this same spiritual science is not much cleverer than this. For where something is demonstrated in a really striking way, there must surely be some truth in it. We must make it clear to ourselves that in order to make spiritual scientific impulses truly alive, we also need the forces of those who have gone through the gate of death and who, before they crossed this threshold, have received what is embraced within the light of spiritual science. The gulf between the living and the dead must above all else first be removed in the domain of our spiritual science itself. This must therefore be our constant watchword to keep alive the awareness that we had of the souls who were close to us while they were living among us in a physical body, holy as they were then, though oriented toward a different form of life. This is something that we want to do, even if the souls in question have passed through the gate of death. One of the most beautiful and significant things that we can achieve out of spiritual science is that we are able to regard those who have passed through the gate of death as people who live among us and give us blessings, just as we meet with those who are living in a physical body. And this will find some essential support through the fact that on the battlefields, where something new is being prepared out of blood and death, so many souls are now passing at an early point in their physical life through the portal of death and making available unspent etheric bodies to the spiritual world. Man's etheric body is prepared in such a way that it can supply a person with life forces until old age. If someone passes through the portal of death when he is still young, the forces that could still have been used if he had reached old age are unspent. And we can now look up into the etheric realm of the spiritual world, where such a person still remains for a time once he has left the physical plane. From those who have fallen on the fields where battles are being waged, and who have passed through the gate of death, there are many youthful etheric bodies that do not immediately dissolve, but continue to hold together and contain forces that could have sustained life for a long time. These etheric bodies will be forces that are able to help human beings when they look up longingly with the consciousness of spiritual science to where what is contained in unspent etheric bodies will reside. Those forces from above will join with those who wish consciously to unite themselves with these forces out of a spiritual scientific consciousness. As we feel and sense this, we may direct our attention to them. We may commit ourselves to the spiritual world in a living way. We may say to ourselves that there must in the future in the time that will follow this war, be people here on this earth of ours who have within them souls that are able to look up into the spiritual world in such a way 
that these unspent etheric bodies will be realities for them, that through knowledge of the spiritual world this becomes a reality for them, then spiritual science will show that it has grown beyond mere knowledge to real life, a life that, moreover, has its reality through the destiny-laden events of our time. One will then be able to say that because there will be souls in the world that look up to the etheric bodies in yonder world that develop their unspent forces, those human souls on the earth will be able to receive these forces and will be able to work with ever greater strength. And the forces of these unspent etheric bodies of those who have made their sacrifices on the fields of blood and death will be fruitful for earthly souls in the future. For this reason, we wish also today to be mindful of the collaboration that can arise between souls that pervaded in a soul's spiritual sense by spiritual scientific knowledge will in future look up to what remains of the etheric bodies from this war, to what can arise from this inner soul collaboration. We wish also today to inscribe in our souls those words that I have been speaking at the end of the studies conducted in our branches out of the whole context of the events of our time. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. That is the end of Lecture 15 and the end of the book, The Mystery of Death, Collected Works, Volume 159 by Rudolf Steiner.